very good evening and <clears throat> thank you so much everyone for joining in i'm surprised by the attendance it's 11 more people should come anyways and someone has to enable my screen sharing can somebody do that for me please Yes, all right. Now we are going to go into the world of endocrinology and we are going to start the MCQ sessions. And like I said, there are a couple of things I want to highlight. This is going to be a very rapid revision session. Just can you guys just excuse me for one minute. I'll just adjust my screen and router. Yes, I'm back and uh, yeah, so this is going to be a rapid revision session for MCQs, like we have collected MCQs from most of the major Q banks and we didn't spare any MCQ. I think we considered something as important and something as not important. And to be honest, we are going to work out most of the MCQs and most all the MCQs of two of the major Q banks and I know which are the and I believe you all know which are those two major Q banks. Okay. So we are going to work out all the MCQs. Why this drastic step? Because all of you who have listened to our core concept lectures will definitely know the amount of effort which we have taken for you all. Um, <clears throat> basically, you know, because we have done extensive effort. We covered almost everything that is needed to be covered. And of course, the covering the entire neurology or an endocrinology is never going to be possible, but we did our best to cover all the important data, or like all the important things which you need for your MRCP examination that we have done from our end, okay? And the reason we are doing is, we don't want anyone to fail, okay? We want everyone to pass the examination successfully. So we are putting this huge, huge, huge effort for you all, right? So I sincerely believe you will take it in a positive light and you all will work out the MCQs and you will go and read and do some hard work. And it's obviously going to be really a true blessing for you to pass the examination because what I am saying is like I'm baffled because MRCP coaching has now become like a business and so many people... I was really baffled to know some people without any MRCP are teaching MRCP. <laughs> That's really ridiculous. And people are willing to pay $1,500 to go and join them. It's to be taught by someone who never had and never sat for the examination in the entire life. I'm baffled. We have all people with NHS experience. We are sitting here and we are trying to <clears throat> do our very best for you. So follow this it's going to be very rapid revision session. Why is because we have more than close to 1,200 slides. Okay, here I am not going to stop and clarify anything. This is a revision session, rapid fire revision session because a lot of people came telling me like, I don't have time, I have, I'm in residency, I'm doing this and that. For you guys, this will be absolutely useful. Even if you don't sit and work out all the MCQs, please at least watch the video at the end of the day, this will help you. All right, along with that, towards the end of this batch session, and we are going to work out the last three year question paper, not now, by next month we will be doing. And <clears throat> yes, with that, I'm going to start. I want all of you to be attentive. I want all of you to answer, okay? So that it will be really great thing for you, okay? All right, MRCP1, first question. 
56 year old lifelong smoker presents to the general practitioner with a history of cough, breathlessness, weight loss. They took a chest x-ray and it shows a mass in the right hilum. Which of the following result is most likely to suggest the tumor is a small cell lung tumor? Okay, the right way to approach an MCQ. Don't go see the options. See the question. 56 year old guy, they clearly gave the diagnosis. What is this? Small cell lung carcinoma. Lung carcinoma, how they are majorly divided into non small cell lung carcinoma and small cell lung carcinoma. Am I right? All of you are clear? I'm not going to go in depth of oncology. So, <clears throat> this small cell lung cancer is associated with lot of paraneoplastic syndromes. Okay. So, they are asking which of the following result likely to suggest the tumor is a small cell carcinoma. So, we now will go to the option because we have a diagnosis. They clearly told it is a small cell lung tumor. So, no doubt in that. So, move to the next slide. What are the things they are given? Hypercalcemia, hyponatremia, potassium slightly on the other higher end, plasma osmolality of 335, urinary osmolality of 80. One person answered, I want everyone to answer. Please interact. This is the time I want to interact with you. This lecture is going to go for six to seven hours today and another four or five hours tomorrow. I'm sitting for your own benefit and we are giving this lecture for free for you all. Fantastic. The answer is B, sodium of 123. Like I said, small cell lung carcinoma has paraneoplastic hormone. Okay. Because this, carcin this carcinoma, this tumor itself can secrete various hormones. Okay, including your antidiuretic hormone, your ACTH, it can cause Cushing's and SIADH. Okay, <clears throat> this small cell carcinoma, lung carcinoma is notorious to cause SIADH. What are the characteristics, features of SIADH? Hyponatremia, low plasma osmolality, that is 275 to 295. So what is ruled out? High plasma osmolality is ruled out. So, inappropriately high urinary osmolality, what they have given here, low urinary osmolality it should be high. And high urinary sodium in a patient with clinically euvolemic status, right? So, this is a paraneoplastic syndrome. This is nothing other than the diagnosis is SLC, SCLC with SIADH, all right? Let's go to the next question. 54 year old woman is seen for the first time in diabetes clinic. She is obese, plethoric and has marked bruising on her limbs. Fresh triae over her abdomen. She has developed dorsal kyposis and a vertebral collapse. The, which of the following results help to pinpoint the diagnosis of Cushing syndrome secondary to adrenal adenoma? So Cushing's can occur due to what are the causes you should know? Drugs your pituitary, that is your Cushing's disease, then adrenal Cushing's, that is your Cushing's syndrome. Okay. So, which of the following will point, point to an adrenal source? Normal 9-hour <coughs> serum cortisol level, hypokalemia, or serum cortisol level 200 ml after overnight DST, Rise to urine cortisol creatinine ratio or undetectable serum ACTH level. What is the answer? Come on. I want all of you to interact. I want all of you to type. Otherwise, it won't make any use. Dr. Mevish E, Dr. Masjidi E, Dr. Rana E. So it is E. Okay. What happens? Your pituitary gland in the brain produces ACTH. When there is excess cortisol is going to come from an adrenal adenoma, it is going to go and cause a negative feedback. As a result, what will happen? ACTH level will low. This is one of the signs we can use to find 
that this particular Cushing syndrome is due to nothing other than an adrenal adenoma. All right. Next question. 51-year-old man presents to the emergency department with altered consciousness. His blood pressure is 80 by 50. His skin is pigmented. He has also have Hashimoto thyroiditis. His family says he has been tired for several months and has been losing weight and complaining of abdominal pain. Which of the following result is most likely to be found on investigation? Before we see the options, we should get a diagnosis. What are the things there? Postural hypotension. And hypotension as well, obviously. Some pigmentation. All right. <clears throat> Plus Hashimoto thyroiditis. So what is the overall diagnosis? Addison's is a part of the diagnosis. Overall diagnosis is what is the overall diagnosis? It's not Addison's doctors. It's not hypoadrenalism. It is APS, autoimmune polyendocrine syndrome. I hope all of you had listened to my endocrine lecture, which is freely available in the YouTube. We covered extensively all the topics we have covered. <clears throat> all right. All the topics we had covered. More than anyone could cover, we covered. I, that I can challenge right on the face of anyone. So, this is called autoimmune polyendocrine syndrome. I told about two types of APS. APS1 and APS2, which you have to go back and listen if you are not familiar with that. So, this is an autoimmune polyendocrine syndrome. Means what? It's an autoimmune and it is polyendocrine involving multiple glands and multiple endocrine empathies. So, they are asking what you will find. I don't know what happened to option E here. A is glucose level of 12.3 millimole, serum sodium level of 116, flattened T waves, or a serum potassium of 2.4 and with a serum urea of 3.2. What is the answer? The answer is B. Serum sodium level of 116. This is an autoimmune polyendocrine syndrome. The underlying diagnosis is Addison's, obviously. <clears throat> so what happens in Addison's? You should know the biochemical changes in the Addison's. Hyponatremia, hyperkalemia, rised urea, hypoglycemia. Addison's disease may be also associated with eosinophilia. Don't be surprised to see eosinophilia in Addison's disease. You should know the investigations, clinical features, diagnosis, differential diagnosis, and management of Addison's disease. Next question. 31-year-old man is referred to local hypertension clinic because of recently discovered hypertension that is labile and difficult to control. Which of the following features is most likely to suggest a genetic familial syndrome is the cause of hypertension? This topic, this question involves three different specialties. One is endocrine, another one is nephro, another one is cardiology. Okay, so you need to know which of the following future is most likely to suggest a genetic or a familial syndrome. Okay, is it a low potassium, low, not a low potassium, near normal potassium 3.9 or is it a random blood glucose level of 9 or a hypocalcemia, serum calcium level of 1.5 or a familial history of parathyroid hyperplasia or a family history of parathyroid, papillary thyroid carcinoma, which one of the following? Genetic or Mendelian form of hypertension. Okay, men syndrome, so it's D. Let's see. Yes, it's D. Okay. Among all the endocrine causes of hypertension, only pheochromocytoma has a strong genetic activity. Typically, you will see in men too. Okay. Typically, you will see in men too. Okay. Entire men syndrome. So many questions can be asked. Okay. We will see as we go ahead. 37-year-old woman is here. She is presenting to endocrine clinic with history of hirsutism, acne. And then she also has oligomenorrhea. She has no children and there is no family history of similar symptoms. She is having difficulty losing weight. She searched in the internet. Now she thinks she might be having polycystic ovarian syndrome. She wants to discuss the implications of this. Her BMI is 29. Which of the following is the most important issue to discuss with her? See, a lady 
with high bmi suspected polycystic ovarian syndrome and she has hirsutism she has acne she has oligomenorrhea so which of the following matters most exercise regime whether she wants to have children a blood glucose level treatment of her hirsutism weight reduction diet remember <clears throat> the mrcp <laughs> options can have more than one right answers isn't everything important here obviously right exercise she has to do weight reduction obvious hirsutism yes aesthetically it can impair right she can't go out with the hairs and her blood glucose level control obviously it is important but what you will advise for the best interest of her in uk they have best interest meeting what is the best thing to do for the patient out of the best interest for his or <clears throat> her life so the best thing we need to do right here is whether to know she wants to have a children or not this is the most important thing other thing can happen okay other thing can happen but for the best interest of the patient the thing we need to do is to know whether she wants to have children or not and base the treatment on that all right base the treatment on that next question 29 year old woman presents to her gp with a history of weight loss heat intolerance poor concentration palpitation okay we are dealing with hyperthyroidism by now you should be knowing which of the following is the most likely associated with the diagnosis of thyroiditis associated with viral infection they are asking about a thyroid condition that is associated with a viral in infection let us see the option bilateral exophthalmos diffuse smooth goiter reduced uptake on tc th <clears throat> technetium thyroid scintigraphy positive thyroid peroxidase antibodies pre tbl mixed edema okay they are asking about a thyroid disease that is associated with viral illness what is the most common thyroid disease associated with viral illness it's good old dequer ones there is no need to have any doubt in that dequer ones is associated with that okay so how dequer ones present what is the classical finding in dequer ones thyroid disease is nothing other than your reduced uptake on thyroid scintigraphy you can go back and listen to my lecture core concept lecture which is freely available for all of you i had explained about dequer ones thyroid thyroiditis really well and in depth you all can listen to that okay next mcq 34 year old man old woman is referred to the endocrine clinic with a history of thyrotoxicosis at her first appointment she is found to have a smooth goiter lid lag bilateral exothalamus with puffy eyelids and conjunctival injection she wants to discuss the treatment of her thyroid problem she is keen to become pregnant okay this is a case of thyrotoxicosis and she wants to become pregnant all of you could have, would have like you know if you are a medicine resident or if you are actively running a clinic in a good crowded area would have definitely come across patients like this so what will you do for them you will just give beta blocker or you will give 12 to 18 months of thionamide therapy or you give a combination of anti thyroid drugs and thyroxine or will you go ahead and give a radioactive iodine or will you completely remove the gland once for all what you are going to do in a patient who wants to become pregnant <clears throat> for the best interest of health i want none of the people from this our my regular class med expert to make any wrong answers that will hurt me 12 to 18 months of thionamide therapy b is the right answer i'll tell you why c is not the right answer will you go ahead and give block and replace regimen this is anti thyroid drugs with thyroxine that is your block and replace you cannot go ahead and do that in pregnancy thyroidectomy seriously just because somebody has a hyperthyroidism in uk setting you are going to write to a thyroid write to an endocrine surgeon 
that surgical endocrinologist, this patient wants to become pregnant and please remove her thyroid glands. If anyone for any one of us going to send a letter, we will definitely put us in put ourselves into a trouble. They will definitely write to our supervisors telling the clinical judgment of this particular medical registrar or a specialty trainee who's referring such cases to me at this time is impaired. Kindly send him for further training. That is the worst thing in UK. If they find you are doing something worse, they will send you for some further training. You'll be just sending a sent back to some SHO level training again and you have to come back. You don't want to have to. So E is not the option. Radioactive iodine never. So C, D, E is done. Beta blocker alone will, do you think it alone will help to control her symptoms? Because see here, she developed goiter, bilateral exophthalmus, conjunctival injection. Everything is given. Okay. What are thionamides, doctor? Thionamides are carbimazole and propyl thioracid. Of course, it has some effects on, <clears throat> effects on fetus. But in all this time, we will do one thing, risk-benefit ratio. So the best thing you will do, she adamantly wants to become pregnant, profile thiouracil and carbamazole is all the thing you need to do. Initially, till the organogenesis is going on, profile thiouracil, once it's done, switch to carbamazole, monitor liver function, all right? Monitor liver function. That's what is the right answer. Recently, this scenario has come as a communication scenario in the PACES examination. You have to convince a woman who is going to be pregnant, who is going to start carbimazole and propyl thiouracil, and you have to tell about the adverse effect of these drugs and what are the precautions that lady has to be taken for her pregnancy. So, what you study for part one and part two is going to come for your PACES. Okay. Next. 30-year-old man, his wife and his wife are referred to the reproductive endocrinology clinic after failing to conceive for two years. The man admits use of recreational drugs and anabolic steroids. In the examination, the man's height is around 189 centimeter. He is 95 kg weight with central distribution of adipose tissue, bilateral gynecomastia, Ultrasound examination of the patient's test is calculated a right testicular volume of 10.5 ml and 10.1 ml of the left. Which of the following investigation is most helpful in providing a diagnosis? Here is a guy who abuses steroids. All right. Here is a guy who abuses steroids. Ended up in low testicular volume. I had a patient like that. He is a bodybuilder. Okay. He is a bodybuilder. He is from UK. He is a bodybuilder. <clears throat> that guy came and no one will believe that typically he, if he just flexes his muscles and everything, he's just like a supermodel type of guy. But he had erectile dysfunction, loss of libido, low testicular volume. First visit, he completely denied using any anabolic steroids. He kept telling that he just took creatine powder and as well as this whey protein. In the next visit, I just so much requested, help me to help you, please tell me the truth. Then he agreed he was referred to, referred to reproductive endocrinology. He's doing well now. So what do you do in this case? You will go ahead and do a CT scan of the pituitary or a chromosomal analysis, or you measure gonadotrophins, or you measure serum testosterone, or will you do a semen analysis? Practically think and tell me. Practically think and tell me. Like I always say, MRCP answers like this, more than one right answers will be there. But they want you to tell the best interest, which is the most helpful investigation here. Any more answers? A CT of pituitary, chromosomal analysis, measurement of gonadotrophins, measurement of testosterone, or a semen analysis. Chromosomal analysis, somebody, and somebody wants to do CT scan of pituitary gland. The answer is chromosomal analysis. Why? Now go back. See the guy, a tall guy with gynecomastia, central deposition of adipose tissue, small testis. Okay, small testis. All these things, all these things points to 
only one diagnosis even though he used anabolic steroids in the past clearly they mentioned in the past right now if he's having all these features together especially a tall stature doesn't erupt out of use of an anabolic steroids am i right suddenly it won't otherwise every tom dick and harry around will take anabolic steroids this is a case of klein filter syndrome all right you may have to do semen analysis at a later point yes you will do you may measure testosterone later point you may measure gonadotrophin yes at a later point but the right thing to do here what they are asking most helpful thing to do here is a chromosomal analysis 47 x all right next question 40 year old woman was brought unconscious to the emergency department on recovery okay she had impaired visual acuity only six on both eyes her blood pressure is low her electrolytes are abnormal with low sodium and a high potassium her previous medical history include amenorrhea for the last five years what treatment should be admitted urgently so you should know first what is happening here a low blood pressure abnormal electrolyte with very low sodium and a high potassium okay with impaired visual acuity what are we dealing with we are dealing with some apoplexy some bleeding of a particular gland that you only have to tell me what gland it is all right so what will you give will you give acyclovir will you give cefuroxim will you give hydrocortisone or you're going to pump the lady with phenytoin or you're going to give intravenous thiamine which of the following you are going to give to this particular lady The answer is hydrocortisone. This is a case of pituitary apoplexy, typically of low blood pressure, low sodium levels, and an elevated potassium levels. Okay, it's a pituitary apoplexy, okay, suggesting an Addisonian crisis. First and the foremost thing, the life saving thing here is your hydrocortisone, your steroids. Next question. 47 year old man presented with a six month history of polyuria, constipation, fatigue, poor concentration, and examination revealed the left lobe of the thyroid. There is a mass. Which of the following is the likely cause of the thyroid mass and the biochemistry? What the biochemistry says? High parathyroid hormone levels go up. What is abnormal here? Corrected calcium is high. So what do you think is happening? Somebody with polyuria and constipation, obviously hypercalcemia can cause. And along with the hypercalcemia, he has a mass in the left lobe of the thyroid. So which of the following is the likely cause of the thyroid mass? Anybody? Is it Addison's? Is this Digeorge syndrome? Is it autoimmune polyglandular syndrome type 1? It is multiple endocrine neoplasia type 2? Or is it magnesium deficiency? I want the answers. Come on. All of you. <coughs> yes. The answer is MEN2. We had discussed about MEN2. It's there in the core concept lectures. You can see. 42 year old one next question presence to the gp complaining of decreased libido he has a decreased libido also noticed he is shaving less frequently he is not shaving much frequency of the shaving has reduced on few occasions he tried to have sex and he has failed to maintain his erection to penetration his visual field testing is normal he has no medication history serum prolactin level is around 2000 and it's high testosterone level is low growth hormone and thyroid levels are normal physical examination is normal what would be the probable diagnosis just get some diagnosis and keep it in your head before we go to the next slide and see the options what is happening here 42 year old guy he has a decreased libido decreased shaving frequency erectile dysfunction high prolactin low testosterone 
what are the things that is coming in your mind if you can figure out even before looking at the option the options are going to be easy you won't get confused you won't get confused is it microprolactinoma is it macroprolactinoma is it psychogenic impotence is it hypothyroidism or is it acromegaly is visual field testing normal this gives a clue the answer is microprolactinoma fantastic because macroprolactinoma once the gland becomes big it will compress and cause visual field defects all right it's microprolacto that's why i underline this is visual field defect testing is normal all right now the next question 21 year old woman presents for review she is concerned on this occasion because she has not had a period for 5 months she had menarche at the age 13 regular periods up to recently her bmi is 17.6 she is a long distance runner pregnancy test is negative thyroid function test is normal in uk setting anybody with an amenorrhea anybody with an amenorrhea the first and the foremost test you are supposed to do is a urine gram index test you have to rule out pregnancy then comes anything this lady has in a low bmi near low bmi and she is a long distance runner an athlete all right and she is having amenorrhea so what do you think of what are the possibilities here so the options are pan hypopituitarism functional hypothalamic amenorrhea hyperprolactinemia premature ovarian insufficiency polycystic ovarian syndrome what do you think is happening <clears throat> most athletes have you seen athletes and models and our people in the modeling field not talking about this tiktok instagram self proclaimed model real models and real athletes and all those people they cannot eat like the way they want right they have to maintain their weight they have to maintain their figure anything less or something short of that that will adverse their adversely affect their career and life would itself so they cannot live a normal life like you and me so when they do that they end up having lot of problem like hypothalamic amenorrhea okay hypothalamic amenorrhea this calorie deficit itself will produce that okay next question 42 year old man with a long standing hiv he has been taking anti retroviral therapy for 5 years relatively free of associated disease you notice on examination he appears to have lost subcutaneous fat on his arms legs and face and increased deposition of fat around the abdomen his lipids are abnormal the raised triglyceride level and a low hdl level what is the most likely cause what is this called what is this phenomenon is called okay what is this phenomenon is called okay this phenomenon is called lipodystrophy what is lipodystrophy fat gets abnormally distributed it can happen with some drugs and it can happen with one of the very frequent drug people use these days that is your good old insulin okay it causes that so hiv it can cause what is the most likely cause in a hiv now let's go and see the option anti retroviral related lipodystrophy hiv wasting hiv malignancy gi pathology inherited insulin resistance syndrome what is the answer what is the answer for this question the answer is anti retroviral induced because many of the drugs which is used in hiv can notoriously cause this okay that is explained in the clinical pharmacology lecture all the drugs i had explained you can go and see so in a hiv with the lipodystrophy the most important thing you should suspect is a drug induced lipodystrophy 44 year old some people are asking doubt is the class is for mrcp or not is for the plab i don't know <clears throat> how it went to the plab group this class is intended for mrcp one plab people if you want to be super strong in your medicine concept in endocrine you are more than welcome to sit for the lecture okay you are more than welcome to sit for the lecture okay 
there is no plan i think in future anything is going to be uk mla united kingdom medical licensing authority examination all right 44 year old man is surprised to find that he cannot easily get his feet into a pair of shoes he last wore five years ago he goes to buy a new pair and he told his shoe size is increased searches on the internet for an explanation deciding that he could have acromegaly he diagnosed consults is gp gp has not seen him for several years and he thinks his parents has changed so he refers him to the endocrine clinic so all this stupid thing they are straight away asking what is the first line test for investigating an acromegaly what is the first line test without opening any options one doctor has already answered what is the first line test straight forward only one test that is the first line ghh all the option among all the option what is the first line test is nothing other than your e measurement of igf straight forward right i don't need to give you much explanation straight forward question and a straight forward answer next question an obese 55 year old patient with hypercholesterolemia okay low ldl and high uh, low L, uh, low uh, sorry <coughs> the high ldl and low hdl well controlled type 2 diabetes and hypertension he has been on a low cholesterol diet but his latest ldl is still 4.8 his triglycerides are within the normal range that is surprising because most diabetic people will have high triglycerides as far as i noted okay and in terms of primary prevention what is the next therapeutic step they are asking in terms of primary prevention what is the next therapeutic step in this gentleman what he will do what do you think he will do such a patient is coming and sitting right in front of you in your clinic so let's see the options he will add a pioglitazone you will add a gym fibrosil you will add a metformin you will add a statin you will add a ramipro and second this is the patient what do you think you will do yes you have to add a statin very simple question please don't expect this in mrcp we are doing it because we want to cover all the questions in those two q banks 50 year old woman has been diagnosed with pericardial effusion okay and along with that her hair is thinning she reports cold intolerance constipation she has no medical history and she takes no medications she denies any reason why it would go wrong her sister has a history of autoimmune thyroid disease on examination she has a dry skin and loss of the outer third of eyebrows blood pressure is high cardiac examination reveals muffled heart sound and a cardiac rub which of the endocrine diseases is likely to be associated with this finding this is a straight forward piece of cake like question none of you should have any kind of confusion i believe what is the answer here what is the answer here hypothyroidism hypothyroidism pheochromocytoma chronic renal insufficiency hypogonadism only thing that will fit the answer is hypothyroidism that's b all your cold intolerance okay and hair loss loss of the outer third of the eyebrows pericardial effusion is one of the complications of hypothyroidism all right next question let's go 56 year old lady presents with sensation of choking and difficulty swallowing large solid foods she has a recent endoscopy which revealed no abnormality of the esophagus of stomach on examination there is a diffuse nodule or goiter but no thyroid bruy or this thyroid idiosis my chemistry level a thyroid hormone level of i think t3 of 16.9 and tsh of 3.25 what is the most appropriate next investigation for determining the volume of thyroid gland they are asking to measure the volume of thyroid gland what you will do thyroid isotope scan usg scan x ray of the neck ct or mri which investigation you will choose to measure the volume of the thyroid gland it's always going to be ultrasound unless proven otherwise ultrasound is the investigation of choice whenever they ask how to measure the volume of the thyroid gland the volume of the thyroid gland is always always measured by ultrasound unless proven otherwise okay now a 30 year old man presents with three month history of deteriorating physical performance at work and is associated with dysarthria 
and clumsiness. On examination, he looks anemic with hepatomegaly and occasional flesh rings in the cornea. Okay. What would be the next appropriate investigation to suspect the, to get to the suspected clinical diagnosis? Which question you want to see, doctor? This is the question. Somebody is having choking sensation who is having underlying abnormal biochemistry of the thyroid hormones. Means what? Thyroid gland is enlarging and it is choking the pharynx. So, they are asking, how do you measure the volume of the thyroid gland? Only way you can measure the volume of the thyroid gland is by ultrasound. All right. The other doctors come here. So, what is this? This is a diagnosis of a Wilson's disease. So, what do you do for Wilson's disease? You do CT brain, MRI brain, liver biopsy, serum ceruloplasmin, C-reactive protein. Which one of them? The answer is D, serum ceruloplasmin levels. Okay, that will help you to diagnose Wilson's disease. Next question. 22-year-old woman presents with heat intolerance, palpitation and weight loss. So, following, she reports a history of viral illness and painful neck. This itself should give you the diagnosis. Am I right? They are asking the diagnosis. Is there anything more? Let's see what is there. Examination BMA is 22. No goiter is there. Fine tremor is there. Biochemistry levels T3 of 28 and TSH of less than 0.05, TRAB and TPO antibodies are negative. Isotub scan shows markedly reduced uptake. What is the diagnosis, doctor? There is only one diagnosis. There cannot be more than two, one diagnosis here. There is only one thing straightforward. That is the only diagnosis. That is nothing other than your d once thyroiditis. Okay, following a viral prodrome and reduced thyroid uptake. Always remember these two words following some viral pro program. And decreased thyroid uptake. Only answer for this is decor once thyroiditis. Next question, 40 year old man with long standing type two diabetes is found to have urinary albumin excretion of 400. His diabetes is well controlled with HbA1c of 6.5. Fasting lipids are a target. It is normal intensive. Neurological examination reveals abnormal pinprick and vibratory sense. Peripherally, peripheral pulses are palpable. The creatinine is 88. That's normal. Potassium is 4. What additional drug should be prescribed here? A diabetic who is near normal a diabetic who is nearly normal, normal, near normal diabetic, okay, and he is having increased albumin excretion. Everything is normal. Also, he lost peripheral pulses. Uh, sorry, examination even abnormal. Sorry, pinprick and vibration sense. What do you think is happening? He is developing some complications. Am I right? So, what is the thing you will prescribe for me, for him? An aspirin, an atenolol, a lisinopril, a clopidogrel, or a citagliptin? Come on, you have to answer. The answer is C, lisinopril. Okay, because many of the people with the diabetes, they will have an underlying diabetic nephropathy or they may be progressing and working towards getting a diabetic nephropathy. Or some of the people, they may have diabetic retinopathy, whatever it is. So to give a maximum protection, <coughs> even before the albumin excretion, we do at times, we do give at times. Once albumin creatinine ratio is high, urinary albumin is up, proteinuria you are diagnosing, the best drug is going to be lisinopril. An AC inhibitor or an ARB. This would be your best bet because this prevents a lot of things. Progression to diabetic nephropathy. It prevents the ventricular remodeling. After any ischemic insult, ventricles remodel itself due to multiple signaling pathway. So this ventricular remodeling is also prevented by that. Next question. Patient has two-month history of intermittent flushing associated with tachycardia and wheezing. Okay tachycardia and wheezing 
Dr. AC inhibitor help in neuropathy. Here, the most important concern is nephropathy. I'll tell you, the moment you have seen a nephropathy developed, the patient will indefinitely, they'll have some neuropathy or they will have some retinopathy also. You can be sure. Or if you see a retinopathy, definitely the patient will have some kind of nephropathy. Okay. AC inhibitor, what is the thing? What is it? It decreases the efferent arteriolar pressure. Okay. Overall, it decreases the efferent arteriolar <coughs> pressure. So, by decreasing the efferent arteriolar pressure, what it does is, what it does is, it prevents the dioptic nephropathy. Neuropathy is a complication. Seeing neuropathy, especially neuropathy, dioptic neuropathy, which sense loss most, vibration sense is the first to go off. Okay, followed by the other things. Let's come to this question. Okay, followed by the other things. So, we are giving AC inhibitor in an aim to prevent the progression of the nephropathy and as well as retinopathy and as well as cardiac remodeling because all the dioptic people are at risk of getting a heart attack at the earliest. So, we want, don't want them to have all these things. So, this is a very good preventive drug. In between, I don't know, some people came with the research. AC inhibitors are causing what? Lung cancer. My goodness. You know, there are a lot of people I know who's been taking AC inhibitors and they are well into the 70s and 80s. Nothing like that. All right. Next question. A patient with two-month history of intermittent flushing associated with tachycardia and wheezing. Okay. Episodes of profuse watery diarrhea. On examination, patient has a facial plethora that is flushed. On examination, the BP is 160 by 80. Cardiac vascular examination reveals pan-systolic murmur. Okay. Which is louder on... Inspiration. So it is could be tricuspid regurgitation, and he also has a palpable leverage. What is the suspected diagnosis? Then what is the investigation? We can answer this even before going to see the options. Come on, think in a man with the tachycardia, wheezing, diarrhea, flushing, okay, pansystolic murmur, tricuspid regurgitation, and a palpable liver. All this finding, there is only one condition, okay? You won't get this in multiple conditions. What are things there? Tachycardia is there, wheezing is there, watery diarrhea is there, high blood pressure, tricuspid regurgitation, murmur with the palpable liver. It can be only seen in carcinoid. So what do you do? Do you do a DST or do you see urinary catecholamine in collection or you do urinary 5-hydroxy index indolestic acid or abdominal ultrasound? or fasting gastrin. This is answer is C, urinary 5-hydroxy, indole acetic acid. All right. Next question. 55-year-old woman has a six-month history of weight gain. She is otherwise well, takes no medications. Okay, six months she has weight gain. On examination, her body mass index is 28. Her blood pressure is 170 by 100. She has a round red face light atrophy of the arm. Renal function and urine analysis are normal. What is the next step in obtaining the diagnosis? What do you think is happening here first? Obesity, round face, a red face, some atrophy of the muscles, high blood pressure. So what is the next step? A low dose DST, urinary catecholamine, Urinary fire drugs, indolestic acid, abdominal ultrasound, CD of the abdomen. <coughs> the very first step is low dose DST. As per the criteria of the protocol, if you go, first thing you will be going and first thing you will be doing is ruling out pseudo cushing. So you have to rule out is the patient taking alcohol or is the patient is having or undergoing any kind of depression? If that is the case, rule that out, then go to the next thing. All right, this is a Pushings, low dose DST. Low dose DST is what you have to do here. Okay. Now, the next question we are going to go through. All right. Next question says 66 year old male patient with extensive smoking history is being investigated for suspected primary lung malignancy on a recent x ray. He has been complaining of weakness in his leg and upper arm muscles. He describes difficulty standing up from a seated position and combing his hair. So, proximal and distal myopathy sets in. 
All right. He reports weight gain of 8 kg. His skin appears darker and gums are stained. At present, he is taking no regular medication but reports he looked weak long course of steroids two months ago for an unresolving chest investigation in infection. Four years previously, this gentleman received radiotherapy for a head and neck cancer related to his smoking. Routine investigation reveals low potassium, uh, 8 milligram dexamethasone suppression test revealed 8 a.m. cortisol of 199. Per day 8 a.m. ACTH was 430. Okay, ACTH is high. So what is the likely diagnosis? You don't need to see the option. You all doctors are intelligent enough to tell me what is the diagnosis. What is the diagnosis? Proximal distal muscle weakness. A guy with a lung cancer. So on steroids. Hypokalemia. What? Not everything. Not, we don't have thousands of diseases with this presentation. We have very few diseases present like that. What is the diagnosis? What is the diagnosis? <clears throat> the right thing, pushing anyone will tell. The right thing is ectopic. It's an ectopic. What is it? It's an ectopic ACTH secretion. Anyone can tell it's a pushing because all the symptoms of pushing are given there. Anyone will tell. Okay, that's a medical student diagnosis. A registered diagnosis is an ectopic ACTH secretion. Okay. Ectopic ACTH secretion. That is a diagnosis. Simple. You diagnose by reading the question stem itself done. Then you don't need to see the option and get confused. All right. Next, in a overweight patient with type 2 diet control diabetes mellitus is seen in the outpatient clinic. Despite following appropriate diet, increased exercise four times a week, his blood sugar is not well controlled. There is a strong family history of cardiovascular disease. Patient is anxious to modify his cardiovascular risk. HbA1c 50, sodium 140, potassium 4, creatinine 85, BMI 29, BP is 110. What is the first line treatment? See, this gentleman is coming to you. Before we go and open the options. Options are there. I am ready to open and show you the options. But I want all of you to think. An overweight guy is coming, type 2 diabetes mellitus. His blood sugars are not fully controlled with exercise and diet. He wants to modify cardiovascular risk. How do you modify cardiovascular risk? Obviously, the very first thing is going to be your diet. Next thing is your exercise. Am I right? Diet and exercise plays a very crucial role in diabetes mellitus. If patients can have 1,500 calorie diet a day and lose at least 15 to 20 kg of the body weight. I am talking about type 2 diabetes mellitus. Many people will go into remission and can completely avoid all the complication and live a normal life if they continue that throughout the life. But people are not ready to control. That's why the only solution for diabetes mellitus in the long run is bariatric surgery. What they are doing, they are cutting off the stomach. Surgeons will come and reduce your stomach quantity. So they can't have anything much. By the time they finish one KFC burger, that will be full. They won't be able to eat for next 9-10 hours. Finished. Incretin action will happen and their blood glucose will go down. What would be the first line treatment here, doctors? It's a piaglitazone, GLP-1 analog, or long-acting insulin, metformin, glycoside. What you will give? The answer is metformin. This is the first line treatment. Okay? This is the first line treatment to reduce any cardiovascular risk or anything. The first line treatment is metformin in a type 2 diabetes. Because why? Metformin has a modest level of weight loss. Am I right? Okay. 33 year old patient has been diagnosed with primary hyperparathyroidism. She also has rise to prolactin level. Okay. She has primary hyperparathyroidism, the rise to prolactin level, which are also <coughs> which were also recently diagnosed as being due to microprolactinoma. After MRI of her pituitary, she tells you that her mother and aunt have a background of high calcium, kidney stones, and a cousin has a pituitary tumor, and there is a hereditary endocrine syndrome. Right? You would have diagnosed here, right? Hyperparathyroidism is there. Increased prolactin is there. Hypercalcemia is also running in family. Hypercalcemia will cause kidney 
uh, kidney stones and also along with that pituitary tumor is also there in family so in a family with all these things family with all these things what is the diagnosis men syndrome all right how they are asking what other tumor will be there parathyroid we got it prolactin we got it pituitary okay then what else tumor was here hypercalcemia where else the tumor will be there lungs muscles ovaries pancreas and thyroid men too where <clears throat> this is a men one okay why it is a men one i'll tell you okay i'll tell you what are the tumors here first tumor here is going to be your hyperparathyroidism parathyroid pituitary so parathyroid and pituitary primarily gets affected in men one or men two obviously the people who answered pancreas are right it's men one okay it's men one all right men one 46 year old magazine columnist is referred by her gp with a history of tiredness and lethargy there has been no weight loss everything is important low sodium <clears throat> okay and patient herself denies any weight loss or polydipsia but reports that she is an anxious individual pad plasma urinary osmolality is low 255 okay is low plasma osmolality is low and urine osmolality is okay what is the likely diagnosis we will go to the diagnosis then we will go to other things low sodium low sodium patient completely denies any weight loss or polydipsia and plasma osmolality is low what are the options a tumor in the posterior pituitary diabetes insipidus ectopic adh secretion psychogenic polydipsia pseudo hyponatremia what this could be see here once again tiredness lethargy what could be the answer here the answer is psychogenic polydipsia okay I'll explain you how and why. I'm sorry. Psychogenic polydipsia. How and why? What happens here? Somebody drinks excess water. When <clears throat> water is too much going into your system, how many of you know water itself is toxin? Not at normal level when it goes beyond, beyond the normal limit. You know, earlier days they used to do a torture called waterboarding. They force feed someone with a lot of water, person patient will die. There is a torture. You go and see about Chinese water torture, how they torture the criminals and kill them with water. All right. The psychogenic polydipsia, what will happen? They keep drinking water, not just little, a lot and lot and lot and lot of water. As they drink more and more and more and more and water, what they will have, what will happen? Diuresis. Obviously, they are going to dilute their first their plasma level plasma will be diluted diluted mental there will be loss of sodium so what will happen plasma osmolality is going to be low and urinary osmolality will be somewhat maintained still then so with no other thing they are given there is no weight loss there is no polydipsia but the patient will be drinking polydipsia patient is not having thirsty psychogenic polydipsia is that without I'll explain. Without any kind of, without any kind of trigger, without any kind of trigger, they will keep drinking. They won't have any thirst, but still they will keep drinking. Still, they will keep drinking and keep being and diluting. That is a psychogenic polydipsia. Okay. Typically, in any patient with low plasma and urine osmolality, most common, most common thing is a psychogenic polydipsia i hope all of you had listened to my lecture i presented it table why it's a psychogenic polydipsia and the difference between psychogenic polydipsia 
and <clears throat> diaptes insipidus that is a primary polydipsia other name is primary polydipsia and diaptes insipidus in diaptes insipidus <coughs> what happens in all these three conditions okay in case of any psychogenic polydipsia the plasma osmolality will always be low urine osmolality what will happen is low to normal where just go to the other end in case of a nephrogenic or cranial diaptes insipidus the plasma osmolality in nephrogenic or cranial di it's always going to be what high that's the very first clue okay that's a very first clue for rest of the every clue I had described that because I don't have time to put the entire table here and describe what is the clue. This is the one clue here in the scenario. Rest of the thing you can more than welcome to listen to the lecture. I had described everything. Next question. 28 year old single machinist who describes herself as always being anxious in presence to that she is concerned about weight loss, tiredness, amenorrhea. Examination reveals pallor pulse is quite higher and <clears throat> regular lying down blood pressure is 110 and nine standing up blood pressure is 92 tendon reflexes are slightly slow to relax there is normochromic normocytic anemia urea and electrolytes liver function plasma glucose calcium everything is normal apart from a potassium level Above the upper limit of normal, they didn't mention what it is. Her 9 a.m. cortisol is 53 millimole. She has a normal prolactin, a low T4, T3, and low normal TSH, and undetectable gonadotropin hormone level. Which of the following is the likely diagnosis? So what are the problems here? Young lady, 28 year old. All right. She's having tiredness. She's having amenorrhea. She's having a pallor. <clears throat> she's having something closer to a postural hypotension yes and slow relaxing reflexes here are her cortisol levels and thyroid hormone levels with the normal prolactin what do you think is happening in this lady is it a microprolactinoma primary hypothyroidism anorexia nervosa hypopituitarism or a thyrotoxicosis What is the answer here? The answer is hypopituitarism. Okay. Hypopituitarism. Anorexia nervosa. Do you think it's going to present with all the findings together, which is seeing here? What are the findings? What are the positive findings here? First, just because somebody says anxious individual doesn't mean she is having anorexia. These are called red herrings in MRCP. Okay, red herrings means what? Some of the details which they will give, they will make you to go for a false diagnosis, which will put you in trouble. You don't want that to happen. Am I right? See everything. Okay, high potassium, slow relaxing reflex. Okay, and then abnormalities of the thyroid hormone, undetectable gonadotrophin levels, all these things. What happens? The pituitary gland is affected. So everything is happening as with, as with that. So the only diagnosis could be thyrotoxicosis. Absolutely not. There is no other signs of that. Microprolactinoma. Will microprolactinoma produce all the symptoms? Will microprolactinoma? What is written here? Normal prolactin. Rule that out. Will primary hypothyroidism produce all the symptoms, including a postural drop in BP and a high potassium? Definitely not. The only viable option here is your hypopetitrism. All right. This is how to diagnose. Sometimes they give some tricky question and put you into trouble. And the reason for pallor, <clears throat> I forgot to tell you. See, the reason for pallor here is loss of melanocyte stimulating properties of the ACTH. ACTH will lose as a result. Hypopetitrism, pituitarism patients will have some degree of pallor. Sorry. Okay. Mm -hmm. Again, the same question they had asked, I think. Okay, not the same question. Some machinist. 28-year-old machinist presents to the GP here with weight loss despite a good appetite 
palpitation and excess sweating. GP suspects thyrotoxicosis. He is confirming it. Okay. He is confirming it biochemically. On examination, she has a normal sized thyroid gland with a suggestion of bulkiness on the right hand side. A TC scan, technician 99 scan reveals single heart nodule. Okay. In the right lobe of the thyroid with suppression of activity elsewhere. Antibody testing reveals normal TPO and TRAB antibody levels. Which of the clinical features would she most likely to have? Okay. Yes, palpitation, sweating, some hot nodule. Hot nodule and cold nodule. Cold nodule is mostly malignant. All right. So which of the following feature is suggestive which will she may be having? She may be having a corneal ulceration or periorbital edema, pre-tibial mixed edema, or lid retraction or lid lag or unilateral exophthalmos. What she will be having? What is this lady is having? She is having some hypothyroidism. Thyrotoxicosis is going on. All right. Symptoms have started. There is a heart nodule. But there are no autoantibodies are here. Okay. No autoantibodies are here. And autoantibody testing is normal. What she is going to have? <coughs> lid retraction and lid lag. Okay, lid retraction and lid lag. I'll explain you what is this step by step. Okay, they have unilateral exophthalmos, definitely not. So, rule out certain things and pre tibial next edema. No, these two are completely not related option. Okay, first thing any thyroid patient with normal antibody levels, okay, normal. Okay, normal antibody, normal or low or no antibody levels. But they have futures of thyrotoxicosis. Plus, biochemically it is proven. And plus a nodule is present. Such thing is called as your autonomous thyroid nodule. You will go and search for some uh, <clears throat> antibodies to prove it's a Graves or anything. There won't be any antibody. No TPO, no TRAB antibody. But patient is having features of hypothyroidism. So what you are going to do? You are going to do a technetium 99 uptake scan. That's a heart nodule. This is an autonomous thyroid nodule. So the only thing, the next thing that we'll do is we'll increase the sympathetic overactivity. So the very first thing you will see is lid retraction and lid lag. Corneal ulceration is the last thing to have, right? It's the last thing to have. Last thing. But lid retraction is lid lag is how it starts. I believe all of you knows the no specs classification, right? 44-year-old woman presents with newly diagnosed type 2 diabetes. She reports increased sweating and swelling of the hands and feet to the point she can no longer wear her wedding ring. She complains her sleep quality is poor. Her husband reports she is snoring. Occasionally, he reports she stops breathing for a few seconds. You suspect a new diagnosis of acromegaly. Yeah, because they have given everything related to acromegaly. Now, patient with hyperglycemia suspected hyper suspected acromegaly. Which of the following tests would confirm the diagnosis of acromegaly? Nicely written question. Remember, you know the diagnosis of acromegaly. How do you, what do you use to diagnose the acromegaly? The initial first test is going to be serum IGF. It's a screening. IGF-1 is a screening test. In a diabetic, what you will do? Randomly, you will take growth hormone level, IGF-1 level, urinary cortisol level, insulin tolerance test, glucose tolerance test, and GH level. The answer is OGTT with GH level. That is the confirmatory test, even if the patient is a diabetic. Next question, 30-year-old woman presented with 18-month history of polyuria and polydipsia. Her only other history of note is increasing joint pains. One visit to GP with depression and constipation for some six months back. Examination, glucose 4.1, urea 5.2, creatinine 80, calcium is 3.1, phosphate is, I think, low normal, and parathyroid hormone is high. Increase PTH, increase calcium, 
polyuria, polydipsia, joint pain. What will you think of? First, think of a diagnosis. Then we will go to the options. Occult malignancy, hypervitaminosis D, primary hyperparathyroidism, secondary hyperparathyroidism, <coughs> pseudo hypoparathyroidism. What is the answer? Always remember in secondary hyperparathyroidism, my clue is calcium levels will be low. Okay. Two for CA2 plus. That's how I ask you to ask people to remember. So the diagnosis is primary hyperparathyroidism. Everyone got it. This is a straightforward question. Increase calcium, increase PTH, and symptoms of hypercalcemia. All right. Next question. 32 year old lawyer presents to non specific symptoms of presence with non specific symptoms of tiredness. She is dissatisfied with her GP and arranges a private MRI. She must be damn rich to arrange a private MRI in UK of pituitary. Blood testing by her private physician reveals normal thyroid function. Eighth hourly cortisol of 560, prolactin of 154, and normal gonadotropin growth hormone levels. Her pituitary scan, however, reveals 0.8 cm microadenoma with no extension or compression. Patient has normal visual field. Which of the following represents the most appropriate course of action? So what do you do? It's not a, it's not doing anything. It's just a microadenoma in the pituitary. She has non-specific symptoms. A microadenoma. Right. What you will do? You will go for a dopamine agonist, cabagolin or bromocryptin. You will go for a somatostatin therapy. You will go and give a radiation or you will observe and reassure or you go for a transphenoidal resection of pituitary. You just observe and reassure because she has very mild symptoms and it's a microadenoma. You can wait and watch whether the, it's going to grow. At the same time, if it is extended to the supracellular region or is it compressing, then you can think of surgeries and other measures. Otherwise, you don't need to. Okay. Next question, 54-year-old <clears throat> man who had previously had a surgery for acromegaly is receiving, <coughs> receiving adjuvant treatment with landriotide medical therapy. The question is straightly here. What is the mode of action of landriotide? How many of you knows without seeing option? Let me see. In the chat box type, what is the mechanism of action of landriotide? Don't see uh, options. Tell me right away. How many of you know what is the mechanism of action of landriotide? Come on, you should be able to tell me the answer. A, B, C, D, E. Two opposite answers come. Somatostatin analog by one doctor, somatostatin inhibitor by another doctor. Growth hormone inhibitor by the other doctor. What is landriotide? How many of you seen the drug in your day to day practice? How many of you seen landriotide? Landriotide acts by stimulating the somatostatin receptor. Okay. It doesn't inhibit, it doesn't inhibit growth hormone. Okay. It doesn't stimulate the dopamine receptors. It is a synthetic analog. Okay, it's a synthetic analog of somatostatin. Anyone don't know, please remember this. So it goes and acts on somatostatin receptor. That's your good old landriotide. All right. Don't make any mistake. It acts on somatostatin receptor by stimulating because it's a synthetic analog. Next question. 32-year-old man presents with unilateral gynecomastia. He had a breast reduction surgery 10 years ago. On examination, he has a sparse body hair in the axilla and pubic region. Two testicles are identified, both small volume. On further examination, he has a normal sense of smell. His blood test revealed testosterone is 4, that is low. LH and FSH both are elevated. Prolactin is okay. What is the diagnosis? 
don't need to think long you have to tell me unilateral gynecomastia sparse body body hair small volume testicles lh and fsh are high so the sense of smell is normal so what they are trying to rule out they are trying to rule out kalman syndrome am i right what is the other thing that can happen is obviously your klein fenter syndrome that is 47 xxy all right okay <clears throat> now let's take a break and we will come back in just another 10 to 12 minutes okay you have to give me 10 to 12 minutes break and then we will keep continuing okay because i also need a break and you also take a break of 10 minutes have some coffee tea whichever you like come back because we are going to discuss for quite a long time okay quite a long time because entire two person banks past test and past medicine we are going to get it done today and tomorrow maximum i will do today tomorrow i will do a little all right so take a break and come back and we will we will learn okay youtube channel links will be given to you by the moderator you're most welcome thank you okay another 10 to 12 minutes we'll be back
Yes, I'm back. I hope all of you are back. And what is the other person asked? Would you please share the recording software batch? Yes, doctor. It will be uploaded under Medex MX Pet channel. Yeah. <laughs> Yes, it will be definitely uploaded. Yes, welcome back, doctors. Maybe I'll wait for a minute. Till now, we were going on first gear, transmission level one. Now we have to up the gear. Otherwise, one week we will be only learning endocrine. This is like a revision session for you all. I'll just wait for one more minute or next two minutes and I'm going to begin. All right, let's go ahead and start the session. Okay, let others just hop in as we go ahead. Now we have to increase the speed a little. Yes, <clears throat> 42 year old woman referred to clinic with difficulty to manage hypertension. She's currently taking indapamide, ramipril, amlodipine, doxazosin, but her blood pressure is still high. BMI is 25. Ophthalmoscopy reveals evidence of chronic changes, concerns consistent with hypertension. So she is having hypertensive retinopathy, right? So what's happening here? What is the lab values? Low potassium, hypertension that is not controlled with more than three drugs. It has only one diagnosis, okay? This you can find in nephrology lecture. We have a fantastic teacher for nephrology. Dr. Kuda name is there. She will, <clears throat> she would have covered you all this. Considering that, I'm just asking you all, what would be the diagnosis here? The patient is very compliant with medication. There is hypokalemia. What could be the only cause? It could be either Kahn syndrome. Am I right? So what is Kahn syndrome? Kahn syndrome is nothing other than primary hyperaldosteronism. So what is the first line investigation? All of you getting it? Difficulty to manage hypertension. She's currently taking hell lot of drugs. It's not helping her. Okay, it's not helping her. Already fundoscopic changes of hypertension started appearing for her. Low potassium, you are suspecting Kahn syndrome. What test you will do? Anybody, come on. Anyone? CT abdomen, saline suppression, aldosterone renin ratio, urinary catecholamine, 24 hour urinary cortisol. Only one fantastic aldosterone renin ratio. Okay. An elevated aldosterone renin ratio with suppression of renin confirms the diagnosis of primary hyperaldosteronism or Kahn syndrome. Nothing will be helpful. All the antihypertensive drugs, nothing is going to help her. You have to treat Kahn syndrome. Kahn syndrome treatment is given in my lecture. Okay. Next question. 38-year-old woman presents to her GP complaining of palpitation. She also has sweating. She also has weight loss. Around 4 kg weight loss in the past 6 months. There is a family history of thyroid disease. On examination, she has a blood pressure of 145 by 85 and a pulse of 92. Her TSH levels are low. T4 levels are high. <clears throat> Besides that, I don't think there is any abnormality. Symptoms of thyrotoxicosis. 
I mean hyperthyroidism with the family history of thyroid eye disease. You suspect that. Which of the following best fits with the action effects of excess thyroxine? Kind of physiology, right? What happens when thyroxine is excess? Decrease estrogenization, decrease myocardial oxygen demand, increase prolactin release, decrease heart rate, lead to increased bone mass. This is physiology, right? Thyroid hormone physiology, what thyroxine does? What it does to estrogen? What it does to your heart? What it does to prolactin hormone? What it does to your heart rate? Definitely heart rate is going to increase and it will going to increase the myocardial oxygen demand. So those two options are out. Does it lead to increased bone mass? Any other answer? Anyone else want to actively contribute? The answer is decreased estrogenization. Okay. Thyroid hormone has no direct action on prolactin. Prolactin is inhibited by dopamine. It increases the heart rate. No. So the option is out. It increases the myocardial oxygen demand. Because more the heart rate, more the demand for oxygenation for myocardium will increase. Will it lead to increased bone mass? Definitely not. Why? Because an in increased level, it can also cause osteoporosis. At increased level. Okay. So, what it does to estrogen? It increases the estrogen hormone. Okay. It increases the estrogen hormone. Okay. <coughs> Sorry. It decreases the estrogen hormone. As a result of that, if anyone takes excess thyroxine, they may go for, okay, amenorrhea. They may straight away go for amenorrhea and it increases the risk of osteoporosis, like I said, because it decreases the bone mass. All right. This is thyroid physiology. Okay. You want to see the question? No problem, doctor. 38 year old woman with symptoms of thyroid disease is coming, hypothyroidism. What they are asking is, what is the best fit for the action of thyroid hormone? Okay. What it does, they are asking. Does it decreases estrogenization, decreases your myocardial oxygen demand? or increases prolactin release, or it decreases your heart rate, or lead to increase in bone mass. All these things are there. So what they are asking you is, what is the actual action? Thyroid hormone increases the heart rate. So it increases the myocardial oxygen demand. So B and D are out. Thyroid hormone has no direct action on prolactin. It decreases the bone mass leading to osteoporosis. So E is out. So what is the only answer is decreased estrogenization. All right. Next question, 21-year-old medical student. Be careful whenever in the question they are giving things like medical student, nurse, pharmacist. They are always associated with drug abuse. That is the stereotype in UK. With recurrent collapses have occurred a number of occasions in association with stressful periods on the wards. Whenever she gets stress in the ward, she collapses. Okay. If that is the fact, then <clears throat> actually people in acute, acute medicine and people in the specialty which I am going to go stroke medicine, we have to just take a bed and sleep only because wards are stressful, obviously. Most recently, she has been attached to emergency department and has suffered two collapses during cardiac arrest of patients on the unit. Her father is a type 1 diabetes on insulin therapy. You are on call with her overnight. She collapses again. You collect a blood sample. It shows glucose of 1.6 low. High insulin and C-peptide levels are normal. Right. See, normal levels are less than 75. C-peptide levels are 20. <clears throat> what is the most likely diagnosis? It's an insulinoma, glucagonoma, pheochromocytoma, elicities of sulfonylurea, elicities of insulin. What happens? Every insulin release, it releases with C-peptide. Okay. Every insulin, it releases with C-peptide. So, one insulin comes, one C-peptide comes. All right. When the C-peptide level is absolutely going to be low means insulin is coming, C-peptide level should go up along with this level of insulin. It's not going up. It means insulin is coming from some other source. This is normal. Also, sulfonylurea, what it does, it opens the potassium channel. It normally increases the insulin in the body. So, now here what we can conclude is the insulin is coming from some other source. And she is a young lady. And there is no history of any malignancy like insulinoma, glucagonoma, definitely not. Pheochromocytoma, no symptoms are given. 
either it's illicit use of sulfonylurea or it's illicit use of insulin sulfonylurea what it does it mimics the normal secretion of insulin but insulin secretion what it does insulin secretion what will happen to insulin when it comes in it doesn't depend on c peptide because you are taking the hormone and you are giving the hormone from outside so that hormone insulin enters your body and it increases in tremendous number and it will cause hypoglycemia so the answer it illicit use of insulin right the next question 45 year old woman is referred to endocrine clinic complaining of a lump in the neck which becomes particularly prominent when she swallows on examination there is a thyroid nodule on the base genetic screening of two other family members who had <clears throat> okay who had who had medullary thyroid carcinoma has revealed red proto oncogene which other endocrine condition this patient required to screening once she is confirmed with red proto oncogene somebody is having red oncogene mutation so what else she will go and see mtc that is meant to all right do i have to give you more clues absolutely not am i right so red oncogene meant to medullary thyroid carcinoma patient so what else you will go and see what else will be there in a meant men to anybody come on one right answer i'll be more than happy so obviously d pheochromocytoma okay men one men two pheochromocytoma will be there in men two medullary thyroid carcinoma will be there in men two so this is meant to Theochromocytoma, straightforward. Okay. Next question. 62 year old man is brought to the emergency department with a grand mal seizure along with two days of fatigue and drowsiness. He recently underwent surgery for small cell carcinoma. On examination, he is alert with stimulation. Okay. So, what are the what is wrong with the blood works here? Low sodium. Then, if you come down, there is nothing wrong. All right. Small cell carcinoma patient with low sodium. Okay. He had a seizure. Of course, hyponatremia can produce seizures. SIADH is diagnosed. Therefore, first thing what do you do? Fluid restriction. His sodium further falls as a result of that. His drowsiness is increasing. CT is arranged. Which of the following represent the most appropriate management for him? Just remember the word appropriate. You continue fluid restriction, you start dexamethasone, you give normal saline, you give hypertonic saline, you give demiclocycline. What you will do here? People who worked in clinics will definitely be able to answer properly. Medicine residents, anybody? Come on. Of course, first thing, fluid restriction. Next thing, 3% saline. Next thing, your demiclocycline. Further, this is how you escalate, right? This is a normal thing in critical care. All of you would have done that, okay? Next thing, 45-year-old builder is admitted to the emergency department after falling off his ladder. Past history note includes hypertension is managed with ramipril 10 right sided lipid rich lipid rich adrenal adenoma there is an adrenal adenoma blood pressure is 175 by 90 okay so further things what is happening here hemoglobin is okay white cell count is okay platelet sodium is okay but potassium is low obviously adrenal adenoma has a Always will have a low potassium and a high blood pressure. Okay. Low potassium, high blood pressure, more pointing towards adrenal pathology. So, which of the following would like would the next step to reveal the underlying diagnosis? So, what you will do here? 24 hour urinary catecholamine, plasma renin, aldosterone ratio, post BP washout, MIBG scan. MRI of adrenal saline suppression test. Which of the following is the next step? 
adrenal adenoma they have given the diagnosis already they are asking what you will do next they have given the diagnosis to you the answer is b exactly okay exactly because you have to rule out cons so you have to do plasma renin aldosterone ratio all right plasma renin aldosterone ratio they have already taken a ct scan again taking an mri scan what are you are going to find same thing that you can do before surgery right next best thing to do is plasma renin aldosterone ratio that has to be done post bp medication wash out with the patient taking the blood pressure medication you cannot do that all right now you review a 59 year old man with diabetes all the stories given here okay the actual question starts from here that's the peculiar peculiarity of people writing questions for past test i <coughs> i worked as a background question editor for past test and definitely couple of questions has been given from my end and none of the questions were stupid like this you elect a glp1 analog okay or a glucagon like peptide 1 which of the following is a contraindication to treatment with glp1 analog this is the question unnecessarily this guy added a story which is of no relevance all right so they are asking what is the contraindication for glp1 analog increased body mass index is it history of gastroparesis is it history of hypoglycemia background retinopathy smoking history how many of you are using glucagon like peptide one analog in your day to day practice you will know you will know that you will know all of you going for c the answer is b i'll tell you why it means you don't know not using the drugs regularly glp1 analog come on all of you tell me two to three drugs under this two to three drug names two to three names anybody quickly quickly two to three drugs anyone yes liraglutide dulaglutide semaglutide exinatide these all been extracted from jila monster's saliva you know jila monster it's like this komodo dragon okay if it grows up big it can swallow all of us so what it does glp1 analog what is glp1 glucagon like peptide is what it is a type of incretin right incretin i don't want to go in depth this secretes along with the other hormones when there is an elevated blood glucose level to control the blood glucose level right that is what happens with incretin secretion okay this is the basic mechanism why bariatric surgery cures type 2 diabetes mellitus okay on the spot it stops permanently which one the bariatric surgery why because of the incretin action is there okay so this thing the same hormones delays gastric emptying okay as a result what will happen gastroparesis can happen so already somebody is having a gastroparesis if you further delay gastric emptying what will happen disaster only will happen other thing this glp1 analog before giving this drugs you have to screen for one cancer that is medullary thyroid carcinoma you have to check the calcitonin levels that is one more thing with the glucagon like one peptide and agonist glp1 agonist okay so the answer is b history of gastroparesis all right okay 19 year old woman he is admitted to the emergency department after a collapse now she is found to be hypoglycemic you understand from colleagues who accompanied her in the ambulance she collapsed at work this has happened at least three times okay there is no medical history of note apart from her father who is obese diagnosed with type 2 diabetes mellitus 14 years ago so again they are pointing to something like insulin i mean like insulin or sulfonylurea abuse what is happening c peptide is just low normal and insulin is high glucose is low what do you think is the diagnosis glucagonoma metformin abuse retroperitoneal tumor 
insulinoma, insulin abuse. It's definitely not a retroperitoneal tumor. It's definitely not a glucagonoma. Will metformin abuse cause all these things? Or will an insulin abuse cause all these things? Or an insulinoma could be a reason behind this. The answer is insulin abuse. All right. Insulinoma, what will happen? Beta cell hyperplasia. Beta cell hyperplasia, another form is nesidioblastosis. I hope all of you know that, right? So, increase insulin properly. So, C-peptide also will go up. Insulin will also go up. Only in abuse, you will find this. We have just worked out a question. Okay. So, without further delay, the next question. 39-year-old woman with Hashimoto thyroid it is. She presents to the clinic for review. Hashimoto's is managed month with thyroxine 125 microgram per day. She presents to the endocrine clinic complaining of bilateral loin pain. Somebody with Hashimoto thyroid it is, is coming to your clinic who is already on thyroxine supplement. She is now coming and telling you she has loin pain on both sides. What has happened to her? Let's see. Hemoglobin platelet, everything is normal. Sodium is normal and potassium is low. Creatinine is slightly high. Bicarbonate is low. What do you think is happening? Can anyone correlate all these things and think of what exactly is happening? Somebody with a Hashimoto thyroiditis, with the loin pain, with the low potassium, high creatinine and low bicarbonate. Anybody? What they are telling? KUB scan shows evidence of nephrocalcinosis. Renal stones are there. So what is the problem? What are the problem list here? Okay, she has Hashimoto thyroiditis, renal stone is there, right? Increasing creatinine is there. Then what else we saw in the biochemical abnormality? Low potassium, low bicarbonate. Can anybody correlate all these things? Can anybody correlate all these things? Anyone? Anyone? Is it RTA type 4? Is it medullary sponge kidney? Is polycystic kidney disease? Renal tubular acidosis type 1? Chronic interstitial nephritis? RTA type 4? What will happen to potassium levels in RTA type 4? Anyone? What do you get in RTA type 4? You will get decreased potassium or increased potassium. You will get decreased potassium or increased potassium quickly. I don't stop to teach a lot because we have loads of things to study. It will have increased potassium. Okay. So, tubular interstitial disease. So, what do you give for RTA type 4? RTA type 4, what will happen? I will tell you. A type 2 diabetic patient will be there. Maybe a 40-year-old guy. His potassium will be 6.5. He will be living normally with it for 10 years. Creatinine will be normal. What do you give to treat the patient? What do you give to treat a type 4 RTA? You find a patient, a type 2 diabetic with 40 years of age or 50 years of age whatsoever with high potassium, normal ECG will be there. Normal ECG will be there. Creatinine levels will be normal. No nephropathy settings, nothing will be there. No albumin, no proteinuria, nothing. So what do you do to treat the patient? How do you treat? What do you? What is the treatment of type 4 RTA? Treatment of type 4 RTA is fludrocortisone, mineral corticoids you have to give. Here the answer is renal tubular acidosis type 1. It is associated with stones and so many other diseases which will be covered in nephrology. This question unfortunately came to endocrinology. 42 year old woman presents with a mass in her neck. And she has a choking sensation, shortness of breath when she lies down. That is a compressive symptoms. There is a family history of goiter for which her grandmother and mother had a partial thyroid resection, hemithyroidectomy. You examine her and suspect she is having a multinodular goiter. You get to raise her arms over her head. She developed facial plethora after 15 seconds and feels shortness of breath. What is this sign called? It's called Pemberton sign. Right? So, investigation, what is this? Somebody with a thyroid gland 
multinodular goiter the gland is so big it is extended and it is choking her larynx and she is having shortness of breath choking her trachea she is having shortness of breath so what are the other findings here tsh is low then anything specific nothing specific you suspect retrosternal thyroid extension which of the following would be the investigation of choice investigation of choice to determine the degree of retrosternal involvement okay see this is a lady for example okay she has a big thyroid gland okay this is a sternum you want to see how much it is extended beyond the sternum what investigation you will do X-ray, ultrasound, thoracic inlet X-ray, CT chest, radio isotope scan. Logically, you can think and tell. Logically, you can think and tell. Okay, logically, this is think logically. CT chest, of course, sight shape extent of the goiter best it will be revealed by CT chest. All right. Next question. 54 year old man presents with new diagnosis of type 2 diabetes. He is a newly diagnosed type 2 diabetes. He is concerned with his fingers, seems to be a little swollen, no longer he is able to wear his wedding ring. He recently attended a dentist. He said he has new interdental spacing, widely spaced teeth, we call, right? He attends some pictures of his youth. He says his jaw required to acquire increasing prominence, that is, prognathism, high blood pressure. By now, increasing wedding ring size, prognathism, diabetes, you know the diagnosis is acromegaly. Am I right? Any doubt in that? Nothing. Investigation, nothing significant there. Which of the following is the most appropriate initial screening test to confirm the investigation? You all know because we had worked this question like similar question. What is the best screening test? Obviously, the answer is C, IGF-1 measurement. Next question. 48-year-old psychiatric nurse with type 2 diabetes. I said always pay attention and remember whenever they use three things. Nurse, pharmacist, medical student. Okay. Psychiatric nurse with type 2 diabetes presents to the endocrine clinic for review. He was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. After having myocardial infarction three years ago, he has been suspected of gastroparesis but recently asymptomatic. Current medication are metformin, ramipril, simvastatin, aspirin, benroflumethiazide. An examination is BMI is 33. He has gained 7 kg weight. There is a bipedal edema. Alright, bipedal edema. Blood pressure is 135. Anything significant here? Um, nothing. Am I right? Which of the following is the most appropriate additional medication for him? What is this problem? There is a history of gastroparesis, but it's asymptomatic. Type 2 diabetes guy is obese. Obese BM is going 33. All right. He's developed some kind of heart failure. Right. That's why there is an ankle swelling and they have given him diuretics. So what do you do here basically? What is the additional medication you are going to add? Pioglitosome, glycoside, bedtime insulin glargin, GLP-1 analog or a dapaglifosin. You all should be able to answer because it's a day-to-day -day scenario question. Day-to-day -day scenario question. No one should make any mistake. Who else said, yeah, stop here. Payaglitazone will increase retention of what? Sodium and water. It will worsen the heart failure. Worsen the heart failure. Only drug here that has benefit, beneficial effect in heart failure is your dapaglifosin. So the answer is dapaglifosin. You should also know all the adverse effect of dapaglifosin, SGLT2 inhibitor, including the worst dreaded adverse effect is what? Euglycemic diabetic ketoacidosis. All right. Next question. Let's go. 19-year-old man presents to GP complaining of tiredness, polyuria, Thirst, recurrent thirst infection. He has a family history of type 2 diabetes. The early onset, but no history of elevated BMI. On examination, he looks slim. The BMI of 22. There is no evidence of acanthosis nigricans. 
வாட் எல்ஸ் இஸ் ஹேப்பனிங் நார்மல் 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 ஸ்லைட்லி அந்த அப்பர் அண்ட் பொட்டாசியம் இஸ் தேர் நத்திங் எல்ஸ் சிமில ஜிஜிடி இஸ் ஓகே ஹெச்டிஎல் இஸ் ஓகே வாட் யூ திங்க் இஸ் ஹேப்பனிங் நைன்டீன் இயர் ஓல்டு கை இஸ் டயக்னோஸ் வித் டயபிட்டிஸ் ஆல் யூரியா தர்ஸ்ட் ஓரல் த்ரெஷ் இஸ் தேர் வித் நார்மல் பிஎம்ஐ ஓகே ஹி ஹேஸ் அ நார்மல் பிஎம்ஐ ஆல் ரைட் ஹி ஹேஸ் அ நார்மல் பிஎம்ஐ வாட் டூ யூ திங்க் I let GAD, all the antibodies are negative. Okay. Urine and blood ketone measurements are negative. If suppose ketone is positive or urine, this is positive, you can think in types of type 1 diabetes mellitus or LADAR. So it's all negative. So it's ruled out. What is the most likely diagnosis? Obviously, the diagnosis is C, MODI. Okay. High HDL, reserved insulin sensitivity, low renal threshold for glucose low renal threshold for glucose so they'll have glycosuria okay they'll have glycosuria the only drug that will respond to modi is sulfonylurea if you put any other drug it is not going to respond there is something called modi panel we do modi panel all right next question you see a well controlled 58 year old type 2 diabetic patient who is fasting for ramadan he has a background diabetic retinopathy currently takes metformin and as well as ramipril and aspirin so here what else is happening is hb1c is fine creatinine is fine okay. what advice would you give him regarding his medication while he is on fasting stop metformin take two short acting insulin for the evening meal switch glycoside twice a day to change limit the timing of metformin or do not fast what you will tell him hb1c is fairly okay so what is the thing you are going to do all of you would have known this right all of you would have known this with this hb1c you don't need to put an insulin for that poor guy right he is doing an appropriate thing for fasting so you should encourage him to do that fasting is good for diabetes mellitus some stupid lame articles are being written on the internet diabetic people who oh, don't fast suddenly you will become hypoglycemic and you will fall down and that's absolutely lame unless and otherwise he is on insulin it's perfectly okay to fast perfectly okay to fast and also i'm openly challenging and telling fasting is good okay it's better he goes and fast for ramadan it is good so the only thing he has to do is change the time of metformin based on this okay first dose high dose and then second post meal 500 mg like that you can give now a 19 year old female gymnast presents with complaints of headache fatigue she has no significant previous medical history but she has been amenorrheic for the past 4 months she tells you the menstrual cycle began at the age 15 and was regular till she starts some competitive gymnastic training till then her menstrual cycle is okay according to her her blood pressure is 110 and her pulse is 55 bmi is 16 you have seen a similar case right you have seen a similar case a gymnastic person or a sports person a gymnast or a sports person or a model suddenly getting amenorrhea obviously the very first thing is you have to ask are you sexually active and do a urine gravity test test am i right that's the first thing you have to do next thing you have to suspect is what's happening to her okay what's happening to her it could be a hypothalamic amenorrhea but they are not asking that they are asking something different okay which of the following hormones will be elevated here cortisol estrogen lh prolactin thyroid hormone if you know endocrine physiology you will be answered within a second <clears throat> answer is cortisol all stress levels fasting excess fasting not the normal fasting it's good excess fasting i mean this psychopathic diet a lot of people take like you know they just have like some people and i just live in one meal per day i know i seen a guy like who was like that he just had one apple for breakfast to brunch then in the evening he had cottage cheese he dropped nearly 30 kgs i told him it's good 
No, it has to be. Are you able to going to keep on the same weight and throughout your life? It's like yes, but he couldn't because any fat diet is not going to help. Now he back to the normal weight, not just back to the normal weight. Added seven to fourteen kg, seventy eight kgs extra to the normal weight. Normal weight. <clears throat> so this is what happens in catabolic state. Cortisol, growth hormones, lot of other hormones will go up. All right, just remember. Now, women presents with secondary amenorrhea, okay, and galactoria. She has normal visual field on confrontation test. BP is okay, okay. You are concerned she has a prolactinoma. MRI reveals a seven mm pituitary microadenoma, and see her prolactin levels are two thousand hundred and fifty. It's high. Anything else is significant? Nothing. Which of the following hormones would you expect to be low? A prolactinoma lady with a secondary amenorrhea and galactoria, right? Microadenoma is there. Seven mm microadenoma is there. So when prolactin is like that, which of the following hormone will be low? ADH, cortisol, growth hormone, thyroxin, LH. Again, they are going for endocrine physiology. How many of you know the answer? What is the thing that is going to be reduced? What happens when prolactin increases? What happens when somebody is breastfeeding? What happens when somebody is breastfeeding? When somebody is breastfeeding, that itself gives what? Natural contraceptive, right? So it decreases the LH. Prolactin decreases the LH. Straightforward question. Straightforward answer. Now, the next question. 56-year-old patient with poorly controlled type 2 diabetes come to the diabetic clinic for review. He has a history of hypertension to which he takes Ramipril 10 mg, Amlodipine 10 mg. His current diabetes medication is metformin 1 gram twice daily. His BP is 145. He tells you he is smoking 5 to 10 cigarettes a day. All right. Investigations, HbA1c 61.75. Creatinine is slightly high. Nothing else. Vision is good. Fundo, vision is 6 by 6, but fundoscopy reveals neovascularization of the optic disc. Okay? Neovascularization of the optic disc. Means his diabetic retinopathy is set up. Which of the following is the most important next step in his clinical management? Somebody with diabetes, hypertension, increased blood pressure, still smoking, he has retinopathic findings in his fundus. Next step is what? Smoking cessation advice. Transition to insulin therapy. Referral for laser photocoagulation. Add indapamide. Add doxazosin to reduce the BP. Like I said, MRCP will have more than one right answer. Are you caring for her BP? Yes. Photocoagulation should be done. Yes, at one point of time. So the next step is going to be referral for laser photocoagulation. Smoking cessation, yes, you have to do. Why it has to go for a laser photocoagulation? He is already having neovascularization. If little it goes up, it can go to a vitreous hemorrhage or retinal detachment or he can become permanently blind. So immediate thing to do is laser photocoagulation. Now if he is going to sm stop smoking even in the next step, even on the same minute, what they call cold turkey method. The second, they stop things, stop doing things. It's called a cold turkey method of quitting things. Even if he does, it's not going to do. So here, if you see a neovascularization, the next step is immediately take your system, log into your NHS, go log into your <clears throat> log into your system, log into your case file. Go there, enter all the details, immediately refer him for the ophthalmologist. That's the next step. Smoking cessation is the part of it. But what they are asking, the next step in the clinical management is obviously going to be sending the patient for ophthalmologist for a laser photocoagulation. Every word is important. And everything has to be done here. Next, one more drug has to be added. Yes, no doubt. Photocoagulation, yes. Smoking cessation, yes. Insulin therapy may be for a later time. He may need an insulin therapy. But what is the next step? For the best interest of this gentleman is you are going to refer him for photocoagulation. Okay. 
you are drawing up guidelines for the management of oral blood glucose lowering agent for a patient post mi looking at summary of the available evidence which of the following pieces of advice would you give post mi glucose control and i believe all of you would have managed at least couple of myocardial infarction patient and you guys would have definitely managed bringing down their blood glucose levels now what they are telling think what is the right statement okay spiagliptosone should be started in patients with post mi should metformin should be stopped in all patients post mi all patients should be trans transition to permanent insulin therapy or metformin should be stopped in patients who have an unstable circulation post mi or sulfonylurea should be commenced in all patients what do you do common simple common sense question definitely you are not going to give pyagliptosone just now i had told you what it does water and sodium retention leading to cardiac failure you don't want a patient who is admitted to you for mi to develop cardiac failure sulfonylurea definitely not permanent insulin therapy it depends am i right it depends not everyone needs to be going for a permanent insulin therapy the answer is d you need not stop metformin for everyone because earlier they told metformin is contraindicated in pregnancy they gave some weird definition old timers still holding holding on to that but now there is a clear guidelines you can give metformin in pregnancy absolutely while during my residency i wrote ones like metformin for a pregnant lady that oji whoever there in the gynecology sec obstetric section they called and they started brutally thrashing me how dare you write we don't give that in, such thing in our trust this and that then i had to just take some photograph uh, snapshots of the guidelines and send her please educate yourself that's what i left in the email then she stopped ranting so not necessarily you need to stop metformin metformin is a wonderful drug do you know many big pharma companies try to completely stop metformin citing it causes lactic acidosis how many cases of lactic acidosis have you seen in your day to day practice due to metformin very rare am i right same thing like how they wanted to stop uh, lisinopril on all the ac inhibitors citing that is going to cause lung cancer really smoking causes lung cancer then they have to ban all the cigarettes first 45 year old man presents to the clinic after being referred by his gp he complains of recurrent episode of sweating and light headedness what is happening sweating light headedness this is relieved by eating snacks on two occasions patient report he has fainted after missing morning breakfast so he is having some hypoglycemia very clear he is having faintedness sweating light headedness immediately it is relieved by eating some snack he reports the tiredness and poor concentration affected his ability to work he has gained 12 kg weight over the past few 3 months he is fearful of fasting due to associated symptoms his bmi is 31 his bp is 145 his pulse is 75 regular he is obese but there are no other clinical findings of note so what is happening here hemoglobin is 139 wbc everything is okay fasting glucose is 3.9 which of the following is the appropriate next investigation tsh test barium swallow hba1c in patient 72 hours fast and food diary this is case could be an insulinoma <clears throat> or this could be insulin abuse unlikely but still it could be a diabetes mellitus with worsening renal failure okay what happens in, in many diabetic patients if suddenly they develop a very good blood glucose control without actually any effort from patient okay somebody with an erratic diet erratic habits type 2 diabetes mellitus suddenly developing excellent blood glucose control be careful it cannot be a good sign it means the patient may undergoing a renal failure also because once the renal failure the filtration will reduce as a result the insulin will not filter down it will keep circulating and it, the blood sugar levels will be low so you have to be very careful 
So the only way to rule out all this thing is inpatient 72 hours past, 72 hours put the patient in. Okay. So what are the causes of hypoglycemia? Explain is one of the mnemonic exogenous drugs, hypoglycemic, alcohol, quinine, quinolones, pentamidin, pituitary insufficiency, liver failure, adrenal failure, insulinoma, non-pancreatic neoplasm. There are a lot of other causes are there for hypoglycemia. Okay. My last point you mean about the renal failure. <coughs> when patient with renal failure, what happens when sudden people with type 2 diabetes mellitus or type 1 diabetes mellitus? Okay. He is a regular follow-up. He is having a regular follow-up with you. Maybe you think his HbA1c is around 11 and 12 or 10. You are giving him insulin everything. Suddenly you are finding his HbA1c is dropping to 6 or 5. Then actually you have to worry. You have to ask the patient, obviously, are you in some fat diet or good doing good exercise? Then fine. If not, still his HbA1c is surprisingly too low. You have to be worried because he may be developing a worsening renal failure, which can lead to insulin staying in the body more. And as a result of that, the blood glucose will obviously go low. Okay. That is one of the things. All right. Now comes to the next question. 35-year-old man comes to clinic complaining of tiredness, lethargy, increasingly hoarse voice. He also tells you that he's been losing hair and has noticed fullness in his neck. He also gained 7 kg in weight over the past 3 months. On examination, he has a puffy face, periorbital edema and there is a firm rubbery painless goiter. His pulse is 48 beats per minute, regular his blood pressure is 142. His medical history includes celiac disease. He tells you that his mother has a history of underactive thyroid gland. Okay. All the hair loss, tiredness, lethargy, fullness, suggestive of hyperthyroidism mostly. Decreased thyroid. Okay. Plus celiac disease. Can you connect this anywhere? Hypothyroidism with the celiac disease where you will connect this two in two. Unless you don't learn these things here, suddenly patients, they will bring a nice case like this and give the case to you. Then we will be scratching our head. What is happening here? Okay, he is giving thyroid symptoms. Also, he is telling he is having diarrhea. Stools, what they tell in celiac disease, how they give in patients, they will train the surrogate to tell stools that are difficult to flush. Stools will keep floating because of malabsorption. Okay. So, where it is going? It is going in an autoimmune spectrum, mostly Hashimoto's. All right. That's why they are given here very clearly. Fine needle aspiration of the thyroid reveal, diffuse lymphocytic and plasma cell infiltration. Which of the following is most likely diagnosis? Most of you already got it. This is Hashimoto thyroid. It's this. All right. Because Hashimoto thyroid is also associated with, you should know the associations. It is also associated with type 1 diabetes. Celiac disease, even Addison's, vitiligo, and even myasthenia gravis, all these things. So, once you see an autoimmune disease, learn to look for any other autoimmune pathology in that particular patient or even in the particular question step. Right? Next question. 27 year old, what I said? Pharmacist, be careful. He is admitted to the emergency department with a panic attack. On further questioning, he transpires. She has been suffering from palpitation and has lost weight over the past six months. Her period stopped three months ago. On examination, her blood pressure is 145 and pulse is 92. Remainder of the clinical examination is unremarkable. TSH is completely undetectable with very high free T4. Okay, very high free T4. Thyroglobulin level is no and all the antibody levels are low. Scintigraphy shows low or absent uptake in thyroid gland. Yes, pernicious anemia is also part. The huge list is there. APS, big list. Lot of things. Stiff person syndrome. Lot, lot of them. So, what do you will think of a pharmacist? I gave you clue. In MRCP exams, most people end up thinking pharmacists, nurses, doctors, or drug abusers. They abuse prescription drugs. Okay. 
So they give scenarios like that. Here is a pharmacist with symptoms of hypothyroidism. The TSH is low. T4 is high. No autoantibodies are there. Thyroglobulin level is low. Low or absent intake in scintigraphy. If it is actually hyperthyroidism, what will happen? Intake will be more. Here absent intake is there. What do you think it is? Hashimoto's thyroid it is. No. Toxic multinodal or guider and grave disease. Will it cause low or absent intake? Absolutely not. I have shown the scintigraphy images in my endocrine lectures. You guys can go back and see. TSHOMA, no. TSHOMA, what will happen? Increase T3, increase T4, increase TSH. All these things will be up. This is a tyrotoxicosis factitia. Okay. Which will show low thyroglobulin, decreased uptake in scintigraphy, then rise to T4, thyrotoxicosis factitia. Like I said, given the patient is a pharmacist, she is likely to have access to thyroid hormone. Right. Next question. 19 year old woman referred to the clinic because of secondary amenorrhea. She had two periods at the age of 14 and has been taking combined OCP since the age of 16 but stopped it six months ago because she didn't see any need to continue as she wasn't having any periods. Her periods apparently stopped at the age of 26. Both her mother and aunt have an underactive thyroid gland. On examination, her height is 152. Her BMI is 18. She admits undertaking excessive training for long distance running. The question about her weight or other physical examination is unremarkable. She has a normal pattern of secondary sexual care. What is happening here? Hemoglobin, WBC, platelet, creatinine and nothing is abnormal. LH is 73.4, FSH is more, both are elevated. What is the diagnosis? See the points I underlined here. Secondary amenorrhea. Combined OCP she was taking. Then she stopped it. She has an underactive thyroid gland. Is it a hypothalamic hypogonadism? Is it a prolactinoma? Is it a premature ovarian failure? Is it a hypothyroidism? Is it a Sheehan syndrome? This is a premature ovarian failure because of one thing that gives you a clear cut nailing clue. The one thing that will help you to nail it, nail the diagnosis is the LH and FSH level. If it is elevated, it's a premature ovarian failure. Why? LH, FSH will come all the way from up. It will keep trying and acting on ovaries. Ovaries won't respond because ovaries failed. So the levels will accumulate and it will become in increase. All right. This is a premature ovarian failure. 34 year old man here presents with tiredness. He works night shift in factory and suffers from both asthma for which he takes fluticasone and allergic rhinitis for which he takes over the counter nasal spray. His BP is 130 and it drops to 95. Clear cut postural hypotension. Postural hypotension is clearly here. His pulse increases from 65 to 92 on standing. Otherwise, physical examination is unremarkable. Okay. Investigation, what is here? Sodium is quite low. Okay. Next thing about here, potassium is quite high. Creatinine is okay. 9 a.m. cortisol is normal. So, cortisol level 30 minutes into synaptin test is 570. What is the most likely diagnosis? Heterogenic Cushing's, primary adrenal failure, normal adrenal function, corticosteroid related adrenal suppression, SIADH. There is an element of adrenal suppression is here. No denial. But why? Why? Is it A, B, C, D, or E? Think well and answer. Think well and you will nail the answer. Is it a primary adrenal failure? It's not. I'll tell you why. Come back to the question. What this gentleman is having? What is fluticasone? What is fluticasone? 
what is the mechanism of action of fluticus yes he is taking steroids this gentleman is taking steroids this is steroid induced inhaled corticosteroids he is taking fluticasone this leads to hyponatremia postural hypotension okay which returns to the normal range when synecton is <coughs> synecton is what synthetic acth that's why it is named as synecton name itself says acth synthetic okay here the only treatment is if they ask what is the next step you have to ask him to stop the inhaled corticosteroids and you can give some other therapy for his corticosteroid and option rule out come back iatrogenic cushing anything that is suggesting here of cushings in potassium levels in cushings is also going to be low okay potassium levels won't be high in cushings primary adrenal failure what is suggesting here for primary adrenal failure okay i'll come to that next thing normal adrenal function it is no it's not sadh is it sadh absolutely not sadh what will be the sodium levels we worked out the very first question of the session is sadh what was the sodium level low am i right clear this is ruled out this is ruled out this is ruled out so there is only an adrenal failure is here this adrenal failure can be of two causes primary or corticosteroid related Yes, there is some network disturbance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll just get back. Please enable the screen sharing for me. Uh, moderators, that's why my screen is gone. Can you please enable the screen sharing? The moderator is here. Can you please enable screen sharing? Goodness. What happened to the moderator? Where is the world? Medexam expert moderator, please enable screen sharing for me. I'm off the way into the lecture. Yes, yes. I'm just waiting for the screen sharing to be enabled. One second, I will just try to contact the person. Oh, God. Yes, somebody please, where is she? God. Yes, now we are back live. Okay, sorry about the disturbance. Actually, <clears throat> new high speed connection has been up 
upgraded here and as a result of that there is some kind of disconnection and connection is going on okay so this is that so how do you how do you think how how it is not a primary adrenal failure first thing two things look out there the cause of that there is a drug that is being given there next thing <coughs> next thing is the typical cortisol rise post acth okay if the adrenal gland is failed okay for example i'll tell you i'll draw and explain you very quickly if the adrenal gland is here the adrenal gland is failed okay this is your pituitary from pituitary your acth is coming if the adrenal gland is completely failed okay adrenal gland typically releases what cortisol if the adrenal gland is completely gone case it's failed it's dead okay will an externally given acth will make the adrenal gland work and increase the cortisol to that level absolutely not something is failed you cannot do anything it won't do anything but at the same time if the adrenal gland is temporarily suppressed by temporarily suppressed by some steroid that is given externally then you are giving acth in extra it will definitely work you understand all of you getting it that is why the reason is answer is d okay the answer is d all right next 18 year old man comes to endocrine clinic he complains that his weight has increased very significantly over the last 6 months he works hard as a computer operator and has a sedentary job but tells you he at least tries to get out of walk for at lunch times what is this question written i don't understand he walks only for most lunch time for rest of the lunch time he will sit in the chair and lunch comes to him or what i don't understand he also describe recent difficulty rising up from his chair on examination his blood pressure is 142 pulse is 75 bmi is 28 he has an abdominal strain they are getting close to pushings okay now see all these things are normal with low potassium i already told you when there is a low potassium look out for pushings pushing there can be low potassium given the suspected diagnosis what is the next investigation aldosterone level insulin tolerance short synactin high dose dexamethasone 224 hour urinary free cortisol what is the next most appropriate next investigation most appropriate next investigation 24 hour urinary free cortisol okay this has been nicely explained in my four concept lectures of endocrinology how do you approach a cushing syndrome next 19 year old woman presents with nausea vomiting and dehydration she has been unwell for some weeks and passed out while shopping as brought to the hospital by ambulance the only other past history of note is her period stopped few months ago okay she has nausea vomiting and dehydration the periods also stop blood pressure is 110 by 80 on drops on standing postural hypotension is there her bmi is 19 her skin looks quite tanned what all this going up to tanned skin postural hypotension nausea vomiting what 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 is happening what is happening so mandrinal failure let us see the potassium is quite close to the higher end of the normal range sodium is low she is diagnosed with addisons change in hormone is likely to responsible for her amenorrhea it is addisons but what they are asking is what hormonal change is responsible for her to become amenorrheic aldosterone cortisol 17 hydroxy progesterone deoxy dehydroepiandrosterone prolactin who is good in physiology you will be able to nail it <clears throat> the answer is prolactin okay answer is prolactin why i'll tell you most addisons most addisons disease most addisons disease what happens is there will be the prolactin hormone okay this prolactin hormone in turn will cause amenorrhea this prolactin hormone will in turn cause amenorrhea okay all of you got it yes next 
41 year old woman presents to the endocrine clinic because she is concerned about a recent weight gain in total she has put around 5 kg over the past 4 months she is also feeling rather tired and has to reduce her hours at work because of this there is no medication apart from progesterone only pill bmi is 28 bp is high pulse is okay a heart sound says everything is normal. There's a slight smooth goiter on the examination of neck. There is weight gain. She's on OCP. BP is high. Goiter is there. Now see here what happens. Here her free T4 is low. TSH is high. And free T3 is low. Okay. Her triglycerides are elevated, total cholesterol is elevated, anti-thyroid peroxidase antibodies are positive. So the most likely diagnosis is? Most likely diagnosis is? Yes, fantastic. This is Hashimoto's thyroiditis. 72-year-old woman is admitted to the emergency department with confusion. She is known to have both hypothyroidism, hypertension, she takes ramipril and thyroid hormone replacement. Her thyroxine dose increased a very increased a few weeks ago because her T4 was slightly below the normal range. On examination, BP is 142 by 82. Pulse is fine. BP, BMI, no abnormal days are present. Let us go to the biochemistry. This will give the diagnosis. What is that? Last two columns, 72-year-old lady. TSH is high. And T4 is low in a 72-year-old lady who is already taking ramipril and thyroid hormone replacement. TSH is low and TSH is high and T4 is low. Is it thyroid hormone resistance or is it a non-compliance with medication, poor absorption, viral thyroiditis, sick you thyroid syndrome? What is the answer? The answer is non-compliance with the medication. First thing, the clue is the age. Okay. Sick euthyroid syndrome, I will explain. I had already explained how it presents. Okay. And <clears throat> viral thyroiditis, there are no other signs of it or things in history. Poor thyroxine absorption can occur in elderly people, but it won't significantly produce changes as such you are seeing. Okay. Non-compliance with the medication is the most common thing that could have. We can speculate. This is an answer out of speculation. You can speculate seeing the history. This is the only thing that is mostly possible. Okay. 32 year old woman attends a GP complaining of anxiety and tiredness. She has no other past medical history of note. On examination, there is a diffusely enlarged, smooth, non-tender goiter. Her BP is 142 by 85, pulse is 90. Okay, there is an anxiety and tiredness. BP is high, pulse is high. T3 is high, T4 is high, TSH is also high. How would you best investigate the patient? How would you best investigate the patient? What is happening here? T3 is high, T4 is high, TSH is high. If all the three are high, what you will do? Thyroid ultrasound, FNA, MRI, isotope, autoantibody. Anybody? Anybody? Answer is C, MRI. Just now, sometime back, I said something called TSHOMA. What I said about TSHOMA, how it presents? T3, T4, TSH, what I said, all will be increased. If you suspect thyroid antibody, for example, you suspect Graves' disease, what will happen in Graves' disease? T3 and T4 will tremendously increase and it will suppress the TSH. Am I right? Yes. If you suspect Hashimoto's, it will give a hypothyroid picture. Thyroid isotopes can what it will tell if it will just help you to know whether the gland is active or not active. FNAC of thyroid that you should do later. Thyroid ultrasound scan. 
to measure the volume. So here you have to do MRI. Always remember T3, T4, TSH, all is increased, then it is coming from higher above from the pituitary. It's called a TSH OMA. Okay. Then you have to do MRI scan of the pituitary. Okay. Come. Next question. 34 year old man presents to emergency department with his wife says she is complained of sudden onset severe headache, nausea, and vomiting, double vision, and then passed out on her. He works as a lawyer. No significant past history of notice that. Apart from the fact he has recently been undergoing a trial of sildenafil for erectile dysfunction. On examination, he looks pale. BP is low, pulse is high. Then what is remarkable, he begins to wake up more as you examine him, able to speak and obey command. Severe retroorbital headache is there and bitemporal superior quadrant anopia on visual field testing is there. You given him some intravenous cyclism and he continues to vomit. Can anyone make something out of the scenario? Here you are finding a 34 year old man. This gentleman has a sudden onset severe headache, nausea and vomiting. With low blood pressure, he also started looking pale. There is severe retroorbital headache and with some bitemporal superior quadrant anopia. What other things are here? Here we expect less low sodium, high potassium. Then what is there? TSH levels are okay. T4 levels are low. Testosterone levels are low. What is the most likely diagnosis leading to the acute presentation? Subarachnoid hemorrhage, pituitary apoplexy, migraine, parietal lobe infarct, and non-functioning pituitary adenoma. This won't present like that. Non-functioning pituitary adenoma is a non-functioning person. It doesn't do anything. Parietal lobe infarct, what visual field defect you are getting here? Superior quadrant anopia. Parietal field infarct will cause what? I gave you the mnemonic in neurology. It's called PITS. Parietal inferior temporal superior. Am I right? So, parietal field in parietal lobe infarct will cause what defect? Inferior. All right. Migraine will present with this kind of things. It can present with nausea and vomiting. Some scintillating scotoma and all can be there. But this much dramatic biochemical changes will be there in migraine? Absolutely not. Subarachnoid hemorrhage, yes, it can present like that with all this biochemical change. No. So the answer is pituitary apoplexy. Right. The next question. 18 year old woman of European Jewish descent comes to GP complaining of primary amenorrhea. On examination, she looks a little hirsute and has evidence of facial acne. She is within her predicted height range, normal breast, external genitalia, although there is excess hair over her lower rib abdomen around her nipple area. Okay, hair around the lower abdomen, around the nipple area, primary amenorrhea, acne, hirsutism, everything is there. <coughs> here, what is abnormal? Nothing much is abnormal over here. 17 hydroxyprogesterone is 1.4 times upper limit of normal. Normal ovary, uterus, everything is visualized. What is the diagnosis? Is it CAH, classical or non-classical? Turner, testicular feminization or is it polycystic ovarian syndrome? The answer is C, non-classic congenital adrenal hyperplasia. Why? In PCOS, 17 hydroxyprogesterone levels won't be increased. So it's not. Classical, it present as what? Classical present as what? In infancy and early childhood as salt wasting is present as a salt wasting syndrome. So it's not, obviously. It's not a Turner syndrome. You know why. It's not a testicular feminization because everything is there. Here, external genitalia, everything is there. Just she has external hair growth and increased 17 hydroxyprogesterone. So the only answer that could fit here is non-classical adrenal hyperplasia. So that is the answer. 29-year-old woman presents to the GP with tiredness after the birth of her first baby. She noticed that over the past few weeks, she has been progressively begun to lose energy and it has been easy for her to lose her baby weight. On examination, BP is 132, pulse 89, BMI 22. She has painless enlarged thyroid gland. Okay, painless 
enlarged thyroid gland after pregnancy what is happening here to the thyroid hormone levels tsh is low t4 is high anti thyroid peroxidase antibodies are positive so what is the diagnosis doctors i won't even need to turn to the next page many of you will diagnose post pregnancy tpo antibodies positive low tsh and increased t4 what is it called it is a hyperthyroidism there is no doubt in that but what is it called post pregnancy you are seeing this there is only one condition that can lead to this post pregnancy not everything will lead to this what is that it is called your good old postpartum thyroid it is all right postpartum thyroid it is there are two to three phases of postpartum thyroid it is i had explained in my lecture you guys can go and see it's free to view all right next 19 year old ah, here comes nursing doctors dentist pharmacist refer to the endocrinology clinic with frequent dizzy spells and collapses she this seems to happen at the time of stress she tells you she feels hungry beforehand and feels she likes to eat something the frequency of attack is increasing she is now having one or day one or two days once once or twice they seems to have happened after she has been jogging she has a family history of type 2 diabetes on examination bp pulse is normal general examination is unremarkable here glucose levels are normal what else they have given potassium levels are slightly on the higher end creatinine is okay sodium levels are okay what is the best diagnostic investigation insulin levels after 72 hours of fast fasting c peptide hba1c insulin glucose and c peptide during an attack or glucose during an attack you have to take insulin glucose and c peptide during an attack they haven't done that after you find such thing after you find such thing after you find such thing then you can do what you know then you can do after you find such thing after you find such thing then you can admit the patient you can do an inpatient admission of the patient then you can check everything and not now definitely not now after you find all these things then you can go for a inpatient admission and then you can do all these things okay you can do all these things so answer is d now comes a 57 year old man admitted with 57 year old man this 57 year old man is admitted with central crushing chest pain is found to have an inferior mi he has a stable blood pressure with no signs of cardiac failure is stented in a catheter lab okay there is a past history of hypertension for which he takes ramipril 10 mg daily he gave up smoking 5 years ago his bmi is 31 bp is 131 by 85 admission blood glucose is 13 subsequent fasting blood glucose is elevated as 8.2 a typical scenario in a mi patient what is happening fasting blood glucose is high hdl levels are light to low ldl levels are high okay which of the following is the most appropriate way to manage his blood diabetes post stenting in the long term you will give insulin you will give mixed insulin basal bolus insulin iv insulin iv insulin they are asking in the long term you will give metformin monotherapy or you will give diet only see here the bmi the blood glucose he has an mi now tell me metformin monotherapy is more than enough because it has a favorable cardiovascular profile okay so now the best agent you can start here It's a normal scenario, right? Twenty-four year old medical student presents with medical student here. Note down recurrent episodes of collapse. She says that she has periods of shaking and intense hunger that led her to eat, and she has put on four kg in weight over the past few months. Only medication she is taking is OCP. On examination, her BP is one thirty-two, BMI is twenty-eight. 
what are the investigation fasting glucose is 4.1 it's okay so what investigations you will do here obviously only thing you can do here is answer c 72 hours supervised fast this question is just similar to the question which we have seen but we are seeing all the questions because as we promised we are not going to leave any question from those two few banks we are going to discuss everything in and out with our reach next question 47 year old woman is admitted via the emergency department she has been suffering with increasing headaches over the past few months and a bp of 200 by 110 g p noted bp previously has been monitoring monitoring it her bmi is 27 Fundoscopy shows hypertensive changes, that is AB nipping and silver wiring. You know the classification, I believe. Keith Wagner back end classification. I hope all of you know that. Changes and di <clears throat> different stages of hypertensive retinopathy. So, what happens here? Also, protein is high, urinary protein is high. Which of the following is mostly likely diagnosis given all the things? Tension headache, essential hypertension. Benign intracranial hypertension, pheochromocytoma, diabetic retinopathy. Sorry, see here, one more thing I forgot to tell you is potassium levels is low. What could be the only answer? Pheochromocytoma, straightforward thing, okay? Straightforward thing, retinal changes, hypertension, headache, you know all the hedges of pheochromocytoma, headache, palpitation, hyperhidrosis, everything, okay? Now let's go to the next question. 35 year old man who drinks 70 units of alcohol per week comes to the GP surgery for a review. He takes regular serotide for asthma and uses intermittent oral prednisolone for exacerbation. But he has no medication history other than that. His BP is 170. Okay. Pulse is 76. BMI is 33 with significant abdominal adiposity. That means he is having fat around the abdominal area. What are the investigation here? The thing that is more significant here is nothing much. Which of the following is most likely explanation for the clinical findings? Go back to the question. An alcoholic, 70 units of alcohol. I hope all of you know the permissible units of alcohol per week. What is the permissible unit? They will ask you. What is the permissible unit? What is the permissible unit for alcohol? How much? 30 units. Doctor, you are too liberal. People will be more than happy to be your patient in UK especially. If you allow them to have 30 units, very good, fantastic. 14. Now the unit is 14 for both. <coughs> I don't know, some <coughs> recent changes. Somebody went and started creating some fuss. Why it is low for women, why it is high for men, blah, blah, blah. They are not ready to understand size. Now, mostly, most of the things, especially in Scottish, Scottish side, we are allowing 14. Yeah. Till I was there, it was 14. Okay. So, what is happening? There is some pushing like features here. She also has hypertension, abdominal adiposity. So, which of the following? Pushings, pheochromocytoma, intermittent prednisolone use, hyperaldosteronism, pseudo pushing syndrome. Answer is pseudo pushing syndrome. Lot of things are there here that can put into the main thing is alcohol. Alcohol itself can cause pseudo pushings. You should be knowing all the ill effects of alcohol. Okay. 46 year old women with a history of cluster headache, heterozygous familial hypercholesterolemia, controlled schizophrenia, reflex esophagitis. Who is taking number of medications, obviously comes to the clinic, she complains of milk leakage on minimal stimulation, including when she has sexual intercourse with her husband and problems with vaginal dryness. When this thing happens, what, what do you think of milk leakage and vaginal dryness? Most commonly, this is due to prolactin, right? Am I right? One of you are clear? Most commonly, it is due to prolactin. So, on examination, a BP is 132 by 72, pulse is 73 beats per minute. Neurological examination is unremarkable. You are able to elicit milk leakage and palpation of her nipples. So let's go and investigate her. What is happening? Her prolactin is high. They are asking which medication leads to this. 
see the medication list and tell me which medication would have led to this notorious adverse effect which she is facing right now. Atinolol, cholestramine, haloperidol, pisotifen and simvastatin. The answer is, come on, the answer is C, your good old haloperidol. Fantastic. Haloperidol is the reason behind this. In our clinical pharmacology lecture, we have covered it extensively. We have covered it extensively. All right. The next thing, 22-year-old man is referred with severe hypertension. Despite taking maximal dose of AC inhibitor and a calcium channel antagonist, his BP is still elevated at 160 by 100. She is taking AC inhibitor, calcium channel blocker, BP is high. He also has a history of generalized muscle weakness, which makes it difficult to carry out his job as sales rep. On examination, his BP is 155 by 95, pulse is 75 by beats per minute, respiratory, all the examination is normal. Somebody with severe hypertension, AC inhibitor, everything is going still. The BP is not able to control. And here, here is the clue, low potassium. Low potassium, slightly elevated creatinine and renin and aldosterone is suppressed. What is it? I told you the sequence, low BP, sorry, low potassium, high BP, slightly elevated creatinine. Where is the pathology? First thing you guys have to tell me, where is the pathology? First you should know where is the pathology. If you know where is the pathology, then everything is going to be simple. If you don't know where is the pathology, then everything is going to be troublesome. You should be able to tell me where is the pathology. Where is the pathology now? Where is the pathology? Adrenal, that's what I wanted to hear from you all. Adrenal pathology. So what this could be? What this could be? Is it littles? Definitely it's not periodic paralysis. Okay. I hope all of you know. Done. It's not Barter or Gittleman syndrome. It could be either little or either cons. What is it? The diagnosis is little syndrome. The diagnosis is little syndrome. Why it is a little syndrome? Okay. Why there is it is a little syndrome? There are a lot of things here tells it is a little syndrome. I'll explain you everything. Okay. It's a new syndrome. I'll explain you everything. There is some overlap between nephrology and endocrinology and where that is a point where we are going. We will be learning all these things. Why it is a little syndrome? <clears throat> First, come here. First thing, hypertension, hypokalemia. Okay, hypertension, hypokalemia. Increased bicarbonate meaning what? Increased bicarbonate is what? Bicarbonate is an acid or an alkali? It is an alkali. So increase, at least remember alkalosis. I am not going to go in depth of metabolic respiratory compensated. No. Okay. Alkalosis. And renin aldosterone ratio, both are suppressed. In con syndrome, will it get suppressed? No. So it's not a con syndrome. So you get a finding like this. A hypertension a hypokalemia and alkalosis, renin aldosterone ratio suppressed, go straight and hit little syndrome. Okay. This is due to ENAC mutation. You can learn more about it in nephrology class. Okay. 65 year old woman presents with a rapidly worsening strider and a neck mass. She says this neck mass has doubled in size over the past three months. There is no history of heat or cold intolerance. She is anxious about her neck mass. There is no more than would be expected. Only medication of notice, she is having only ramipril. Okay. An examination, BP is okay, pulse is fine. She has a large, hard thyroid mass, largest over the left hand side. Okay, but it extending to the right and with regional lymphadenopathy. Extending to the right. Okay, you want to know how to rule out B? Like I said, renin aldosterone ratio. Okay. And also you won't find much of alkalosis there. Here you will find alkalosis. Okay. Here you will find <coughs> alkalosis. All right. 
a hard thyroid mass largest on the left hand side extending to the right with some regional lymphadenopathy in a 65 year old lady see the investigations here the investigations reveals nothing significant is there except slightly upper limit of the calcium slight upper limit of the calcium what it could be okay somebody with a neck mass rapidly worsening strider double the size over the past three months if you had listened to my endocrinology lecture you will know what it is because i told how different thyroid carcinomas present in different manner in different people i had told you guys very clearly how different thyroid carcinoma present in different people in different ways this is an anaplastic thyroid carcinoma why it's rapidly enlarging worsening it has a poor prognosis very poor prognosis see here the size doubled in the past three months not typically all the carcinoma will double in three months and an elderly age group it's anaplastic thyroid carcinoma okay now a 54 year old man with type 2 diabetes presents to the clinic he has had diabetes for the past four years currently he takes metformin one gram bd unfortunately his hba1c is deteriorated for the past few months okay it is up to 8.4 on examination bp is 155 his bmi is 34 he works as a taxi driver and he is concerned about hypoglycemia so you elect to start cetagliptin what is the mode of action of cetagliptin few seconds only i will give i want all of you to answer mode of action of cetagliptin come on it's a medical student question no need to think come on i want your answers i want your answers fantastic is yes. It's DDP4 inhibitor. All right. There is not much explanation needed on this. I think. Right. So DDP4 inhibitor. 23 year old with XY genotype but complete androgen insensitivity syndrome comes to the clinic. Which of the following is the most likely phenotype of this patient? Androgen insensitivity system syndrome, AAS, complete partial or Refenstein. Everything has been thought. So now you guys have to tell me which of the following is most likely phenotype of this patient. You will have normal pattern of secondary sexual hair, female genitalia with clitoromegaly or male genitalia with small testes, scanty secondary sexual hair or a normal female genitalia in the absence of secondary sexual hair or a normal male genitalia or a normal female genitalia with a short stature. Yes, doctor, after this questions, question you can go for a prayer break just we will do this question and we can take a break no problem <clears throat> we can take a good 10 15 minutes break so what do you find in a complete androgen insensitivity syndrome the answer is c normal female genitalia with absence of secondary sexual hair Please go back and listen to my lecture if you have confusion in these topics because I had clearly, clearly mentioned everything in very detailing, in depth detail I had measured. Okay. Like some <clears throat> doctors requesting, we can take a break, we can take a prayer break and we can come back in 10 to 12 minutes or to the max, be here at least in 15 minutes from now. Okay. Let's take a break and we will begin after the break. Okay. See you doctors.
I am back. I hope all of you can hear me. Hello. How many of you are here? Yes, yes, all, all are here. Attendance is slightly trimmed down. It's okay. This lectures will obviously benefit you. That's why we are sitting and working out MCQs with you, all the mentors. That's what we have decided. We have already covered most of the subjects <clears throat> in and out in our core concept lectures. So this is the next step in learning, MCQ. So what happens many a times when we let the candidates to do the MCQs on themselves, many of them are struggling, fumbling, doing mistakes. Yes, doctor, we are going to cover complete endocrinology. The fastest past medicine we are going to get it done by tomorrow. <clears throat> Sorry. So those of you not aware of MedEx, I'm expert and the courses, if you are watching this or watching a recorded session. What we do in MedEx, I'm expert is <clears throat> we first do a core concept lecture. Core concept lecture is Nothing other than, for example, endocrine means in and out of endocrine in three to four hour lecture will be there. Completely, we will cover most important topics and the basic concepts, how to approach it. And we use even <clears throat> videos of real patients, real patients and teach. Next thing followed by this, we have our MCQ discussions, which is kickstarting now. Even the previous batches were not actually lucky enough to have a full MCQ discussion. Now we started a full MCQ discussion. Like now, endocrine is the first subject we are covering full, complete uh, all the MCQs, even if it is repeating. That's why you can see some of the MCQs are repeat. We are still doing it because we want to make sure we are not missing anything. Completely, we work out all the MCQs like this with everyone who's enrolled and some free sessions as well to other people. After this, the next step is we are going to work out last five years past papers. I don't think there should be any reason to fail in the examination if any course offers you these three things. The concepts are covered. The mentors are sitting and working out all the MCQs with you. The past papers are covered. What thing you to do is it's the uh, highest level of spoon feeding, doing everything at your disposal. The only thing you guys have to do is go to the exam center and sit and give the exam or sit in front of your computer and give the examination and come. That's it, right. Everything else is done from our end. So this is our med exam expert. If you're first time listening to this, uh, <clears throat> you can enroll in our course. In our future courses, we are going to cover all the subjects, all the MCQs, including past papers, everything. This will be our lecture. You can check our lectures in the uh, YouTube. We have you have all the things over there. You can check the lectures in the YouTube. Okay. All right. With this, I'm going to start the next question. Okay. 22 year old woman comes to the clinic complaining of hirsutism, particularly around the jawline and around the upper chest and the lower abdomen. In addition, she has particular problems with acne. Apparently, she has intermittent heavy periods which tended to occur only every three to four minutes. On examination, her BP is 148 by 84 millimeter of mercury, pulse is 70, BMA is 33. You confirm excess hair over her jawline, upper chest and abdomen. Kind of giving a picture of PCOS. All would be online or recorded on doctor has asked. And to the answer to the question is, all these lectures are live, okay? <clears throat> All this MCQ discussion sections are live. Core concepts we already done. We have some live lectures on that too. If you listen to the recorded core concept lecture, that should be more than enough. Still, we have live lectures on that. All the MCQ discussions are live. And this will be recorded and kept in the library. So whenever you guys want to, uh, suppose some people may not be able to attend the lecture because of the duties. Still, we would suggest them to do so to get through MRCP1 at the first attempt. So this is what we do. <clears throat> So here is the investigation. Her LH levels are okay. Her FSH levels also okay. But the prolactin levels are high. The testosterone levels are high in a female. So what do you think is going on? 
simple obesity, PCOS, microprolactinoma, hypothyroidism. The answer is PCOS. Okay. How do you find? It's a PCOS. See the LH and FSH ratio. It will be elevated. Testosterone. Elevated. Typical syndromic appearance. How a PCOS woman? Mostly slightly obese lady with slightly higher BMI. Acne, hirsutism, all those things. Right. Acne, hirsutism, everything. And there will be elevation of prolactin levels. All these things can cause PCOS. PCOS can cause heavy periods and oligomenorrhea also, not necessarily amenorrhea. PCOS can have a normal menstrual cycle also. It depends on a lot of things. Once you put the ultrasound probe and see how many cysts are there. Because PCOS these days, like someone with very few cysts also, people concluding as a PCOS, they may not have a great symptoms. But it can spread from either end when it comes to the menstrual cycle abnormalities. Next question. 17 year old girl comes to the clinic with a mother. They are concerned that she has not yet entered puberty. 17 year old girl not yet entered the puberty. Past medical history notes left inguinal hernia which was repaired. BP 110, pulse is okay, height 176 centimeter. She has normal breast development normal external genitalia although there is absence of secondary sexual hair which of the following is the most likely diagnosis a girl with normal external genitalia normal breast development has a inguinal hernia and did not entered puberty what do you think of the same question we had worked out during a core concept lecture the same case history androgen insensitivity syndrome Anorexia, congenital adrenal hyperplasia, Klein-Filter syndrome, Turner syndrome. The answer is androgen insensitivity syndrome, XY genotype. What happens? There will be testes in these ladies, okay? Externally, normal genitalia, breast development will be there, but they won't enter puberty. You will find sparse hair but you won't find a typical hair around in the pubic area female also should be able to have hair you won't find that hairs over there and the next thing you will find here is you will find an inguinal hernia what are the inguinal hernia this inguinal hernias are nothing other than undescended testis what is the medical term for undescended testis it's called cryptorchidism so you are getting a question somebody is not entering puberty proper breast is there Female external genitalia, vagina is there, but secondary sexual character is not, hair is not there and she has not entered the puberty. She is having an inguinal hernia. That's enough. You can pinpoint, go ahead and mark. This is an androgen insensitivity syndrome XY genotype class. Okay. Next thing. 24-year-old woman has a history of hypothyroidism. She has been treated with thyroxine replacement and hypoadrenalism. This is treated with hydrocortisone. She is concerned as she has no periods for the past five months. Okay. Rest of the thing is fine. Now what we are getting, a 24-year-old woman, it's a history of hypothyroidism. She is treated with thyroxine replacement. And hypoadrenalism, this is also again treated with <coughs> hydrocortisone. She has a concern that she has no period for the past five months. She has not had any periods. So let us see. Pregnancy test is the first thing you have to do. Negative. Estrogen is quite low. LH is high. LH is low. Okay. And FSH is low. What kind of table is this more than equal to the effort? Okay. So what is the most likely diagnosis? 24-year-old hypothyroidism, thyroxine replacement, hypoadrenalism also there. What are the possibilities? Androgen insensitivity? No, it is not. Polycystic ovarian syndrome? No, it is not. Again, am I right? It's a primary ovarian failure, secondary ovarian failure, Turner syndrome. What would be the diagnosis here? This is a primary ovarian failure. Okay. Here they have, didn't give the appropriate values here. Like actually LHS, LH, FSH will be elevated. 
this is a primary ovarian failure okay straightforward primary ovarian failure okay next 17 year old gymnast again we are back to gymnast presents to endocrine clinic with lethargy and amenorrhea she admits limiting her calorie intake an examination her blood pressure is 100 by 60 everything is fine bmi is just 18 and what are the other finding tsh is okay everything is working what other finding you will anticipate in laboratory testing first thing before anticipating what are the finding in the laboratory testing you should have an idea what is going on what do you think is going on with this lady a young lady 17 year old with amenorrhea she is on gymnast she is a model she is an athlete i told you when you get such things <clears throat> look for and think in terms of any hypothalamic amenorrhea s yes. So, what you will get in hypothalamic amenorrhea is what they are asking. A or B or C or D or E. You will get a decreased FSH or you will get a raised FSH or a raised LH. Decreased prolactin or in raised testosterone. What exactly you will get here? That's what they are asking. Can anyone tell? Come on, you can answer here. You can experiment here, but you cannot do what? You cannot experiment in the real exam. The answer is decreased FSH. Okay? Decreased FSH. Right? What happened? Here, there will be secondary ovarian failure. Okay? There will be decreased FSH. What happens here? ACTH will come from pituitary gland. Okay, <clears throat> here are the ovaries. Okay, here what will come? LH will come, FSH will come, but our calorie intake will be so limited here. Okay, calorie intake will be so limited. As a result of that, what will happen? The calorie intake is so limited, then it leads to ultimately a uh, secondary ovarian failure in the pituitary level. So, when the calorie intake is so low, even the LH and FSH won't come from the pituitary. So, there will be decreased FSH. Okay? There will be decreased FSH. Okay, and then again, we come to the next question. 20-year-old nursing student. We got again, we back to the stereotypical pattern. He is admitted to the emergency department third time in three months having suffered a collapse. Her glucose level at the time is 1.5. There is no past medical history of note. Only medication currently is the progesterone only pill. What is the appropriate investigation to differentiate between insulin abuse and insulinoma? Very straightforward question. Come on, tell me what is the answer. Very straightforward question. We have seen multiple times. There is no point in delaying to answer this question. Multiple questions we have seen. The answer is A. Insulin C peptide levels at the time of attack. Okay. Insulin C peptide levels at the time of attack. Next question. 22-year-old man with diabetes mellitus come to the clinic for review. He tells you he has recently moved to the area and has been told he has Modi. Which of the following features in his history would lead you to suspect that he is correct? BMI of 32. Modi will have normal BMI. Failure to respond initially to glycoside. Glycoside is what? What drug is glycoside? It's a sulfonylurea. Will they respond or not? They will respond. Yes. Frequent admissions with DKA. Do they? No. That is LADA. LADA people and type 1 diabetes people will get frequent admission. What is LADA? Light and autoimmune diabetes mellitus. Right? Initial requirement for insulin therapy? No. So the answer is E. Family history of diabetes mellitus. You should know all the different types of MODI which has been clearly explained in my core concept lectures. All right, next question. 52-year-old man is here. He's referred to the clinic with a rapid weight gain. He's having a rapid weight gain, increased acne, recent diagnosis of type 2 diabetes mellitus. There is hypertension and then there is evidence of acne. BMI is high, abdominal stria. So you are expecting Cushing's disease. You are on the money. Yes, correct. Which of the following electrolyte abnormalities you would expect to see? I had told you. 
what is this what abnormality you will see in cushing's i had told it first of all acidosis or alkalosis The answer is C, excellent hypochloremic metabolic acidosis because potassium depletion will be there in all Cushing's and there will be decreased chlorine. So, hypochloremic metabolic alkalosis, okay. What happens here in Cushing's is there will be excess glucocorticoids. The steroids will lead to potassium depletion, okay. Potassium will go out. Potassium goes out as a result of that sodium and water will be retained, okay. How it retained is, <clears throat> once this retained, this will send out your chloride. So, you are getting hypochloremia with metabolic alkalosis. Right? Next question. 32-year-old woman with a history of polycystic ovarian syndrome comes to the clinic for review. She is obese. Her BMI is 31 and has a BP of 145 by 82 millimeter of mercury. She has facial acne excess hair around her bird line. She tells you she wishes to become pregnant and improve her appearance if possible. As read about using metformin, which of the following most closely represent the primary action of metformin in the treatment of PCOS? Does it increase insulin sensitivity? Does it reduce insulin secretion? Does it reduce circulating estrogen or testosterone? Or does it reduce the appetite? Any idea how and why we prescribe insulin metformin polycystic ovarian syndrome? The answer is A. Yes, it does increase insulin sensitivity. Because PCOS people, most of them will have something called insulin resistance. The people with PCOS will have high level of insulin resistance. Next question. 45-year-old woman with polydipsia, polyuria, which has becoming an increasing problem. She has hypertension for that. She is taking ramipril and she has an episode of renal colic. Her other examinations are unremarkable. This is the thing they are giving. T-score is minus 2.6. She has parathyroid adenoma. Calcium levels are high. Phosphate levels are low. What is your management of choice? Before that, tell me what is the diagnosis. Then after knowing the diagnosis, we can go ahead and see what is the management. Come on now, tell me a 45-year-old lady is there. She is having polydipsia, polyuria, renal colonic. What it's suggesting of hypercalcemia. Am I right? Okay, here. She has high calcium, obviously, low potassium. So, it's a primary hyperparathyroidism because she is having parathyroid adenoma. Her T-score is minus 2.6. So, what you are going to do? You are going to give synacalcet. You are going to observe. You are going to do parathyroidectomy. You are going to do raloxifen or you are going to give residronate. The treatment is parathyroidectomy because I had mentioned in a slide what are the indications for parathyroidectomy? The patient has symptomatic hyperparathyroidism. You have to remove the gland. Rest of the indications, it's in my lecture. Please see. 61-year-old man with history of type 2 diabetes mellitus and chronic kidney disease. He is presenting to the clinic with worsening bony aches and pains over the past few months. He has a history of hypertension, previous myocardial infarction and takes lisinopril amlodipine, rosuvastatin, BD mixed insulin. His BP is 148 by 90 and pulse is 74. There are no heart murmurs. What they are asking here? Here are the investigations. He is recommended on low phosphate diet. PTH is high, calcium is low. PTH is high, calcium is low and phosphate is high. So we are dealing with the secondary hyperparathyroidism. Am I right? Secondary hyperparathyroidism. So what intervention you will do? You will give lanthanum carbonate. You will give alendronate. You will give calcitonin. You will give 1-alpha calcidol. You will give sinacalcet. Parathyroid, sometimes it can be a very dry subject to learn. 
but we are bound to learn. Okay. <clears throat> what is the answer? The answer is one alpha calcidum. Okay. Secondary hyperparathyroidism, I told you. The very first step is supplement the calcium. So give one alpha calcidol D is the appropriate answer. Okay. In secondary hyperparathyroidism, I told you how to identify that calcium levels will be low. Calcium levels will be low. PTH levels will be high, phosphate levels will be high. If you find such a scenario, it is secondary hyperparathyroidism and the treatment is one alpha calcidol. Don't forget, don't make any mistake in this. 29 year old man now presents with tiredness, headaches, coupled with loss of libido over the past few months. He continues to hold down a job as a salesman, but is finding it increasingly demanding. The work as a salesman, he finds it demanding. Okay. And it's fine. Uh, there is no past medical history. He smokes 10 cigarettes and one bottle of wine per week. BP pulse is fine. He's having bitemporal hemianopia. So somebody is tired. Somebody loses his libido. And he finds the job as a salesman is very difficult. He has bitemporal hemianopia. So where is the pathology? Quickly, quickly answer. Where is the pathology? So what is the answer? Craniopharyngioma, glioblastoma, meningioma, pituitary metastasis, pituitary adenoma. What is the pathology? Come on. E, A, two answers. At least I'm happy you guys localized it to pituitary. The answer is pituitary adenoma. Why it's not a craniopharyngioma, it's a pituitary adenoma. There is some... Disturbance in the sex hormone levels as a result, he is also having loss of libido. This is a case of pituitary adenoma. Okay? Pituitary adenoma. I know, all of you know, what is the cause of hemianopia. 29-year-old man presents to the clinic with the diabetes mellitus, which was identified after he visited a GP with tiredness and lethargy. His fasting blood glucose is 9.2. And on further questioning, questioning, he is admitting of nocturia. BP is 122. Which of the following is the strongest pointer towards diagnosis of type 1 diabetes? How many of you are aware you can diagnose type 1 diabetes even at 30 years? Anybody interested in endocrinology? Read latest ADA guidelines. They explain beautifully a lot of things. So how do you diagnose it's a type 1 diabetes? Age. Anti-GAD antibodies, BMI, ketonuria, nocturia. Who is going to answer me the question? I told you this is not the right answer. Nocturia. Nocturia can happen even in people taking SGLT2 inhibitors and having a good diabetes control. Right? It's not. It's not. It's not. The answer is D. Ketonuria. Okay, the answer is D ketonuria. I'll tell you, this anti GAD antibodies are there, right? It can be present in some people with type 2 diabetes mellitus also. Just the presence of anti GAD antibodies does not make one person as a insulin uh, type 1 diabetic, diabetes mellitus. BMI can be normal in both sides. Some diabetes are genetic. I have seen people who are actually thin and, and he's a diabetic. And I have also seen people who are morbidly obese. And their blood sugars are always in around 90 and 100. Nakshuri is not the answer. Age is not the answer. Just now I told you. The answer is ketonuria. Because whenever you find ketonuria, there is a lack of insulin. Where ketone bodies comes from? Ketone bodies comes from fat. What insulin does? Insulin stores the fat. When there is no insulin, fat breaks, ketone comes. Simple as that. Quickly I am telling. Okay. 26 year old woman here we are seeing. She is presenting to the clinic with Nausea, vomiting, tiredness, amenorrhea. She is 26 year old woman. She is having nausea, vomiting, tiredness, amenorrhea. She has no past medical history of note. She takes no regular medication. She has a regular sexual partner. Let us see what they are asking. See here, her prolactin levels are very high. Her estradiols are even very high. All right. 
follicle stimulating hormone is suppressed which of the following is likely diagnosis pregnancy microprolactinoma pituitary adenoma ovarian carcinoma premature ovarian failure go back to the question 26 year old lady amenorrhea nausea vomiting tiredness bmi 26 nausea vomiting tiredness amenorrhea what you will think of doctors with high prolactin and a very high estradiol obviously it is pregnancy most females here should be able to answer done right nothing to think beyond this because anything else won't produce with nausea vomiting tiredness and weight gain nothing else it's pregnancy all right again a 26 year old man is here he is referred to the clinic for the management of hypertension his gp has measured successive very high blood pressures with the latest is 178 his bp is high on examination you notice a number of cafeolar spots pedunculated lesion suggestive of neurofibromatosis okay now they are giving some values and all the values are normal surprisingly you suspect he may have a pheochromocytoma which of the following is the initial investigation of choice i had mentioned in my lecture if you had listened to the lecture you will give the answer to me without hesitant hesitancy is it 24 hour urinary catecholamines you will see or you will do a ct abdomen you will do a mibg scan or you will do an ultrasound abdomen or you will do selective venous sampling what you will do 24 hours urinary catecholamines what they had asked initial investigation of choice the initial investigation of choice is 24 hour urine urinary catecholamines next question 38 year old woman presents with flu like illness tenderness over the neck for the past 2 to 3 weeks she has no other past history bp is high anterior neck tenderness followed by flu like illness increased t4 and suppressed tsh there is only one diagnosis not every thyroid disorder follows a viral illness there is only one thyroid disorder what is it So what is the diagnosis there is not a lot of diagnosis is here what is the diagnosis there is not a lot of diagnosis here right what is the diagnosis straight away it's decurrent thyroiditis okay so decurrent thyroiditis no need to think too much on this thing 73 year old woman presents to the clinic with increasing lethargy and low mood is a lethargy is increasing she is having low mood she complains of increasing bony pains and has an episode of renal stone bone pain stone high bp okay you know what is abnormal here calcium is high parathyroid hormones are low normal close to high sorry not low normal high normal phosphate levels are low oh, what is the diagnosis you don't even need the history seeing this three values you should be able to tell there is hypercalcemia there is pain groan moan all these things the answer is primary hyperparathyroidism i told you how secondary presence secondary what level will be low here calcium level will be low here how tertiary present tertiary everything is elevated everything is elevated all right next question 58 year old man is presenting to you with tiredness lethargy his main complaint is of erectile dysfunction which is leading to relationship difficulties with his girlfriend he has no past medical history of no bp is 144 by 82 pulse is 76 okay tiredness lethargy erectile dysfunction let's see the biochemistry okay so what is happening here which is abnormal if you go around see fasting 
testosterone is low fsh is low lh is low tsh is fine prolactin is higher end of the normal limit prostate specific antigen is normal so first what is the diagnosis first know what is happening to this guy erectile dysfunction guy he is with tiredness and lethargy he is giving you this slip you are seeing this you are seeing high fasting blood glucose low testosterone low fsh and low lh what you will think of <coughs> i'm sorry what you will think of what do you think is happening with this gentleman come on anybody try and tell something any idea plain filter then at 58 years he has no past medical history what do you give here you give alprostadil you give testosterone you give metformin you give cabergolin you give sildenafil they are asking for most appropriate treatment for erectile dysfunction and loss of libido it's testosterone it's testosterone <laughs> okay it is testosterone why it is testosterone when the testosterone is low how you will give anything else and improve see sildenafil or tadalafil you can give for erectile dysfunction okay along with that in uk they will call us senna therapy sexual counseling and sexual therapy will be that this will work only when the testosterone is there right if testosterone is not there then how it will work just imagine you, your car fuel is completely out you don't have petrol or diesel in the car okay so you think okay there is something wrong with the engine so i will replace the engine from some ferrari or something and i will keep and i will see it rising up and going and highing up it's not going to work out when there is no petrol or diesel it won't run it will be done flat right so the same thing what is happening here this guy is having erectile dysfunction see the biochemistry here he is having erectile dysfunction he is having tiredness and lethargy what is happening here he has some fasting blood glucose abnormality it's okay at this age group it can happen but his testosterone is low fsh and lh is low along <clears throat> because of that it's slightly high normal prolactin so when the testosterone itself is low you have to first give the testosterone then only all the sildenafil and tadalafil will work if the testosterone itself is not there giving sildenafil or tadalafil nothing is going to happen okay nothing is going to happen this is a hypogonadotrophic hypogonadism could be due to pituitary why it is due to pituitary is see the prolactin levels that is also low see the thyroid stimulate the, sorry see the lh and fsh levels that is also low where all this hormone comes from all these hormones are coming from pituitary so all the hormones that is coming from the pituitary all those hormones are low so where you localize the lesion pituitary am i right or wrong yes you are going to localize the lesion to pituitary so all the hormones of the pituitary is flat out only thing you have to do is replace the hormones so first hormone to be replaced is testosterone because they they asked clearly most appropriate treatment for erectile dysfunction and libido okay some people may have a libido they will have a thing to go ahead and <clears throat> have sexual intercourse they will have all burning passion inside them but they will have erectile dysfunction some people won't have erectile dysfunction there will be lack of libido they will be just sitting they won't have any issues with the erectile dysfunction both needs different treatment but together if the testosterone is low always replace i told you like how you replace the fuel first before replacing the engine all right next 49 year old man presents to the clinic with excessive sweating found to have elevated gh and igf1 all right acromegaly is diagnosed what is the most common cause of excessive sweating in acromegaly who is going to tell me the answer is straight forward i had thought 
sweat gland hyperplasia because acromegaly is a megaly of everything okay acromegaly is a megaly of everything including your sweat glands sweat gland becomes hyperplastic as a result there will be excessive sweating in case of a acromegaly next case 61 year old obese man with history of type 2 diabetes he comes to the clinic for review he is on 2 gram of metformin per day okay he is continued to gain weight hba1c is elevated as 8.5 person on examination is bmi is 32 uh, <clears throat> trial of exenatide is planned what is the mode of action of exenatide we have seen exenatide mode of action is glp1 agonism <clears throat> next question 27 year old woman is coming who has suffered from type 1 diabetes for 23 years and more recently with celiac disease i told you the autoimmune spectrum how type 1 diabetes are related with celiac disease and many other conditions comes to the clinic for review she has problems over the past few months with increasing tiredness and lethargy she's off her food due to increasing problem with nausea on medication oral medication includes yes ramipril uh, because she's having microalbuminuria BP is 100 by 70. There are no other findings. Here, if you see, HbA1c is fairly under control. And then uh, TSH is high. Her creatinine is higher end of the normal range. Potassium is quite high. She is having nausea <clears throat> in a type 1 diabetic. Nausea with high potassium. What you will think of and fainting. Fainting can be due to orthostatic hypotension, nausea, increased potassium. Come on, tell me. Increased potassium and low sodium. Very good. You noted it down. And low sodium. What is this? What is sitting in, in this lady? What is sitting in this lady? New onset Addison's disease. Excellent. Now what you will do? <clears throat> you will start her on thyroxine, stop her ramipril, arrange a shock synactin test, check a T3, T4, or reassure, okay, everything is fine. You arrange a shock synactin test. That's it. 18 year old man comes to the diabetes clinic for review. He has multiple episodes of penile thrush and has been feeling increasingly tired over the past few months. A fasting glucose was noted to be 11.1 millimole. A number of members in the family also has diabetes. What is the most likely underlying cause? At this age, number of people in the family has diabetes. Some of them are type 2. We had already worked out the question. Now they are asking, which of the following is most likely? What is the most common mutation in Modi? 4 alpha, 1 alpha, 1 beta, or IPF1 or glucokinase. C, HNF1 alpha mutation. <clears throat> All right. Next question. 42 year old woman referred to the endocrine clinic with a prolactin level of 200. Medication include ramipril for hypertension and early stat for weight loss. She tells you that her periods have been rather heavy. She put this down to the menopause. 42 is little early to have menopause. Am I right? Yeah. And the main thing is she admits not having managed to lose any weight. Her visual field examination is normal. What is the diagnosis? They are asking the drug induced hypoprolactinemia, microprolactinoma, macroprolactinoma, hypothyroidism, non functioning pituitary adenoma. She has a increased prolactin level. Medication is just ramipril and early start. You can take it for granted. None of this medication will cause increased prolactin. She has heavy periods. Visual field is normal. Visual field is normal means you can definitely rule out macro prolactinoma. You can rule out drug induced prolactinoma. Any other drug is there? No. Then what is the most likely thing? The answer is hypothyroidism. I'll tell you why. Her prolactin level is <clears throat> just above the normal range. It's just 200. Micro prolactinoma, at least 700, 800, it will be there. Less than 2000. It's not there. Okay. And she is having some changes towards menopause, but they are typically giving a clue. She is trying to lose weight, but she cannot lose weight. So I'll tell you one more thing. 
this is not a non functioning pituitary adenoma because no visual changes nothing is there okay this is not a microprolactinoma there is it's not drug induced because there is no culprit drugs are here there are culprit drugs are here then you can tell it is drug induced when there are no culprit drugs we cannot tell it's a drug induced hypothyroidism in itself can increase prolactin slightly all right so the answer is hypothyroidism because she is also trying to lose weight she is not able to typically you know hypothyroidism is associated with weight gain 21 year old woman is reviewed on the ward some 36 hours after admission to with dka she is well with residual acidosis what is the molecules is mostly like most likely to be responsible they are asking in ketones which ketone circulates for a longer time in the blood all right which ketone circulates for a longer time in the blood that's why they are asking which of the molecule is responsible that her ketone is have a showing some residual acidosis which acetaldehyde acetone beta hydroxybutyrate formaldehyde and malic acid the answer is beta hydroxybutyrate it is try to linger causing mild acidosis even after 36 hours so no need to treat aggressively people who had controlled and treated dka they will know sorry 35 year old man is diagnosed with pheochromocytoma he has been admitted in the emergency department with severe headaches worsening blood pressure blood pressure is around 185 is on ramipril and creatinine is slightly up is listed for surgery what's the most appropriate intervention in respect to achieving blood pressure control this is a classical thing you would have learned in mbbs pharmacology itself am i right so in a patient with pheochromocytoma before posting to surgery what drug you will give which receptor you will block before blocking the other receptor which receptor you will block and among this which drug you prefer you don't prefer every drug there is one particular alpha blocker is preferred over the other alpha blocker for some reason i had explained that in clinical pharmacology why and which drug the answer is e phenoxybenzamine okay phenoxybenzamine i had explained in clinical pharmacology lecture why it is preferred over the other drugs okay you have to do the alpha blockade before beta blockade otherwise you will get unopposed action all right next question 42 year old man referred to endocrine because of a 0.9 centimeter pituitary tumor in discovered on ct scanning after he fell unconscious pituitary function visual testing is normal you have planned to review in 12 months time which of the following is most likely occurrence no change in condition bitemporal hemianopia developmental acromegaly pituitary apoplexy developmental symptomatic hyperprolactinemia anemia which of the following is most likely to occur this they are asking you to speculate the answer is no change because this is <clears throat> this time of tumors which you find incidentally is what you call as incidentaloma nobody took the scan ct scan of him because he is having some pituitary abnormality doctors took the pt ct scan for what reason because he fell down to rule out trauma is he having any hemorrhage for that they took so they are finding a pituitary tumor but entire pituitary function and visual field is normal then why to treat him there is won't be any change in condition it's an incidental loma okay the uh, chance of it developing into something else is minimal all right next question 32 year old woman attends diabetic clinic for review she has type 1 diabetes diagnosed 24 years ago currently managed on basal bolus insulin other medication include ramipril she has recently undergone bilateral laser therapy for diabetic retinopathy she drinks alcohol occasionally smokes 10 cigarettes per day on examination bp is 125 there is minor sensory loss affecting both the feet she was unable to feel a small cut on the sole of her foot neuropathy is set in already because she is already smoking glycated hemoglobin is 52 ldl is 2.5 which of the following is the most next step so what is happening type 1 diabetic lady retinopathy sets in neuropathy sets in okay what you will do 
you will add a gaba pentin for neuropathy you will increase the acting long acting insulin you will start aspirin you will advise her to stop smoking you will transfer her to insulin pump see here her hba1c is not tremendously worst okay so i don't think in a practical point of view adding up more insulin or pumping her with more insulin and giving insulin pump is going to do anything will taking an aspirin will help it may have some preventive action but not much gabapentin will do what what they are asking most important next step gabapentin will do what gabapentin may relieve her pain but gabapentin is not going to do anything wrong in the long run the best thing is stop smoking okay it reduces the progression of nephropathy next thing 58 year old taxi driver comes to diabetic clinic for review he has suffered from type 2 diabetes mellitus for the past 6 years for which he currently takes metformin 1 gram bd he admits difficulty exercising because of his job and transgressions with his diet which lead to increase in weight his bmi is 34 type 2 diabetic 34 bmi increased weight metformin has been given no use see here what are the other findings hba1c is at 8.1 percent next drug what you will give is the question what you will give you will give a glycoside you will give a insulin you will give a pioglitazone you will give acarbose or you will give empagliflozin you will give a glycoside in a patient with bmi 34 you will give an empagliflozin what is the problem here the problem is obesity glycoside sulfonylurea increases weight insulin increases weight pioglitazone h2o plus na plus intern retention increases weight so three drugs are out acarbose is what acarbose megalitel and all intestinal glucose absorption it will decrease it won't it has some bloating sensation it will give in some patients so only drug you can give here in a right way is empagliflozin because empagliflozin can help in at least moderate 10% weight loss in the long run so that is the only drug you should be giving okay next question 48 year old alcoholic is here presenting to the endocrine clinic with the loss of libido erectile dysfunction and breast tenderness on examination is bp is 110 by 70 pulse is 70 you confirm gynecomastia signs of chronic liver disease bmi is 30 elevated estradiol and liver function test is consistent with cirrhosis which of the following is a direct precursor for estradiol that's what they are asking they are asking you biochemistry from where estradiol comes from who is good in biochemistry here is it testosterone dihydrotestosterone cortisol progesterone estriol come on it's testosterone okay testosterone i'm sorry converting to estrogen is called aromatization we have drugs to block this they are called aromatase inhibitor what are the drugs that are called aromatase inhibitor anyone know type the drugs name okay next 26 year old aromatase inhibitors name some drugs that comes under the category that's the question i had asked doctor yeah 26 year old woman who is 20 weeks pregnant in her first with her first child she presents to the emergency department with an episode of severe hypoglycemia while shopping in the local supermarket the third episode over the past two weeks she admits increasing nausea difficulty maintaining her weight her type 1 diabetes has previously been controlled using an insulin pump her most recent hbmc 6.3 pulse is 95 glucose is 9.1 dextrose is administered by crew yes you all of you got right got it right okay so her potassium is high sodium is low which of the following is most likely cause of her worsening glucose control in a type 1 diabetic patient with decreased sodium increased potassium what is developing in her and what is she is telling <coughs> what is she is telling type 1 diabetes decrease sodium increase potassium and frequent hypoglycemia
in nephropathy you won't get decreased sodium and increased potassium doctor what is setting in which disease present with decreased sodium and increased potassium we have seen i have told you the disease is your adrenal insufficiency or addisons this is an autoimmune spectrum it's not the nephropathy okay 21 year old if it is a nephropathy what you will find increasing creatinine all right 21 year old man presents to ed with abdominal pain profuse vomiting his partner is concerned that he has become increasingly drowsy over the past 12 hours his bp is 100 pulse 95 respiratory rate 30 abdomen is soft but diffusely tender see the investigation high potassium low normal sodium bicarbonate is low creatinine slightly high that could be due to dehydration and acidosis with increased glucose glucose levels of 38 in a 28 21 year old man abdominal pain vomiting with a massive amount of glucose with acidosis low bicarbonate increased potassium decrease in decrease to normal sodium what do you think is happening here what do you think is happening here anyone else wants to answer as well this is a diabetic ketoacidosis all the features are seen increased blood glucose yes low ph acidosis low bicarbonate yes potassium is high why because lack of insulin okay whenever decrease insulin is lack potassium will go up this is a diabetic ketoacidosis what is the next step is an iv normal saline all right you have to give iv normal saline next question 41 year old man comes to the emergency department with worsening symptoms of thirst polyuria and weight loss he has been diagnosed by this gp with type 2 diabetes having presented with recurrent penile candida infection prescribed glycoside 80 mg bd he drinks one bottle of wine per week somebody with diabetes glycoside has been given he drinks one bottle of wine per week let us see the further things urinary ketones are 2 plus hba1c is 10 what else is abnormal here tsh is slightly high potassium is okay sodium is okay what is the likely diagnosis is a type 1a diabetes type 2 diabetes lateral autoimmune diabetes of the adulthood modi pancreatitis related diabetes could it be pancreatitis related diabetes unlikely i mean right because he is just drinking one bottle of wine could it be type 1a or type 2 type 2 diabetes no type 2 diabetes typically won't present with urinary ketones that is is it modi modi also doesn't present like that he is a 41 year old guy modi won't present like that modi will present at 41 years what is the age group of modi mostly teen years 21 22 that is the age group of modi so it's not it's not pancreatitis related uh, diabetes there is no nothing significant of that because if you suspect like that then he should be having a, he should be in a severe alcoholic and a big time alcoholic he is drinking one bottle of wine per week the answer is c latent <clears throat> autoimmune diabetes of the adulthood this is called as lada how lada presents someone in a young age presents straight with ketonuria like the features of type 1 diabetes mellitus it's called lada next 62 year old man with obesity type 2 diabetes comes to clinic for review current therapy includes metformin ramipril amlodipine bmi of this gentleman is 36 and hba1c is 8.4 you start sitagliptin mode of action of sitagliptin we have seen it's ddp4 inhibitor next question 32 year old man presents to the clinic for review he suffered from profuse watery diarrhea over the past few months and has multiple negative stool cultures he works as a taxi driver but has been forced to go on a long term sick leave because of the problem he says diarrhea is profuse watery and does not seem to be related to food he has lost a few kilos in weight over the past two months and feels thirsty drinking copious amount of water to keep up with ga losses his bp is 105 postural drop is there 
PR reveals an empty rectum. Okay. Now this is the investigation. This investigation shows fecal fat excretion of 3.9. Okay. And bicarbonate is low. Chloride is high. Potassium is again low. Stool volume is 3.5 liter. What is the next investigation you will do? First, what is the thing we are facing? We should know that first before we jump and dive and thrive into further investigations. What is the thing we are facing? We will do a plasma VIP, 24-hour 5-hydroxyindolestic acid, D-cellulose absorption test, 24-hour catecholamines, hydrogen breath test. What you will do? Somebody is having a watery diarrhea. <clears throat> Stool cultures are negative. Okay. Watery diarrhea with negative stool cultures. Fecal fat excretion is 3.9. He is having hypobicarbonatemia. Bicarbonate is low, but chloride is high. Hypochloremic. Yes, he is. What is this? What you will do? You will check plasma VAP. This is called VAPOMA. Otherwise also known as Vermeer Morrison syndrome. Vern <coughs> Morrison <coughs> syndrome. Otherwise known as WDHA syndrome. How many of you know what is WDHA? What is WDHA syndrome? What is WDHA? Anyone knows? Anyone can type? Watery, I'll write here so that you won't forget. WDHA, watery diarrhea. Okay, then. Watery diarrhea, then <clears throat> sorry, hypokalemia, a chloridia, a chloride, a chlorhydria. This is called WDHA syndrome or Vermeer Morrison syndrome. So any patient if they are giving you a thing of like he's have, he he is having a spurious watery diarrhea goes up to the level, he passes up so much stool, he is about to go on for a shock and he is having a low potassium, high chloride and low bicarbonate, fecal fat excretion of 3.9 gram, excess fecal fat excretion, large stool volume, then you think in terms of VAPO ma. Okay, this is otherwise known as pancreatic cholera, also known as Werner Morrison syndrome or WDHA syndrome. Okay, you have to check the VAP levels. All of you got it? Yes. Next question. 42 year old woman with a history of weight loss and palpitation over the past few months is referred to the endocrinology clinic by her GP. Her thyroid stimulating hormone is suppressed at less than 0.05. The other past medical history include asthma. What they are asking, which of the following features most suggest a diagnosis of Graves disease? Goiter. Hypertension, lid lag, pre-tibial myxedema, tachycardia. Who will answer me the question? The answer is pre-tibial myxedema. Typically, you will find in graves. This is due to, again, another G called glycosaminoglycans deposition. 45-year-old woman comes to the endocrine clinic for review. She complains she has a significant change in her personal appearance. Enlargement of lower jaw, describe builder's hands. That is nothing other. Builder hands are like bigger hands. So become larger and swollen, currently on indapamide, lisinopril, everything. And then BP 155 pulse, 80 BMI 25. She has obvious soft tissue swelling of finger and mandibular enlargement. What is this? This is going for an acromegaly-like features. Am I right? Enlarged hands, enlarged jaw. All of you clear? So now the investigation. What is the best initial investigation to confirm the underlying disease? Is your IGF-1. It's the best investigation. <clears throat> Next question. 45-year-old man comes to the clinic. He is concerned because he has gained 3 stones in weight. 
for the past six months. He also has hypertension, which is poorly controlled. Despite a combination of lisinopril, amdapamide, amlodipin, nothing works. BP is still high. He is obese with abdominal striae and also he has pre-diabetes. Here is the investigation. Glucose is high. I think he would be a full-blown dioptic already. Potassium is low. What you will do next? They are asking what you will do next. So what you are facing with? What you are facing with? I told you hypertension with decreased potassium. Hypertension with pre-diabetes. But the clue here is triae. And elevated BMI. That should point to something else. What you will do here? Abdominal UST, glucose tolerance test, 24-hour urinary free cortisol, pituitary MRI, renin aldosterone ratio. You do 24-hour free urinary cortisol. You are dealing with Cushing's. Why it's not taken to con syndrome level? Because <clears throat> the obesity, abdominal striae, all this points to straight away Cushing syndrome than con syndrome. 64-year-old woman with a history of poorly controlled type 2 diabetes comes to the clinic for review. She is treated with BD mixed insulin, but is concerned about the weight gain. She is little concerned whether what will happen if her weight goes up. Wonders if she can take something along with insulin will not cause her gain weight. Other problems include ischemic heart disease, renal impairment. She has ischemic heart disease, renal impairment. She has taken a number of cardiovascular medications. BM is 33 with EAGFR is declining. So what is the next suitable agent he will add? Somebody is obese, high BMI, GFR is declining. So you have to give a drug that won't cause weight. At the same time, the drug should not harm the renal function also. So which of the drug will do that? Is your gliptins. The best drug here is going to be Linagliptin, saxagliptin or vildagliptin because many of them are weight neutral. Causes obesity, so you can't give that. Metformin won't help. Renal function is declining. Piogritazone, no, because she is already having ischemic heart disease. Exenatide won't happen at this 10 stage renal disease. GFR is just 28. 39 year old woman of South Asian origin comes to endocrine clinic. She is three months post the birth of her third child. She has suffered from gestational diabetes mellitus in the last two pregnancies. She wants to reduce about the advice of reduced where future risk of developing type 2 diabetes mellitus. Because now there are some studies clearly point out if somebody is having a gestational diabetes mellitus, they are likely to have type 2 diabetes mellitus also in the future. So what you will do here? What is the right intervention they are asking? Acarbose, diet and exercise, liraglutide, orlistat or piaglitosin. What advice you will give doctors? Somebody with a GDM in the last two pregnancies is coming and asking you, Sir, what should I do? Or ma'am, what should I do? There is only one answer, diet and exercise. You are not going to put her on any drugs now. All right, she is already in breastfeeding phase. Next question, 45-year-old nurse who works permanent night shift comes to the clinic for review. The current medications are metformin 1 gram BD, glycoside 160 milligram BD, she finds it difficult during transition time between shifts and days off. Suffers from frequent hypoglycemia. In addition to finding it's difficult, finding it weight difficult to control and a BMI increase from 29 to 31. And the medications are lamipril, amlodipine, a BP is 150 to still. Reminder of the clinical examination is unremarkable. She is not interested in injectable medication. Again, a common scenario, an obese patient with diabetes mellitus. She has been put on metformin and glycoside. She has been put on metformin and glycoside. Now you have to give one more drug. What drug you will give? HbA1c is 7.2. What is the next step? You will add liraglutide. You will change glycoside to liraglutide. Or you will change glycoside to citagliptin. Or you will reduce glycoside or you will reduce metformin. The answer is change glycoside to citagliptin. 
because glycoside is a sulfonylurea can first weight gain. 27 year old yoga teacher comes to the clinic for relief. She feels that she needs to drink 6 to 10 liters of water per day to remain hydrated and complains that she is passing up to 5 urine up to 5 times at night. Obviously, if she is going to drink 8, 9, 10 liters of water, this is what is going to happen. Examination is fairly okay. BP, pulse and BMI. Okay. Her only medication is progesterone only pill. What they are asking? See the further investigation. Sodium, potassium, bicarbonate is low normal. What is the likely diagnosis? Cranial diabetes insipidus, nephrogenic diabetes insipidus, primary polydipsia, renal tubular acidosis or SADH. Anything abnormal here? Nothing other than slight decrease in bicarbonate. Anything abnormal here? Nothing. She just wants to drink more and more water. So what could be the diagnosis here? See this lady, 27 year old yoga teacher. She has compulsive habit of drinking water. She feels she wants to drink water. She drinks water. She has no high risk history. Everything is normal. Only slight decrease in bicarbonate, which is insignificant. So what she's having? She's having cranial diabetes mellitus or nephrogenic diabetes mellitus or psychogenic renal tubular acidosis. She's having primary polydipsia. Could be psychogenic polydipsia. Right? Next question. 45 year old woman presents with significant weight gain of 4 stone over the past 18 months. She is also difficulty controlling hypertension on 3 agents. Type 2 diabetes mellitus is currently managed with metformin and problems with hirsutism and acne. Her BP is high, pulse is 75. She has frontal male pattern hair loss, bird line and acne and BMI is 35. <clears throat> there are abdominal strain. So where they are taking us, read the question well, quick and fast. Four stone, weight gain, hypertension, metformin, hair loss, acne and abdominal strain. See here, what is abnormal here? Mm, if you see here, the only abnormality is glucose. Which of the following is the most useful next step? This is kind of Cushing guide. All of you agree? <coughs> this is Cushing guide. Stria is there, hair loss is there, bird line is there, acne is there. This is Cushing guide. So what you will do here? The next step is 24 hour free, urinary free, cortisol. Right, 24 hour urinary free cortisol. Next question 27 year old woman comes to the endocrine clinic for review. She has suffered from loss of libido, vaginal dryness, breast milk, leakage, on minimal nipple stimulation over the course of the past few months. She has only one child who is two years old and says her symptoms are significantly affecting her relationship. She takes occasional medication for reflux but has no other past medical history and returned to work as a solicitor. Okay, now what they are asking about her? She has bitemporal hemianopia with prolactin of 400. What is the likely diagnosis? See here, she is having prolactinoma, but prolactin level is just 400. But she has uh, other symptoms. She is she has lost libido, vaginal dryness is there, milk leakage that is galactoria is there, bitemporal hemianopia is also there. What is the likely diagnosis? Drug induced, is there any drug here? Is she taking any drug here? So it's not. Is it a hypothyroidism? Will hypothyroidism produce bitemporal hemianopia? No. Will microprolactinoma produce bitemporal hemianopia? Hypothyroidism can cause increase in prolactin. What is shown here? Bitemporal hemianopia. She can't see both the sides. She can't see both the sides. Will hypothyroidism cause that? Definitely not. Drug induced, there was no significantly increase in drug. Will a microprolactinoma cause that? No. You are left with two options. Macroprolactinoma, non-functioning adenoma. A macroprolactinoma, will it have a prolactin level of 400 or more? I have told in the lecture. What will be the level of prolactin in case of a macroprolactinoma? I had told. So what is this? This is a non-functioning pituitary adenoma. Alright, non-functioning pituitary adenoma. Okay. Next question. 16-year-old male comes to endocrinology clinic for review. He is as tall as his peers, but his parents concerned because he does not appear to have entered puberty. 
lack of sense of smell has been noted. This is more than enough. Now tell me what is the diagnosis? Somebody not entered puberty, lack of sense of smell is noted. The answer is your good old Kalman syndrome. Next question. 17 year old woman comes to endocrine clinic for review. She had three or four periods at the age of 13 and was started on oral contraceptive pill because of severe menstrual pain and heavy bleeding. She is worried. She had no periods for the past nine months. She stopped the OCPs some six months early. There is no past medical history of note. Examination reveals BP of 105 and pulse of 62, BMI is 17. She has normal breast development, secondary sexual hair, but is not hirsute. In her spare time, she is a gymnast. Ah, they back to the same thing. Yesterday all is 25, FSH is 6, TSH is 0.7. What is the likely diagnosis? <clears throat> is there anything I need to tell? How many times we are doing the thing? Same question. This is answer D, hypothalamin. That is secondary amenorrhea due to low body weight. Sometimes they may not give the same words which we are expecting. Hypothalamic amenorrhea, they, you may not get it. But they would have given, they will definitely give something close to that. Using that, you should be able to tell what is this. Am I right? These are the causes of secondary amenorrhea. Some of the things. Now we'll go to the next question. 19 year old woman comes to the clinic for review. She complains of problems with facial and upper chest hair and severe acne. She only has a menstrual period approximately every three to four months. And these do occur and they are heavy. She takes no regular medication. BP is 152, pulse is 78 and regular. Her abdomen is soft, non-tender. BMI is elevated at 31. She has facial hair, hair over her upper body, acne affecting her face and upper chest. These are the investigations. Testosterone is 5.1. LHFSH ratio is 2.2. Blood glucose is slightly increased. Nothing significant. What is happening? 19 year old lady with facial and upper chest hair. What is this? Elevated BMI. Acne. So, which of the following is the most appropriate initial intervention? What is the most appropriate initial intervention? Lot of women doctors are here. You should be able to tell. You would have got patients with PCOS. What is the first drug you will write? <clears throat> what is the very first drug you will write here in case of a PCOS? What is the very first drug? A case of PCOS, you didn't see the question. Increased hair growth, acne, elevated BMI. What is the next drug? Of course, it's C. Metformin is a supportive drug. Remember, metformin is a supportive drug. Okay. So, cosiprindiol, ciprotiron acetate with ethanyl estradiol is the drug you have to start. Alright? It particularly helps in reducing androgenic acne. A lot of things. Okay. Now, 63-year-old woman who is treated with long-term hemodialysis for renal failure due to type 1 diabetes mellitus comes to the clinic for review. She complains of persistent tiredness, lethargy, generalized body aches and pains. She also has extreme thirst, which means very hard for her to stick to limit fluid intake limit. She takes number of medications, including vitamin D, calcium supplements, phosphate binder. She's pale. She's thin. BMA is 21. BP is 155 by 85. What are the problems here? She is in a long-term hemodialysis. So long-term somebody is in hemodialysis. There is something called hemodialysis related complications. All these complications will set in in those patients. So, all the complications are being set in in this lady. She also complains of persistent tiredness, lethargy, generalized body aches. Everything is started. Alright. Calcium supplement she is taking. Vitamin D supplement she is taking. Now, what is happening here? Calcium is high. Phosphate is high. PTH is high. 
I told you what is it? Increase calcium, increase phosphate, increase PTH is. Come on, don't disappoint me. It's primary. Oh no, doctor, no. It's not primary. This is your tertiary hyperparathyroidism. Okay? Tertiary hyperparathyroidism. 24-year-old woman presents to the endocrinology clinic here for review. She has a goiter. She has palpitation. She has weight loss. She has recently developed some blurring of vision. Her TSH is suppressed. On examination, BP is 132 by 82. Pulse is regular 90 beats per minute. She has fine tremor, bilateral proptosis. So, this is a full-blown Graves' disease. They are asking which of the following will worsen the Graves' disease. Carbimazole, potassium perchlorate, prednisolone, propronolol, radioiodine. Come on. Quick. Which will worsen Graves' disease? Excellent. Yes, radioiodine. Next question. 51-year-old woman comes to the endocrine clinic for review. She has not had a menstrual period for six months. And she is suffering from episodes of facial flushing to UTI over the past few months. And she has pain on intercourse. She has no past medical history of note. Her BP is 115 by 83. With pulse of 65 beats per minute, BMI is 22. Her FSH is measured with more than 40. She is asking about hormone replacement therapy. Now, what they are asking is not the diagnosis. Which of the following is the main indication for hormone replacement therapy? Why you will give hormone replacement therapy? Reduction of breast cancer? Or will you give to reduce ischemic stroke? Or will you give to reduce his menopausal symptoms? Or will you give to reduce ovarian cancer? Or will you do give to reduce the incidence of VTE, venous thromboembolism? Why? Anybody? Tell me why. The answer is C, to reduce menopausal symptoms. This is the primary indication. All right? That's the primary indication. Now, a 34-year-old woman who is 22 weeks pregnant comes to emergency department complaining of increasingly severe tiredness, lethargy, and cold intolerance, where it is leading to hypothyroidism. A general practitioner did some blood test. There is no past medical history of blood. She has two other healthy children. On examination, her BP is 105. Pulse is 68. Small, smooth goiter. Is there? Investigation shows TSH 3.5. Okay. What is the next step? In a pregnant lady, okay, pregnant lady with hypothyroid symptoms. What are the things here? Carefully read a pregnant woman with hypothyroid symptoms. She is having tiredness, lethargy, cold intolerance, all these things. She is also having a smooth goiter. Now, her TSH levels are slightly high, indicating mild hypothyroidism. So, what you will do? Will you recheck thyroid hormones in six weeks' time? Which trimester she is? 22 weeks. Will you reassure and discharge? Will you check free thyroxine? Will you start thyroxine? Or you will do ultrasound of the thyroid? What you will do? Check free thyroxine. Okay. Check free thyroxine. Always in pregnancy, remember. <clears throat> okay. Always in pregnancy, remember. Beta HCG will be there. This will alter your TSH level. So just by TSH level, you don't treat anyone. Write it down. Just with the TSH level in pregnancy, you are not going to treat anyone for hypothyroidism. It doesn't matter what symptoms patients will tell. Because pregnancy is a complex state. Myriad of symptoms patients will describe. I'm having this, I'm having that, I'm having this, I'm having that. Plenty of symptoms they will describe. You cannot go ahead and treat all the symptoms of a pregnant woman. You have to have a biological proof, biochemical proof. TSH will typically increase, but free T3, free T4 is more important. Without that value, do not treat. 
please in practical life for the best interest of the question don't do that all right next question come on let's go 50 year old woman has been diagnosed by her gp some six months earlier as having some type 2 diabetes comes to endocrine clinic for review over the past few months she has been begun to suffer increasing problems of sweating early morning sleepiness bilateral pins and needles in both hands her bp is high her bp is high pulse is 78 she has multiple skin tags over both the axilla greasy skin and facial acne somebody asked doctor don't you feel tired yeah i got used to this during residency sometimes we will be made to work without sleep for one whole night 24 hours duty will be there the next day 36th hour some professor will call hey tomorrow you are going to give a presentation on glomerulonephritis and that's it you have to go straight to library, gulp some cups of coffee, go ahead. That's how life is. Once you get into acute medicine or fields like stroke medicine, things will be different. But you will start enjoying it at one point of time. And what happens is after that point of time, even if someone, you get a vacation or anything, you won't be able to sleep. You will more feel like going and doing something. But gradually that strength is waning out of me. So now what is the investigation? High prolactin. Low TSH, increased glucose. What could be this? Someone with a type 2 diabetes, early morning sleepiness, multiple skin tags in axilla, greasy skin, facial acne, BMI 27, high prolactin, low TSH, increased glucose. What you will do? What you are suspecting first? Most initial investigation. What is the diagnosis here? I will be so impressed if somebody is going to tell me the diagnosis. The question is right in front of your screen. Pheochromocytoma. Doctor, why you will have early morning sleepiness in pheochromocytoma? Do you have multiple skin packs in pheochromocytoma? Do you have acne and greasy skin in pheochromocytoma? Come on. <clears throat> Any idea? Bilateral pins and needles. Should I write what are the problems happening here? What will you do? Answer is IGF-1. I will tell you why. Okay, this question I will little explain so that you will understand. Okay, I'll first little explain this question. Then we will go to the option. Then I will tell you. What are the problems here? Type 2 diabetes mellitus. Then increasing problems with sweating. Increasing problems with sweating. Be very, very careful. Okay. Be very careful in answering. Increasing problems with sweating. This is due to sweat gland. Hyperplasia. Am I right? Yes. Early morning sleepiness is due to what? Obstructive sleep apnea syndrome. Pins and needles could be due to carpal tunnel syndrome and peripheral neuropathy. Skin tags are a part of acromegaly. Acne is a part of acromegaly. Diabetes mellitus again it can occur. Okay. So combine all this thing together. Acromegaly, prolactin, yes it can. So do IGF-1 first rule out the tumor. Then do anything else. Now next question. 21 year old man presents to diabetes clinic. He visited the GP for recurrent balanitis and was found to have glycosuria. No other symptoms is there. He is holding out his regular work as a builder. His father and one aunt and one uncle have type 2 diabetes for more than 20 years. They have good glycemic control and suffered no complications of diabetes. BP is 122 by 82, pulse 70, BMI 22. Acromegaly people typically have skin tags for various reasons. Okay. For various reasons. I'll tell you. First, can anyone tell what is the diagnosis? See here, HbA1c is modest, fasting glucose is high. 
The diagnosis is MODY 2, 3, 5, pre-diabetes type 1. They're asking which is the most common. MODY 2. Here it's MODY 2. Okay. Why is MODY 2 will have normal baseline blood glucose, that is HbA1c, right? Here, skin tags in acromegaly can be due to two things, doctor. Insulin-like growth factor can cause growth spread. Another thing is insulin resistance and diabetes mellitus is a part of acromegaly. Have you seen diabetic people? They are the ones who are likely to develop more and more skin tag. Insulin resistance itself can lead to development of skin tag. This is a MODI, there is no doubt. This is a MODI, but MODI 2 because of normal baseline glucose. Because the mutation here will be in glucokinase in MODI 2, which will have normal baseline glucose. All right. Next question 21 year old student nurse is admitted to the emergency department. Here we go again nurse. Hypoglycemia. She was providing end of life care to some supervisor. Blood glucose is low, finger prick, and I responded to IV dextrose, third collapse in the last four months. No history of diabetes in her family, only medication is combined OCP. On review in the emergency department, her BP is 110 by 82. She is sweating tremulous, blood glucose is recovered. How do you confirm? How do you confirm? How do you confirm the underlying diagnosis? You do insulin, glucose and C-peptide at the time of the attack. And after that, we go for a 72-hour test. Now, 34-year-old alcoholic man is there. He has been admitted to the intensive therapy unit after having been found collapsed in the street. Initial CT scan excluded any intracranial lesion. On admission, he had left basal pneumonia, confirmed chest X-ray and confirmed on chest X-ray, sodium concentration is low. He is now conscious, extubated, able to communicate, blinking. He appears to be unable to move or speak. On examination, he has quadriparesis, bilateral extensive of plantar. His eye movements appears to be normal. Okay. What diagnosis do you consider before when you are planning to investigate the patient? Now, what has happened here? What has happened here? <clears throat> What has happened? What is the syndrome called first? Somebody with a sodium, low sodium, ICU, he is having a pneumonia and suddenly he developed a quadriparesis. Listen, doctor, very carefully. He won't develop quadriparesis in SIADH. Only eye movement are seen. Quadriparesis. The underlying diagnosis I am asking. SADH could have been there. Neuro. Little neuro. Think. Somebody with low sodium. Suddenly nurses bleeping. He developed quadriparesis. It's not lateral sclerosis or anything. Only Sir, eye movement are seen. I had showed you the video and taught you in the neurology section. I showed you the video and taught you in the neurology section of the actual patient video. One guy with nasogastric tube, one of a doctor known to me, he just moved his eyes up and down. Only up and down eye movement is there. This is called locked in syndrome. This is due to what? Central pontine myelinosis. What has happened here? This guy has low sodium. Somebody would have tried to do what? Aggressive sodium correction. Or rapid sodium correction. All the way lead to CPM. Go for locked in syndrome. This will give to locked in syndrome. <laughs> this question, after this question, we will take a break for 15 minutes and again we will start. Okay. Again we will start and we can continue for like uh, another <clears throat> one hour at least. Okay. Then I will leave you for the day. 24-year-old woman presents with weight loss is found to be biochemically hyperthyroid. She started on carbimazole, but after two weeks of two weeks, describes progressive visual blurring. Her corrected visual acuities are 6 by 12. She has impairment of color vision, evidence of bilateral proptosis, pupillary reactions are normal. These symptoms are likely to due to what? Carbimazole, 
hyperthyroid visual blurring process adverse drug reaction embolic phenomenon infiltration of the optic nerve optic atrophy optic nerve compression why this symptoms develop in her right. that is the question what is your answer for this what is the reason for development of her symptom the answer is optic nerve compression why you have to think a lot okay we you have to think a lot what happens in thyroid ophthalmopathy what happens in thyroid ophthalmopathy see this the eyeball this is eye socket in thyroid ophthalmopathy gag what is gag glycosaminoglycans and all this will infiltrate here and it will compress the optic nerve that is running this is the optic nerve this will get compressed as a result of this optic nerve compression okay optic nerve compression this will lead to all the symptoms along with this infiltration what will happen happen is there will be swelling of the muscles of extraocular movement all the extraocular muscles will swell up the muscles will become big as a result of the compression there will be all the symptoms okay result of the compression compression is due to all the three things okay all the three things swelling of extraocular muscles orbital fat pad edema plus along with that glycosaminoglycans also plays a role there is a clear proof for that 42 year old man presents with headache and blurred vision for a few weeks investigation shows serum prolactin of 21500 this is the last question we will take a bigger break no problem on further questioning he admits loss of interest in sexual intercourse over the past few months general feelings of lethargy is seen ct shows a large pituitary mass encroaching on the optic chiasm with evidence of midline shift i don't need to tell a lot a large mass compression midline shift what you will do what you will do pituitary tumor prolactinoma macroprolactinoma large mass compressing causing midline shift what you will do you start dopamine antagonist and go for surgery what's a midline shift is the brain when the tumor is so big it shifts the entire thing to the other area shifts the midline so you have to go for a surgery by starting dopamine antagonist and review in four weeks with respect to proceeding neurosurgical referral that is for a surgery okay let's take a break here we can have <clears throat> 20 minutes break and uh, 20 minutes break we have done around uh, i'll just calculate and tell you we have done around um, we have so far covered around 180 questions 170 180 questions okay i will try to finish the past test or past medicine one section we will cover what we will do is we will take a break we will come back and we can discuss for another hour okay another hour little faster we will discuss and then we will call it a day we will take a break then tomorrow we can start again and we will finish the rest tomorrow maybe we can start 30 minutes earlier it will be easy we'll take a 20 minutes break good long break 20 minutes go ahead refresh yourself and come back once we come back we will start all right take your rest bye bye
Nishama. Lika. Nisham. Tra c'è dopo la dacci con l'aveva andata a sfruttare lì.
Hello, doctors. I am back. How many of you are here? I hope I didn't take much time. And I'm back on time. How many of you guys are here? You can wait for a couple of more people to come. Not an issue. Yeah, hello, doctor. Hello, hello. <clears throat> we shall wait for another two minutes, then we can start. <clears throat> Some of my junior colleagues have uh, PACES examination within a week. <clears throat> so just now, those gang called me and they were like, Please teach me some things, sir. Like we want to do some station, clinical consultation stations with you. <clears throat> Said I'm on a lecture, then I'll be continuing shortly <clears throat> after it finishes. So after this, I'll be going for another two hours lecture for the students. Let's wait for another minute or two. Yeah. Uh, if you don't have experience, you, yeah, obviously, doctor. Paces, I would tell you, like, paces is all about, like, a lot of things comes into things. Your experience matters. Then how many cases you have seen? How you have seen? Because I have seen people uh, going around seeing 300, 400 cases, but they see on their own. The very first time I made that, that I made the mistake. What I did is like, after I coming back from the work, I just go randomly into hospitals and then like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I just started thinking of what I'm doing is right. <clears throat> then I got into, I plunked. The second attempt I cleared. So what I learned is there are a lot of things that can go against you. So well, the best way to prepare for paces is in my paces classes, I always used to tell. First is practice. Practice, 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 practice everything in a level that everything should be in a reflex level. Today, trust me, even if you just wake me up at 3 a.m. at night and ask me to go and examine a patient with uh, joint pain, I know what exactly I has to do, I will do and come. So do my mentors. That comes in a reflex level because of practice. There is nothing like inherent knowledge or something brilliance. Nothing is that practice. Then the other thing is like, apart from practice, patients. The one who spend maximum time with the patients are the most likely to clear station 1 and 3, very specifically. And then... Another thing is a paces mentor. That also depends. You should have a mentor. You should be under trained by someone who has a good knowledge and who knows how to approach the exam. So that is <clears throat> another thing. And uh, other thing, yeah. So you have to do that and you have to know the guidelines. This is the things you need to know to pass the paces in one attempt. Some people get lucky pass in the first attempt. Some people second attempt. Some people third. So this happens in people's life when it comes to paces examinations, an unpredictable exam. Anything can happen. So it's nothing to do with your experience. It's all about how much you practice. I would suggest anyone who wants to appear for paces, one year of practice at least it's needed. At least they should attend, uh, uh, <clears throat> at least one year of experience they should need for paces. And they should attend at least three different paces courses. So, if you don't have experience, you have to gain experience. That's the thing. See, part 1 and 2, you can sit at the comfort of your home and you can pass part 1 and part 2 and go. That's not a big deal. You can just sit at the comfort of your home and you can clear part 1 and part 2. Anyone can do that. I can do that. You can do that. For paces, the best thing I would suggest, take an year gap. If they can find, let them find some kind of, you know, part-time job and get into clinical attachment or observership or specialty training, anything into special training, not specialty training, special training in any government campuses. Start seeing cases. See at least four to five patients a day and do the paces sequence, identify the sign, try to present the case. That's more than enough. 
for clinical consultation theory part and communication there are a lot of things you can do online rest of the things you have to do directly if you are brilliant enough eight months if you think you need some more hard work 12 to 15 months 15 months is too max that is for people who don't have any clinical knowledge otherwise i can guarantee one year is maximum more than enough and seat finding there are tricks if you are going to if you are from india if you are going to keep on applying in indian centers you can get only through luck they put lottery that is the worst shameful thing they are doing in rcp <clears throat> okay putting lottery and giving seats they allot around 25 percent of the seats based on lottery then 75 percent of the seats are based on certain criteria 25 goes in lottery 25 goes in people who are unreputed uk based training like imt parallel imt training program those trainees get the chance for 25 percent so the remaining 50 percent of the seats are exactly filled by people who are at the close of their expiry date okay so either you should get luck with lottery or you should be in an appropriate training program where the training program itself will fetch your recommendation directly and get to the uh, slot you want or you should wait to avoid this to bypass this there are certain techniques you can do the very first technique you can do is when you are applying for your local center simultaneously keep applying for uk centers local centers asian centers especially does not have any kind of waiting list Whereas UK centers, if you keep applying once, twice, thrice, they have waiting list. This waiting list, they will keep noting. Okay, he applied twice, thrice. Now on the fourth attempt, if you apply in your local center, you will get it. This is one good trick. Hardly few people knows this. Okay. Another trick is when you don't find seat at the third attempt, please write to RCP. That I am so and so. This exam is so important. This is my bread and butter. This is not some honorary batch for me. Rather, this is a bread and butter exam for me. If I don't give this exam, I will be in trouble. Something like that in a sympathetic manner you ask. Second thing, they will give. Okay. Third thing, if it is not working out, you have to try in other countries. Okay. Try in other countries like Bangladesh is going to open a center. I think they open. I think they open. Like that you try. You will definitely get it in one of the three waves. People who don't know these three things, what they do is they keep applying, keep getting frustrated all their life. That's not how it is done. There are a lot of loopholes. If you use that, you will do. Paces examination, 8 to 12 months. <clears throat> you do the hard work, you will pass and you will come out. That's what I uh, think. Because whatever theory we teach, we teach for part 1, part 2 and paces together. Because we show patient videos for part 1 people itself and teach. So, we form the basics like that so that for the paces, they can just straight away go ahead and start getting trained and they will find. Our paces classes are going to start soon in four months. And in four months max. Because I wanted to take patient videos. I got ample of it. I need some more cases. Once I'm done with some muscle dystrophies and then some myotonic dystrophy stuff and we'll be starting our paces class. Both the live classes and as well as with the real patient. So, that's it. All right. Let's go to the, no problem, doctor. Let's go to the next thing. 20-year-old male develops seizures. Examination reveals short stature, round face, shortening of the metacarpal and metatarsal bones. CT demonstrate bilateral basal ganglia calcification. What is your diagnosis? Short stature, round face. CT demonstrate bilateral basal ganglia calcification. Hypoparathyroidism, juvenile myoclonic epilepsy, mitochondrial cytopathy, pseudo-hypoparathyroidism, tuberous sclerosis. And uh, it is there, I think the video is there in my core concept lecture. There is a patient with pseudo-hypoparathyroidism, a uh, young boy. A young boy. Okay, a young boy is there. It's a pseudo-hypoparathyroidism. Alright, it's a pseudo-hypoparathyroidism. Typically... They call uh, lemon in match stick like that. Round face, short stature will be there and metacarpals will be shortened. Classically. <clears throat> this is a pseudo hypoparathyroidism. You can find the case there. You can find the patient there. If you see the patient, you won't forget. Please see the patient video there. Okay. Then a 31 year old woman is coming here, admitted with a collapse at work. By the time she is admitted to the emergency department, she is complaining of severe headache and drowsiness. The only medication of note is combined oral contraceptive pill. 
on examination she is hypotensive there appears to be no visual response in the right eye her left eye shows peripheral temporal field loss and partial third nerve palsy her potassium is okay creatinine is okay sodium is also fine what is the likely cause what is happening 31 year old lady suddenly she develops severe headache and drowsiness if the same thing is coming in a patient who is 70 year old who is having had a lot of episodes of previous stroke and all you can think otherwise this is a young lady right nothing is wrong with her previously she suddenly developed decreased blood pressure headache drowsiness and with field loss partial third nerve palsy what is happening obviously there should be some bleeding this is a pituitary apoplexy we have seen so many cases they are just reinforcing the concept to us so that we don't miss such cases in acute medicine 45 year old woman the long history of steroid treated sarcoidosis long history of steroid treated sarcoidosis present with extreme thirst nocturia five times per night calcium concentration is 2.3 glucose is 4.6 potassium is 3.5 sodium 149 what is the likely cause of her symptoms she is a patient of sarcoidosis she is treated with steroids now she is having increased thirst and passing increased urine glucose levels are not heavily altered to think she may be developing a new onset diabetes mellitus what is your diagnosis anyone see the sodium level doctor will you get a say adh in the sodium level will you get sadh in this sodium level you will not this is a cranial diabetes insipidus please learn to differentiate between cranial and uh, psychogenic polydipsia and nephrogenic diabetes insipidus this is a cranial diabetes insipidus we should know the differential diagnosis of polyuria what are the causes of polyuria and how to approach them okay this is a cranial diabetes insipidus typically one of the main cause of cranial diabetes insipidus is nothing other than your good old sarcoidosis all right next question sorry 44 year old man is here is referred to the renal department for recurrence renal stones leading to obstructive nephropathy with an estimated glomerular filtration rate of 35 he also complains of lethargy constipation generalized bone pain and he takes 1 mg cabagolin weekly for disorder of his pituitary gland he is adopted so he cannot provide any family history what do you think is happening bones pains groans and he is having obstructive nephropathy ultimately leading to obstructive <clears throat> post renal failure okay along with that he is having some pituitary disorder so he is taking cabergolin so two things pituitary is there parathyroid is involved high calcium okay what are all involved here pituitary parathyroid what strikes in your mind see here let us see what is happening here vitamin d is kind of low adjusted calcium is high and phosphate is low. What do you think is happening? Men 1 or men 2? Osteomalacia. Osteomalacia, yeah, it is a part of it. But osteomalacia will not have the adjusted calcium of 2.91. So the question is now men 1 or men 2? Some people tell men to, some people tell men one. The answer is men one. Okay, the patient has prolactinoma, the patient has hyperparathyroidism. All these are a part of men two, men ones. Sorry, men one. Men two has pheochromocytoma, men two B has morphonide habitus. All right. 
So be clear with men syndromes. You can go back to my lecture once again. Stop at the point where I show the table comprising of all the syndromes from Harrison's and I clearly explained and I clearly also told you how to remember that. Please go through that. Okay. Please go through that. 25 year old woman here presents with primary hyperparathyroidism. It emerges she has been treated previously for a prolactinoma. She tells you mother has a similar condition. What is her likely diagnosis? Now here what are the things are there? Primary hyperparathyroidism plus pituitary tumor, yeah, a prolactinoma. Pituitary tumor like prolactinoma. What is the diagnosis? Again, it is a multiple endocrine neoplasia type 1. All right. Again, it's a time table type 1. Okay. Don't, please don't get confused with men too. There are differences between men 1 and men 2. So many people are almost getting confused with both men 1 and men 2. How many of you remember what happens in men 1, what happens in men 2? Okay. For you all, no problem. I am ready to repeat once again. Men 1, men 2, A. Men to be here pituitary parathyroid pancreatic tumor here parathyroid medullary thyroid carcinoma pheochromocytoma. Here, along with that, mucosal neuroma, morphons, MTC, and FIO. I hope now all of you won't forget. In some books refer men to be as men three. All right. No one should forget it. No one should make any mistake. No one should confuse men one with men two. All right. Unless you don't find pheochromocytoma or MTC, don't call it as a men too. Okay. 18 year old man with meningococcal septicemia treated with high dose septriaxone suddenly develops a gangrene in four toes, which necessitate amputation. Post operately, he complains of flank pain and becoming drowsy and lethargic. His blood pressure is 90 and periphery is a cool. Creatinine is 96, urea 9.6, potassium is high. And sodium is low. What is the likely cause of deterioration? How many of you know about things that parallelly coexist with meningococcal septicemia? How many of you know the things that parallelly exist with meningococcal septicemia? What happens here? Is it ATN? Acute interstitial nephritis, ATN, adrenal insufficiency, septic shock. What is happening? All the parameters. Now see, just clearly see. Decrease BP, increase potassium, decrease sodium. Which part? Which part? Adrenal. So go ahead. The answer is nothing other than your adrenal insufficiency, bilateral adrenal hemorrhage leading to DAC like picture. Okay. It's called Waterhouse Fredrickson syndrome. Fantastic. Dr. Badrullah. Waterhouse Fredrickson syndrome. Excellent. This is called Waterhouse Fredrickson syndrome. All right. The next question 35 year old woman with the past history of peptic ulceration presents with. Three-day history of vomiting. She has a past history of peptic ulcer. She is presenting with three-day history of vomiting. So what is happening? pH is high. Chloride is low. Bicarbonate is high. Urea is high. Potassium is low. Sodium is low. What do you think is happening? So what happens in a vomiting? How many of you know? You are all like physicians. You must be definite. You know what happens when somebody vomits. You become acidotic or alkalotic. He becomes acidotic or alkalotic. He becomes alkalotic without doubt. Then what other thing happened? Potassium will be lost. In peptic ulcer, what do you get? 
hypokalemic hypokalemic hypochloremic metabolic then alkalosis now they are asking what treatment you will give that is not the thing hypokalemic hypochloremic metabolic alkalosis occurring in peptic ulcer disease is a final year mbbs thing how they are concerned how do you treat that is your role as a general internal medicine physician what do you give here simple iv normal saline you typically if the patient is palating kcl syrup you can give 25 year old women presents with a renal calculus she has recurrent episodes of headache sweating their physical examination reveals thyroid nodules no signs of thyrotoxicosis now tell me what is the diagnosis somebody with a renal stone renal stone is there okay first renal stone where you will attribute it to it can be attributed to increased calcium could be increased pth hyperparathyroidism episodes of headache and sweating where you will attribute it to pheochromocytoma and thyroid nodule it could be mtc combine all these three, three, three things together what you will do what is the next thing you will do 24 hour plasma metanephrine is the first thing you I'm sorry, there was some internet reconnection. Now I hope all of you can hear me, right? I hope all of you can hear me. All of you can hear me. Can all of you hear me? Just give a nod, I will continue. Yes, yes, yes. Thank you. Sorry about that. Upregulation of glucose transporter, would you expect to see in case of upregulated insulin sensitivity, which glut? Anyone who is good? In endocrine or biochem, the glut 1, 2, 3, 4, leave 5, 5 is a fructose transporter. Which one, doctor? Insulin receptor site, <coughs> which <coughs> glucose transporter is there? Anybody? Any idea? Come on, give me a try. At least give some number. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Upregulation of which glucose transporter would you expect to see? One, two, three, four, five. The answer is 4. GLUT4, which is located in chromosome number 19. How many of you remember Insulin secretion. How insulin secretion? It results in tyrosine kinase activation and it uptakes the glucose and stimulates the insulin receptor. So the answer is GLUT4. Okay. Just for a safer side, for basic sciences sake, just go through the types of glucose transporters and where it's located. What is the significance? One thing always don't forget. GLUT5 is a fructose transporter. Once they had asked in MRCP. Okay. Next question. 36-year-old man presents to his family doctor complaining of excessive sweating, weight loss, palpitation. On examination, BP is 125 by 82. He is tachycardic with pulse of 88. You note a fine tremor, no goiter. Thyroid function test is normal. But 
TSH is normal, but free T3 and free T4 are elevated. Which of the following is likely to explain this? Somebody with a thyrotoxic feature, but BP is normal, fine tremor is there. TSH is normal, but T3 and T4 are elevated. When T3 and T4 are elevated, TSH should go down, right? That's the fact, but it's elevated. So what it could be? It's a TSH secreting pituitary tumor. Is it a Graves disease? Is it self-administration of thyroxine? The answer is TSH secreting pituitary tumor, though it's all uncommon. I'll tell you, this TSH OMA can present as this. T3 will be increased, T4 will be increased, TSH can be increased. But in some cases, no, this is not sick euthyroid. Sick euthyroid is entirely different. That happens in a patient who went for prolonged illness. Okay. Here in the TSHOMA, that is pituitary thyroid disorder, what happens is this TSH levels, can you see? This TSH levels, what happens to this TSH level? It can be increased or it can be normal. What we call in endocrine is a high normal value, they call my endocrine consultant always tells that. He tells that, don't tell me abnormal. It is high normal or low normal. What it is. That's what he wanted to know. So, this is a TSH secreting pituitary tumor. All right. Next, 48 year old man is here, referred by the GP to suspect acromegaly. So, what is the initial investigation of acromegaly? All of you know what is the initial investigation? Measurement of serum IGF 1. All right. No doubt in that because more than three to four questions we had worked out. So I'm just going a little fast on this. Now a 55-year-old woman is present with the clinical features of Cushing syndrome. 55-year-old lady is coming to you with features of the Cushing syndrome. She is on no medication. The results of routine medical biomedical investigation, biochemical investigations reveals nine of cortisol is at 800 elevated. ACTH is elevated. Following a high-dose dexamethasone, the previous evening repeat is 380. So following high dose dexamethasone, cortisol levels are elevated. So what do you think? I told very clearly about localization of Cushing syndrome. How to localize Cushing syndrome is in my lecture. It's extremely, extremely important. Unless we don't know that, we will get into trouble. Is it adrenal adenoma? Is it due to adrenal carcinoma? Is it due to Cushing's disease? Is it due to depression? Is it due to ectopic ACTH secretion? The answer is Cushing's disease. Okay? Cushing's disease. Cushing's disease is pituitary. Cushing's disease is entirely pituitary. The answer is Cushing's disease is pituitary. Excellent. A lot of people got it. 20-year-old women complaining of polyuria has a plasma osmolality of 306 and urinary osmolality of 270. Intranasal vasopressin increases the urinary osmolality to 640. This is a diabetes insipidus. All of you know. Am I right? One, it can be at the pituitary level. Another, it can be at the renal level. <clears throat> Defect in the aquaponin channels here. Okay, so when somebody give vasopressin, if it responds, it's going to be some defect in the pituitary level and the cranial level. So the diagnosis is cranial diabetes insipidus. Because when there is a problem with the renal system, however much desmopressin you pump into the patient, he is not going to do any give any positive response. Now for 45 year old woman with a type 2 diabetes presents for review. She currently takes metformin, glycoside, and her HbA1c is 51. Her BP is 132. She is taking an AC inhibitor. Total cholesterol is 5.2. HDL is kind of low. Creat is okay. Albumin is positive. Which of the following would be the most appropriate intervention to reduce cardiovascular events? See, she's a diabetic. Lot of drugs has been already put on. There is not much drugs you can try and toy around. Metformin is there. Glycoside is there. Already she is on AC inhibitor. So you want to give some cardio protection. What you will give? You will give a thiazid diuretic. You will give a simvastatin. You will transition her to insulin therapy. What are the other? 
The BP is borderline high, 132. Cholesterol is 5.2. What you will give to protect her heart? But there is no SGLT2 inhibitor here. So what is the thing you will do? Bendroplomethacide. Is it simvastatin? The answer is statins. There is a recent study that suggested statins increasing blood glucose level. Okay. Always note down, low dose statin does not increase the blood glucose level. Okay. Remember, low dose statin does not increase the blood glucose level. The blood glucose level is increased when you take or when you put the patient on a high dose statin and not on a low dose statin. Next question, 19 year old woman with poorly controlled type 1 diabetes mellitus with a temperature, dehydration, altered sensorium, presence with sodium of 130, potassium of 4.5, bicarbonate of 6 and pH of 7.2. What is happening here? What is happening here? What is the diagnosis? This is a common clinical scenario. Nobody should even hesitate to tell. This is a DKA. Acidosis is here, pH is 7.2, bicarb is low. She is a type 1 diabetes mellitus, dehydration. What is the next thing you will be doing? You will put the patient on eye fluids. DKA management, everyone should have been in your everyone should have that in your fingertips. All right. Diagnostic criteria, I hope all you know. Ketonemia more than three or more than 2 plus ketone on urine dipstick, blood glucose more than 11 millimole, bicarbonate less than 15. All right. Next question. 43-year-old woman attends endocrinology clinic after presenting with weight loss, palpitation, diarrhea, cessation of periods. Examination reveals a single nodule on her left thyroid. Technetium 99 scan shows increased uptake within the nodule and reduced activity throughout elsewhere. Thyroid function test shows free thyroxine of 30, low TSH. First, what is the diagnosis here? What is happening to this lady? She is a 43-year-old lady. She attends the endocrinology clinic after presenting with weight loss, palpitations, diarrhea. It is a hyperthyroidism. What is specifically here? lot of things. Uh, and doctor, who's, who are all doing graves? Graves, graves people. One minute, listen. I have given the picture of technetium 99 scan and I told you how graves disease will present. Graves are toxic uh, multinodular goiter. How it will present? There will be multiple areas of uptake. Okay, multinodular goiter is that only multiple areas of uptake. Here, there is an increased uptake in only one nodule. Just listen here. There is increased uptake only in one only in one nodule. So what is it? So what is the first line definitive treatment? This is radioidin therapy. This is what you call as a solitary thyroid nodule. Okay, solitary thyroid nodule. Okay, this is a solitary thyroid nodule. Graves disease, there will be uniform uptake. It won't be just uptake in one particular place. Clearly, they have given the entire gland. There is no activity except for this nodule. Please don't tell this is Graves disease. This is solitary thyroid nodule or toxic adenoma, whatever you call it. This is a single hyperfunctioning nodule. This is not Graves. This is not at all Graves. So the treatment is straight away. You have to give radio iodine therapy here. This is not Graves. Please understand each and every word that is mentioned. There is uptake only within one nodule. Not the entire area it is having an uptake. Only within one nodule there is an uptake. It's a solitary nodule. The treatment of radio iodine therapy. Next, 37 year old woman presents to emergency department after chasing thieves. Wow. Who are stealing car. Her blood pressure not 185. She admits having episodic headache, feeling stressed and anxious. 
she is of normal appearance her calcium on admission is 2.95 the normal renal function abdominal ultrasound reveals an adrenal mass so what are the things happening here increased bp headache adrenal mass calcium here and what is that overall what is that overall this is meant to a now don't tell men one this is meant to a okay they are asking the underlying diagnosis pheochromocytoma is a part of the diagnosis but why there is going to be hypercalcemia associated with pheochromocytoma the answer is it's meant to syndrome okay meant to syndrome 24 year old adopted man present with transient left sided weakness of his arm which resolves after few hours is only other history of notice reduced libido and inability to maintain erection on examination he appears to have a spotty skin pigmentation you notice the heart murmur there appears to be a left atrial mass on echocardiography his actin level is high doctors this particular case i just gave as a picture based quiz for you all with all this presentation what is it people who would have seen my core concept lecture should not miss this left atrial myxoma is there left atrial mass and spotty skin pigmentation is called lentigens then you have to do the rest what is this doctors this is called carney complex i had pasted a picture also there what is the spotty skin pigmentation or lentigens myxoma endocrine tumors somatomatous melanotic swarm on swanoma everything all this together it's called as carney's complex please go back that's why i wanted to announce in the group before this lecture starts please listen to my core concept lecture once and come back to the endocrine it will be very easy for you straight away if you don't listen didn't listen to that if you are completely new then you will get confused what is this A lot of people see now forgot between men one and men two and i clearly showed the tectesium 99 scan and explained how multi nodular goiter goes what is a solitary thyroid nodule what is a cold nodule hot nodule with all the pictures it has <coughs> it has been explained so please go through that again and listen to this again as well it will help you tremendously now a 28 year old and presents to emergency department with sudden loss of vision in the right eye is only past history of notice previous cerebellar hemorrhage there is evidence of bilateral retinal angiomas and partial partial retinal detachment in the right eye what is the diagnosis retinal angioma this also has been thought in neurology or endo i thought i thought i, I think i thought this thing in neurology retinal angioma cerebellar hemangioblastoma anything rings a bell anybody any clue somebody give me somebody try to answer something i'll be more than happy okay you made a good attempt you wanted to tell it's a neurofibromatosis i appreciate your attempt doctor good like that only attempt here don't try attempts in the main exam this is the place to make mistake and learn <clears throat> anybody yes fantastic this is your good old von kip in the disease what are the components retinal hemangioblastoma and cns cerebellar hemangioblastoma renal cyst pheochromocytoma pancreatic tumor all this together it's called von hippel lindau syndrome von hippel lindau disease all right von hippel lindau disease now comes our pharmacist again 45 year old pharmacist present with episodes of tired g his blood pressure is 115 by 75 blood test revealed hypokalemia rise to bicarbonate level urine involves hypercalciuria what is the likely diagnosis low bp 
low potassium increase by carb hypercalciuria where it leads to what is this is it barter is it gittleman is it furosemide abuse is it con syndrome or is it little syndrome syndrome and little syndrome out why both will cause increased blood pressure you are left with furosemide abuse gittleman syndrome and barter syndrome what is the likely diagnosis the likely diagnosis is furosemide abuse. Good. Okay. Good. Why it is furosemide abuse? Okay. Furosemide is a drug. This cause increased presence of calcium in urine by inhibiting its absorption. Another clue is he is a pharmacist. Altogether, this furosemide will lead to hypokalemia as well because this is not a potassium sparing diuretic. If it's a diuretic like spironolactone, it spares potassium. It doesn't. It causes hypokalemia. Along with that, as a result of that bicarbonate level increase in a compensatory mat and urine will show hypercalciuria. This is a furious mat abuse. <clears throat> 42 year old man is referred to hypertension clinic for advice. He is taking atenolol, benroflumethiazide, ramipril for his blood pressure. And it is currently 165 by 105. And potassium is low. Serum bicarbonate is 31. BMI is 24. What is the next step you will do? What is happening here? Increased BP. Decreased potassium. I told you, when the pattern of this you will see in a normal patient with a normal waist hip ratio. If the patient is telling you he is obese or anything, you can think in terms of a Cushing syndrome. This is not a cushing eyed picture. Where you will localize the pathology first? Where you will localize the pathology? Come on. Mostly adrenal, right? Mostly will be going to be adrenal. Am I right? We have worked out so many questions. We are just, we have to be reinforced now. The pathology is adrenal. So what you will do next thing? You will measure the renin aldosterone ratio. That's the next best thing you can do here. Next question. 73-year-old woman presents with weight loss and is found to have serum calcium concentration of 3.2 millimole. My goodness, increased calcium. And PTH is low and phosphate is just below the lower limit of normal. A skeletal survey is normal. She undergoes investigation of malignancy and found to be having gastric carcinoma. Secretion of which of the substance in the hormone is readily to this cause. Okay. They are telling she is having gastric CA. What secreted by gastric CA will cause increased calcium? Any idea? Anyone good in oncology? Come on, try, try answering something. What are things can increase calcium? And what are things can <coughs> decrease the calcium? See the list. Is it PTH, calcitrol, calcitonin, osteoclast activating cytokinins, PTH related peptide? The answer is E. All this gastric carcinoma, everything will release something called PTHRP. What is meant by PTHRP is parathyroid hormone related peptide. This particular hormone that is secreted by the carcinoma will go up all the way and it will increase the calcium levels. Okay, that's the answer. 44 year old woman is brought to emergency department after sustaining a head injury. A CT brain does not show any trauma. However, it does show enlargement of the pituitary fossa. Subsequent MRI shows 1.5 centimeter pituitary adenoma confined to the fossa. She does not have any medical history, no feelings of unwellness, neurological ev evidence reveals a bitemporal hemianopia. Which of the hormone is most likely to be being secreted in excess? So this is another incidental finding. After accident, she is developing this and then by 
where there is a pituitary adenoma sitting. Which of the following hormones can be reason for this? ACTH, FSH, growth hormone, prolactin, or TSH? The answer is yes, prolactin. Okay. Most commonly functional pituitary adenoma, most common tumor is your good old prolactin hormone. Right? 36 year old man here refers referred by his GP with likely acromegaly. IGF one is elevated, OGTT does not suppress the growth hormone. MRI reveals a microadenoma. Which of the following is usually the treatment of choice? A patient with acromegaly, what is the treatment of choice? Medical treatment, radiotherapy, transfrontal surgery, transphenoidal surgery. I had explained this with nice guidelines. took the nice guidelines and we had explained this okay transphenoidal surgery is the treatment of choice without any bit of doubt transphenoidal surgery is the treatment of choice without any bit of doubt now a 50 year old woman with resistant hypertension is investigated for underlying secondary cause she has found to have hypercholesterolemia what they are asking, which one of the clinical findings would suggest strongly an ectopic ACTH is the cause of the condition. Okay. What clinical finding is most significantly will tell you it's ectopic ACTH. Anyone without seeing the options, can anyone tell me which particular clinical finding? Is it hyperglycemia, worsening hypertension, hyperkalemia, muscle wasting, weight loss? The answer is weight loss. It's a more of a logical thinking. Ectopic ACTH, okay? Can cause weight loss by so many different mechanisms. Okay? So many mechanisms. But most strong associated factor is weight loss. You can still find hypokalemia. You can find muscle. Most common mind. Why? Otherwise, you remember, ectopic ACTH is always due to cancer. Cancer will have what? Weight loss. At least even if you forget everything, remember this way. Most simplistic way. 49-year-old woman is investigated to determine the cause of Cushing syndrome following demonstration of hyper cortisolemia by a 24-hour urinary cortisol secretion and failed dexamethasone suppression test. Her midnight cortisol concentration is elevated. Ninth hour cortisol concentration falls to 50% after high dose dexamethasone suppression test. Plasma cortisol increases by 25% after she then CRH. What is the likely diagnosis? What is the likely diagnosis here? 24 hour urinary cortisol excretion failed to suppress increased and high dose dexamethasone makes it false. What it is? Where is the source? Adrenal adenoma, carcinoma, ACTH, independent macronodular adrenal hyperplasia, Cushing's disease, ectopic secretion. The answer is pituitary. Why high dose dexamethasone failed to suppress? Okay. High dose dexamethasone fails to suppress. Only 50% of the concentration falls. It fails to suppress. What is the question? Look at here very carefully. 49 year old lady is being investigated for Cushing syndrome. Okay. Because she has high cortisol. And she has a high urinary cortisol excretion and failed dexamethasone suppression test. 
The next thing you need to note here is high dose dexamethasone suppression test fails to suppress the cortisol. Okay, only fifty percent it is suppressed. So what is likely to what is like to be the likely cause of this? It's a pituitary dependent. That is your good old Cushing's disease. All right, it's a Cushing's disease. I hope one of you got it. Twenty-seven year old man is coming here with a new diagnosis of Kalman syndrome. He is in endocrine clinic. He has a family history and has been found to have a mutation in Cal1 gene. Obviously, Kalman syndrome will have low LH, FSH and testosterone. Other pituitary hormones can be normal. He is not keen on having children. So what treatment he will give? He don't want to start a family. He don't want to have children. He is having Kalman syndrome. He has low LH, FSH and testosterone. What he will you give? Oral testosterone replacement or pulsatile GnRH, regular injections of HCG, regular injections of gonadotrophins, or will you give testosterone patches? The answer is testosterone patches. See, this gentleman does not, he, he, he just don't want to have children anymore. Okay, he don't want to have children anymore. So what is the point in giving any hormonal supplement? Why to give any injection, hormonal injections? No point in pricking this gentleman, right? Leave him as he is. Best thing to give is testosterone patches. All right. Now, 42-year-old undergoes pituitary surgery for a non-functioning macroadenoma, impinging on the optic chiasm. Post-operatively, he develops pan, pan hypopituitarism. He is treated with steroid replacement, testosterone, thyroxine replacement, okay, and he has symptoms of growth hormone deficiency, okay. A decision has been made to replace his growth hormone. So, what is the well-recognized effect? So, for Following any pituitary surgery, it is common to get a pan pituitary soon. That is, all the levels of pituitary hormones will start falling down. So, what you will do? What is the effect of the growth hormone supplementation? They are asking the physiology of growth hormone. What it does? Does it decrease bone mineral density? Does it increase fasting serum triglyceride concentration? That is, increase in fat mass? Or does it increase lean body mass? Or it will increase serum total cholesterol concentration? Come on, tell me. What is the thing that growth hormone does to you when it is given? Fantastic, yes. It increases lean body mass. Okay, it increases lean body mass. That's one of the very thing you should be noting. And also, GH administration includes muscle mass and decreases the fat mass. 26-year-old man referred to gastroscopy because history of several months of dyspepsia. He took lot of over for the counter antacids, his primary care physician carries out routine blood tests found to have serum calcium of 3.2 and venous bicarbonate of 33. Phosphate, renal, everything is normal. What is the reason behind hypercalcemia? Increased calcium in a person with OTC antacid, there is only one diagnosis if you find something like that. Increased calcium in a patient who is taking over the counter antacid. Without seeing options, you should be able to diagnose and tell me. Increased calcium in a patient who is taking over the counter antacids. <clears throat> Gastrinoma. Now tell me what it is. What it says that he is having gastrinoma. What it says that he is having gastrinoma? Goodness, no. Don't diagnose malignancies in people. They will scare. Never do it in UK. Oh my God, dear friend, I think you may be having some tumor in your tummy. Finished. If he breaks down, that's it. He will go and complain to the <clears throat> ward manager and leave. The answer is milk alkali syndrome. Young patient, dyspepsia. Rise to bicarbonate level. It's milk alkali syndrome, especially in antacid abuse. This would not have needed much option if you would have worked out the question before. Simple thing. Young guy, there is nothing there. They Typically, they are giving something here as a clue. He is taking over the counter antacid. 
the answer is milk alkali syndrome always remember young guy or even elderly gentleman also otc antacids increase calcium increase by car always milk alkali syndrome mass okay next question 17 year old girl is referred to the endocrine clinic with primary amenorrhea on clinical examination of bme is low there is a moderate hirsutism and clitoromegaly a male clinic seen at the age of 8 years with precocious puberty her testosterone is high estradiol is high fsh is okay lh is high which blood marker is most likely to be abnormal in this girl first what do you think uh who is asking why is he taking antacid lot of people take otc antacids here because not many medications you will get uh, just like that in uk one of the medication you can easily procure is otc antacids topical steroids in some places and then your paracetamol 17 year old girl is here she is having primary amenorrhea she has a bmi of 21 moderate hirsutism and clitoromegaly what is happening here is it 17 all hydroxy progesterone sodium potassium cortisol or hcg which is abnormal now tell me is 17 hydroxy progesterone the underlying diagnosis non classical adrenal hyperplasia what are the features of that amenorrhea hyperandrogenism clitoromegaly there will be family history of precocious puberty in a male children see what is happening The male cousin is having a precocious puberty. But what age? At eight years, this guy attained puberty. So the answer is seventeen hydroxy progesterone. The diagnosis is congenital adrenal hyperplasia, non-classical type. I told you how classical type presents. <clears throat> Eighty-one year old woman is referred to thyroid clinic at nine month history of increasing size of pre-existing goiter. She has a long-standing autoimmune. hypothyroidism autoimmune hypothyroidism is hashimotos what they are asking ultimately is which of the following primary thyroid cancer is she most likely to have what cancer developed from hashimotos somebody answered that way back what cancer developed from hashimotos anaplastic carcinoma follicular medullary papillary or lymphoma what develops from hashimotos come on others More? Yes, it's thyroid lymphoma. All right. Next question. Thirty-six year old woman sees her GP complaining of fatigue, four kg weight gain, dry hair, skin. On examination, she has a small diffuse goiter. The thyroid stimulating hormone level is sixteen increased. F T four is five low. Cholesterol is six point three, and other routine blood tests are normal. She has two sisters who have thyroid disease. So here somebody is having fatigue, weight gain, dry skin. These are features of hypothyroidism without a doubt. And TSH level is obviously increased because T three T four levels are low. Cholesterol levels will be higher in patients with hypothyroidism. And mild elevation of prolactin also seen in patients with hypothyroidism. Other blood are normal. What is the likely diagnosis? So D core one, follicular carcinoma, Hashimoto's, Graves, toxic multinodular. Thirty-six year old lady. The clue is they are telling she has cousins who is also so it is a familial hypothyroidism. So familial hypothyroidism more with an autoimmune picture is always going to be Hashimoto's. Doctor, why it is follicular carcinoma? What features of carcinoma you are seeing here? Nothing. She is just having a goiter and hypothyroid features. There is no features of hypothyroidism. Uh, carcinoma is present here. This is straightforward Hashimoto's thyroiditis, autoimmune thyroiditis. All right, it's not a carcinoma. How long the class will go? Oh, I think doctor another twenty minutes. I'll wind up <clears throat> because my battery is also draining. In another twenty-five minutes, at least twenty minutes, I'll wind up. I have to take a break, and Pace's group will come. I have to take a class for them. Twenty-eight-year-old woman who is three months postpartum comes to the surgery complaining of tiredness. A twenty-eight-year-old woman 
who is three months postpartum comes to surgery complaining of tiredness. She has no period since the baby was born. She is unable to breastfeed because of lack of milk protection. You notice in her case sheet that she required a blood transfusion after delivery of severe delivery for severe postpartum hemorrhage. So, somebody with severe postpartum hemorrhage during the delivery, later time, she is not able to give milk. She complains tiredness. What is the thing? Empty cell, hypophysitis, prolactinoma, Sheehan's simple. Sheehan's syndrome. Hypopetitism following pregnancy is Sheehan's syndrome because she is not able to produce prolactin due to hypopetitism. Sheehan's syndrome. Very good. Next question. 34-year-old man presents to GP with a history of thirst, polyuria, recent weight loss, urine has ketones, blood glucose is 33.4 higher. Which of the following feature would suggest he has type 2 diabetes rather than type 1 diabetes? Ketones can present in type 2 also because a lot of type 2 ends up here in the hospital with DKA. So what is that? What is favorable of type 2? BMI of 23, high circulating India insulin level, HLA DR3, positive islet cell antibodies, plasma bicarbonate of 8 millimole. What among the following suggests the patient is having type 2 diabetes? One clear answer. One clear cut answer I want. Who is going to give me the answer? The answer is high insulin circulating. Why HLA DRT3? This is more to do with Modi and other autoimmune phenomena. Positive islet cell antibody is for type 1. This has nothing to do. What is type 2 diabetes? What is type 2 diabetes? They are asking which of the following features suggest he has type 2 diabetes. They are not going for this. They are given different features here. Somebody with a body mass index of 23, high circulating insulin, HLA DR3, positive islet cell antibodies, plasma bicarbonate level of 8 millimole, which you think is a future of type 2 diabetes is what they are asking. So, what among the five says that it is a type 2 diabetes? What is type 2 diabetes? First, if you know that, you will know. Type 2 diabetes is what? Type 1 diabetes is what? This is insulinopenia. Okay? The name itself, it is insulinopenia. Means lack of insulin due to beta cell dysfunction. Type 2 diabetes is what? It is insulin resistance. If you see type 2 diabetes mellitus, they will have high amount of insulin. But what happens is they won't be able to go and act on the receptor. That is what you call as insulin resistance. So the answer is high circulating insulin level is something <coughs> that different, differentiate between type 1 diabetes mellitus. Next question. 67 year old man is referred to diabetes clinic with a new diagnosis of type 2 diabetes. Okay. What is happening here is EGFR is low. Creatinine is high. HbA1c is 8%. He has past history of ischemic heart disease. He is taking Ramipril, Provastat, Aspirin, Bisoprolol. What they are asking is which drug you will prescribe. Any patient with EGFR of 29 and increased creatinine type 2 DM. What drugs is coming in your mind that you may be prescribing in this particular situation? Come on, all of you can contribute. No issues. What drug you guys think you will prescribe in this gentleman? Any idea? Chlorpromide. Chlorpropramide. Insulin, glargin, rosaglitazone, linagliptin, metformin. The answer is gliptin. DDP4 inhibitors are far safer here. In case of anyone with a low GFR and increased creatinine goes on a renal failure, the best option is going to be gliptins. Nothing else. 
27 year old women with type 1 diabetes monitors since the age of 3 attends for a routine review says she wishes to become pregnant her hbmc is 9.4 she has history of non mild non proliferative retinopathy and sensory neuropathy albumin creatinine ratio is 2.3 her only medication is an insulin pump which of the following factors would be most likely to result in a poor pregnancy outcome if she wants to become pregnant so here a type 1 Uh, glyphosin <clears throat> is based on risk benefit ratio of the particular patient. Glyphins are far preferred. Most likely resulting poor pregnancy outcome in a type 1 diabetic patient. Which one will get worsen here? Will a sensory neuropathy will get worsen? Or if she doesn't take folic acid, it will result in a poor pregnancy outcome. Or her non proliferative retinopathy or HbA1c of 9.4%. Or albumin creatinine ratio, which of the following which she has will lead to poor pregnancy outcome? Albumin is an issue, or retinopathy is an issue, or HbA1c is an issue, or not taking folic acid is an issue, or sensory neuropathy is an issue. Which is the main culprit here, which will create fuss with her pregnancy? Okay. So, all of you says, High HbA1c will lead to poor pregnancy outcome. So somebody with a high HbA1c, they can't have pregnancy. Okay. Let's see. Yes. Yes. What happens? Diabetic babies, how the babies come up? They are called big babies. There is a hypothesis behind this. It's called Pedersen hypothesis. You all can go and read because I can't go ahead and explain all these things. Okay. Pedersen hypothesis. All right. Now a 39-year-old old woman referred by she's a non-smoker who drinks no alcohol and exercises regularly at the gym. She is currently taking atinolol 100 milligram, vendroflomethiazide 2.5 milligram, ramipril 10 milligram. Her blood pressure is 165 by 105. Her bicarbonate is high normal low potassium so again we are coming back here low potassium high blood pressure what do you think of where it is getting localized low potassium high blood pressure where it is getting localized yes so what do you do you do overnight dexamethasone suppression test aldosterone plasma and in activity holding of the medication or renal magnetic angiography or urinary mandelic mandel acid or urinary urinary catecholamines. We have seen it already. Renin aldosterone ratio is the answer. 38 year old psychiatric inpatient who is being treated for depression is admitted to a general ward with increasing confusion. Is sodium is 122, plasma osmolality is 235, urinary osmolality is 400. No examination of, uh, there is no evidence of other issues. All right. What is the most likely diagnosis? First, tell me the likely diagnosis here, seeing it. Every word, everything I underlined important, okay? Psychiatric patient, low sodium. What is this? The patient has reduced renal sodium excretion. Is it true? Or IV normal saline will be beneficial. Or urine sodium concentration will be elevated. Psychiatric drugs are not related to the condition. Or the patient is hypovolemic. What is the condition first? I'll quickly go. The urine sodium concentration will be elevated. The underlying diagnosis is SIADH. SIADH we have already seen. It will have high urine sodium. And sodium in the serum is low. 120. This is not nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. Please don't go for it because see the sodium levels. In diabetes insipidus, typically sodium levels won't go low like 122 and now. If you find this low sodium level, you are dealing with an SIADH. All right, this is not diabetes insipidus. Make sure you are very clear with that. Don't confuse diabetes insipidus with an SIADH. Guys, first of all, an inpatient. In patient, hospitalized patient, most common thing you will get is an SIADH than other things. This is a case of SIADH. 
So what is going to happen? Urinary sodium is going to be elevated. Now a 44 year old man with 15 year history of bipolar disorder referred to endocrinologist for an opinion. He is noted to have a sodium concentration of 144 with urea of 12 creatinine 140, urine osmolality of 250 and fasting plasma glucose everything is normal. Her oral input output is like urine output is 4.4 liter, oral intake is 2.5 liter. For a 2.5 liter, 4.4 liter is going out. There is some um, amount of polyurea is there. For first, what is the diagnosis here? Don't tell this is SIADH because the sodium levels are normal here. Normal, I would say high normal. Am I right? There, if you go back to this question, sodium levels are low. So you cannot call it as a DA. Now, this is a case of diabetes insipidus. High normal sodium. All right. Low urine osmolality. Psychiatric patient. So, what is the thing they want you to know? They are asking the question. Psychiatric drugs are unlikely to have played part in their condition. B, if the patient under, underwent a water deprivation test, desmopressin would cause a rise in urine osmolality. Cranial diabetes insipidus is the most likely underlying diagnosis. Desmopressin is an appropriate treatment for the condition. Lithium is the likely underlying cause of her condition. Which of the following statement is true? All are going for E. The answer is E. Excellent. Yes. It's lithium induced nephrogenic diabetes insipidus. Lithium induces nephrogenic diabetes insipidus and not cranial diabetes insipidus. Don't make the mistake. Next question. 62-year-old man presents to GP with one-year history of bony pain, particularly affecting left femur, pelvis and lower back. He is otherwise fine. His calcium level is 2.3. It's okay. Phosphate level is 1.1. His ALP is high. Full blood count, everything is fine. There is a mixed lytic lesion with sclerotic chain with actionated tubercular markings. So what happens here? Somebody with the pathology in the bones is having a pain, particularly in the left femur, pelvis and the lower back. Calcium levels are normal. Phosphate levels are normal. But ALP is high. And I told you very clearly, mixed lytic and sclerotic change, where exactly happens? Bone formation, bone destruction. Bone formation, bone destruction. Only diagnosis for such case with rise to ALP, Paget's disease. Very good. Everyone got it. This is a Paget's disease. Don't forget. Okay. Now, the next question. Last few questions. In 10 minutes, we can wind up. 32-year-old woman presents with amenorrhea for six months, having regular periods before this since the age of 13. Over the past few months, she has occasionally been leaking milk from both the breast. Urine HCG is negative. Thyroid function is normal. She is on no, no other medication. Prolactin level is 2,400. Which of the following is the best fits for her condition? Here, a 32-year-old lady, she is coming with amenorrhea for six months. Okay, since the age of 13. He has occasionally been leaking milk. So this is a prolactinoma. But what they are asking? She is asking, they are asking, is it a macro prolactinoma? She can be observed with the primary observation. Or cabergolin is the treatment of choice. Surgery is the best treatment option. Or a visual field defect is the key. It is likely. What is the answer? Anybody? Okay. Okay. The answer is C. Okay. Answer is C. Surgery is first line for acromegaly. Remember, acromegaly surgery is the first line. In prolactinoma, first line is Dopamine agonist. Doctor, for your doubt only, I am answering here. Surgery is the first line treatment for acromegaly because prolactinoma, many of the tumors respond really well to dopamine agonist. When you can give a drug and shrink the tumor, why do you want to do a procedure? Why do you want to put an endoscope through his nose and remove the tumor when it can be shrunk? Am I right? You are getting it? 
don't confuse yourself on this whereas in acromegaly you cannot just like that give drugs and reverse the changes so the immediate the very first line treatment is transphenoidal resection of the tumor prolactinoma first line is dopamine agonist this also has been told in our core concept lectures with nice guidelines i had explained everything all right please don't confuse yourself between these two things acromegaly is not prolactinoma prolactinoma is not acromegaly all right all of you clear <clears throat> next question 55 year old woman presents with her husband to the endocrine clinic she has distracting symptoms of sweating her husband noticed increased prominence of her jaw compared to old photos this is an acromegaly type 2 diabetes mellitus is there hypertension is there carpal tunnel syndrome is there she is already on atinolol atrovastatin and metformin now they are asking which of the following fits best with her condition random growth hormone level will be less igf levels will be normal growth hormone levels will remain above 1 nanogram after 75 gram glucose load her cardiac risk marker is similar to general population hypertension coexists in 10% of the population which of the following is true regarding her acromegaly the answer is c yes growth hormone levels will remain above 1 nanogram because cardiac risk is higher than general population in acromegaly hypertension coexists with more than 10% of the people all right igf and random growth hormone will not be normal next question 32 year old woman presents to gp with extreme lethargy of 6 weeks after the birth of her third child her pregnancy was uneventful but she has a history of hypothyroidism postpartum depression she complains fatigue nausea dizziness along with uti however 3 days later she has been brought to the emergency department after she collapsed where blood pressure is dropped to 80 by 52 low sodium high potassium skin pigmentation what is happening here last 5 minutes quickly we have to wind up come on tell me what is happening here so many scenarios we have seen no need to think is it shehans prolactinoma addison's postnatal depression thyrotoxicosis see the history 32 week old 32 year old women after 6 week of the birth of the third child 32 we year old women after 6 weeks after birth of her third child presenting with an adrenal symptoms acute symptoms of collapse what is this doctors this is addison's disease excellent yes this is addison's disease next question 25 year old women presents to the assessment of the fertility clinic she has been unable to conceive for 18 months okay she has a menarche at the age of 16 always had irregular periods on clinic you notice a bmi of 32 hirsutism normal thyroid function somebody is unable to conceive for 18 months despite regular intercourse she had a menarche of 6 at 16 she always had irregular periods bmi is 32 what are the things happening lh and fsh are likely to be the same or sex hormone binding level is frequently low in this condition androstenedione level is normal fertility is usually unaffected by the condition measured dha is will be normal or low what is the condition here first what is the condition here we have seen this multiple time they are just asking it in a different note 25 year old lady is presenting with assessment of fertility fertility clinic she is not able to conceive for 18 months pcos so what is true about pcos here why oh, you need to think a lot what is true about pcos here the answer is yes sex hormone binding globulin is frequently low in pcos okay LHFSH ratio is altered. Here the ratio is altered. Androstenedione levels are not normal. Fertility is usually unaffected. No, it is affected. And measured DHEAs will not be normal or low. It will be rather high. All right. That's about PCOS. The last question for the day: 38 year old woman presents to the clinic with the difficulty to treat hypertension. 
She takes ramipril 10 milligram, amlodipin 10 milligram. She has a blood pressure of 155 by 95 millimeter of mercury. She has noted that her face becomes more rounded over the years. She is having trouble with acne and hirsutism. Fasting blood glucose is 6.6. .6. Renal function is normal. Potassium is 3.4. Also been increasing problem with abdominal obesity. Purple stretch marks are appearing. Which test is abnormal in this case? What is the diagnosis first? Diagnosis is, diagnosis is Cushing's. Okay. So blood pressure is high, low potassium, obesity, strie, high blood sugar, raised blood pressure. It is Cushing's. Now they are asking what's happening here. Is it what is going to be abnormal? Urinary mandelic acid, plasma metanephrins, renin aldosterone, ratio, overnight dexamethasin suppression test, oral glucose tolerance test. The answer is overnight dexamethasin suppression test. All right. This is about pushings. Okay. This is not needed. Okay. Initial testing and everything you can go through in my core concept lectures. <clears throat> okay, guys, with this, we will take a break and we will catch up again just 30 minutes earlier tomorrow so that we can finish earlier because we need not drag it till 11 o'clock. I'll try to finish up a little earlier. I hope it will. Okay, we will do more such sessions because as I do this, I'm just noticing where are all people are mistaking things and like where are all the paths that needs to be corrected. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. The lecture will be there 30 minutes ahead of today's time. Just 30 minutes ahead we are going to start. Not much because it is taking so long <coughs> because I am also subsequently having other classes as well. So we covered almost 78 to, it's not 78, I would say around 85% to 90% of past test MCQs. Everything in and out we covered. Okay. So tomorrow we will be doing little of past test and the rest of the past medicine. Uh, somebody has a doubt. Yes, wait a minute. I'll answer you, no problem. If you have a clinical gap, will me. Clinical gap, everybody has. Even I have a clinical gap. Because during the COVID, what has happened is my kid was born. I didn't go to the job. I stayed back. There is no other go because I cannot go and risk my life and my kid's life at least. Most people, many people in my side, they literally passed away. So even I had a clinical gap. So on my specialty training, they asked, I openly told, I didn't go. I was staying back home. I was taking care of kid. And I was doing some service in NHS by treating some patients online and guiding them during the COVID crisis. So that's what I did. I literally, literally I flew back to my home, home country. So clinical gap is okay. But you should be giver, giving a rational explanation and avoid clinical gaps at least two to three years before your GMC registration. At least two years try to avoid before your GMC registration. That should be fine. For the rest of the clinical gap, only thing you need to give is you need to give a rational explanation why there is a clinical gap and be honest. If you are honest, if you give rational explanation, it is well and good accepted. Or you can also tell if you want to upscale yourself and you are doing some postgraduate diploma or MSc courses in uh, that is recognized, that is acceptable. So don't worry about clinical gap. This is how you have to. There are two school of thoughts. One people say, no, don't worry about clinical gap, write anything in GMC. They will kick you out. At the same time, if you too much worry about clinical gap and too much break your head on it, don't do that. So have this thing, whatever I told you in mind, you'll be fine with clinical gaps. Okay. All the best, everyone. Thank you so much. And tomorrow we will see you again. Good night. See you guys.